Chapter 16 Oh, sleep! It is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. Mr. Samuel Taylor Coleridge's epic poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, has been serialized just for our readers. Part the fifth is featured today. The Beaumont Mirror, The Literary Arts When Max gently lay an all but unconscious Charlie upon the tester bed in her bedroom, he was relieved to see she was beginning to stir. On his return from her dressing room, with a few items he thought she might need, a few mumbled words tumbled forth from her lips, and her eyelids fluttered open. Oh, Max, she moaned, reaching for him. I think I had far too much cognac. The room is spinning around and around. Please make it stop. I wish I could. He sat carefully upon the edge of the bed and smoothed a few tangled curls away from her flushed face. Do you know where your maid, Molly, is? She frowned, then smiled sleepily up at him. No. I gave her the evening off. I expect she's snuck off somewhere with Edwards the footman. They've been making eyes at each other for weeks and weeks. All of a sudden, her expression changed. Her smile turned into a scowl, and she plucked at the bodice of her gown. I'm hot and uncomfortable. The lace itches, and my corset is far too tight. I want to take it all off. Devil take him. Max ran a hand down his face. He supposed he could summon another maid, but that might spur a lot of inconvenient questions and potential below-stairs gossip about how Lady Charlotte Hastings had ended up so intoxicated. Arabella, Lady Langdale, was indisposed, and Sophie was probably on her way back to Mayfair by now. Of course, there was Diana. However, he wasn't sure where her allegiance lay. She seemed to like Charlie, although she also might disclose something of Charlie's inebriated condition to his mother, and that was the last thing Charlie needed. So it looked like Charlie might be stuck with him to help her out. Bloody hell! Max blew out a sigh and silently vowed he wouldn't look as he helped her to disrobe. He'd undressed countless women. He could do it with his eyes closed, blindfolded, in the darkest corner of a pitch-black coal pit on a moonless night. Very well, he said. I'll help. Although the process might be easier if you sit up. At that, Charlie shot bolt upright. Oh, no! I think... One of her hands flew to her mouth and Max could see the panic flaring in her eyes. The beads of perspiration upon her brow and the pallor of her cheeks. In the blink of an eye, he grabbed the wash basin off the bedside table where he'd deposited it a short time before and thrust it in front of Charlie. As she cast up her accounts in the china bowl, he held her tumbling hair out of the way. When the bout of vomiting appeared to be over, he removed the bowl, then returned with a tumbler of fresh water and a damp washcloth. Thank you, she murmured weakly, and offered him a tremulous smile. I'm so sorry. There's no need to apologize. Max sat on the side of the bed again. He was pleased Charlie seemed more like herself. It's not as though I haven't done anything like this. Too many times to count, actually. You're just trying to make me feel better before I drown beneath a wave of hideous embarrassment, said Charlie. But I appreciate your efforts all the same. She sipped the water and wiped her face. Good Lord, what a mess I am. I think I might like to repair to the dressing room. I need to get these blasted pins out of my hair. She tugged at the collapsing Grecian-style coiffure. I feel like a hedgehog has taken up residence on my head, and heaven knows I could use some tooth powder and a comfort or two. If you feel up to it. And if you still need a hand with your gown and necklace, etc., 
I promise to be the perfect gentleman and loosen or remove anything you want. Without looking, of course. Of course. Not that I'd mind if you sneaked a peek. But I know what a stickler you are for the proprieties, Max. At least around me. She sighed. It's really just the pearl buttons at the back of my bodice that are a darned nuisance. There are far too many, and they're all annoyingly tiny. And perhaps you could loosen the knot at the top of my corset. Molly always ties it far too tightly. Your wish is my command, my lady, Max said. I'm here to help. And help he did, although by the time he'd undone the row of damnably small pearl buttons, he was a lather of frustrated lust, despite his best efforts not to be. The more he tried to focus on the task at hand and ignore the fact he was revealing inch by delicious inch of Charlie's bare shoulders and her undergarments, the worse things got. It also didn't help matters when he was working at the ruthlessly knotted ties of her pretty silk corset, one that was strikingly similar to the one she'd been wearing at the Rouge et Noir Club, that he suddenly recalled that Charlie had mentioned something to him about a naughty painting. Because if she had posed for a risque portrait, no, he would not think about his friend's sister in an even greater state of undress than she was right at this very moment. He would not get a cock stand. He began to count in Latin in his head to take his mind off what he was doing and the fact that Charlie's chemise had slipped perilously low. In the dressing-room mirror, he could clearly see her plump, creamy breasts, practically spilling over the top of her cursed corset. And was that a hint of an apricot-hued nipple? Oh, hell! He began to count again. Unos, duo, tres, quatuor, quinque, sex. Sexual Congress. Damn! He should have recited Pi on Newton's Laws of Motion. There was nothing remotely licentious about any of that. Thankfully, the knot soon gave way, and after muttering, There you go, Max beat a hasty retreat to Charlie's bedroom, where he found a decanter of sweet sherry on a side table. Even though it was not to his taste, if he downed a glass or two, Perhaps it would put out the fire in his loins. By the time he was feeling a little calmer and contemplating pouring a third glass just for good measure, Charlie emerged from her dressing room. She'd changed into a perfectly sedate, perhaps even matronly, cotton night rail and a woollen shawl. But there was nothing the least bit matronly about her chestnut hair. Now that it was loose, it cascaded about her shoulders in thick, undulating waves of coppery gold fire. It was like autumn come to life, and he had to suppress the urge to seize it and press his face into the silken mass. But the worst part was that her feet were bare. He'd never seen her naked toes before. They were all kinds of dainty, and her ankles were neat, and, oh, dear God, he needed to stop staring— and imagining all kinds of wicked things he could do with Charlie, from her toes up. Max swallowed. He'd best go. Charlie wasn't well, and of course he couldn't break his dashed promise to Nate. If you're feeling better, I'll bid you good night. Charlie sat upon the bed, and as she lounged back against the pillows, she curled her legs up like a cat, and drew her naked feet beneath her nightgown. Her eyelids began to droop. The room stopped spinning, she said, as though she hadn't heard him. Well, that's good. As I said, I should. Oh, she placed a hand to her forehead. But now I feel a frightful magrim coming on. It's as if someone decided to place a nail right here and strike it with a hammer over and over again. Max winced in sympathy. Can I get you anything? A cold compress or some tea? Charlie closed her eyes and sank farther into the pillows. 
No, it's all right. Maybe it will go away while I sleep. Perhaps he should stay, at least until Charlie was comfortable and settled. And then he could sneak back to his room unobserved via the jib door connecting their suites. He didn't have the key on him, but he could pick the lock easily enough. He approached the bed. Here, let me tuck you in, he said, drawing the covers back, and Charlie stirred enough to climb beneath them. Max gently drew the sheets and counterpane up to her chin, then dropped a kiss on her forehead. Good night, Charlie, he murmured. Then he crossed his arms over his chest, so he wouldn't stroke an errant curl away from her forehead. She mumbled something, and as she burrowed into the pillows, he thought he saw her mouth curving into a contented, almost feline smile. Settling into a bedside armchair, he watched her fall deeper into sleep. How beautiful she was. Indeed, he'd always thought so. He recalled a day just under a year ago, Nate's wedding day, in fact, when his friend had caught him casting an admiring look Charlie's way. Of course Nate had warned him off, and Max had readily acquiesced. How could he not? Nate had been one of the few people he'd formed any kind of bond with. But as he'd said to Charlie, just because he was friends with her brother and Gabriel and Hamish, that didn't mean he was capable of falling in love with a woman. Now, falling in lust with a woman, especially someone as gorgeous as Charlie, he could readily acknowledge that. Max yawned and scrubbed a hand down his face. It was far too late and he was far too tired to continue with such circuitous thinking that led nowhere. But as much as he wanted to retire for the night, he was also worried Charlie might wake and need something. She wasn't entirely out of the woods yet. She was beneath the covers. What if he stretched out beside her for a little while? Surely that was permitted. After checking all the doors to Charlie's suite to make sure they were locked, it was better to be safe than sorry, he shrugged off his coat, removed his neckcloth, and kicked off his shoes. There was no point in being uncomfortable. He carefully lay down beside Charlie, and to his astonishment, she immediately rolled toward him and nuzzled his neck. Her warm breath tickled his ear. You smell nice she murmured, like expensive shaving soap and Max. Oh, hell. Max released a sigh. Despite his best efforts, his ever-present desire for her stirred and sparked. His mind returned to the secrets she wasn't supposed to tell him. The painting. Well, if she'd sat for some kind of revealing portrait, it was really none of his business no matter how much his curiosity flickered and burned inside him. As for what she'd done when she was seventeen, it wasn't his business either. When he thought back to all the things he'd done at that age, good Lord, despite the fact his diabolical tyrant of a father had still been alive, he'd managed to get up to all sorts of mischief at Eton, and during the holidays when his father hadn't been around, ruling the roost with his iron fist, a horsewhip, and even worse, his acerbic tongue lashings. But he didn't want to think about his father, the man who'd made his life miserable for so long when he hadn't measured up to his exacting standards. The man who'd taught him, no, drummed into him, that it was far easier and safer not to feel anything soft or warm or tender for anyone at all that to do so was a sign of weakness, and weakness must be rooted out and crushed at all costs. While a part of Max truly did want to be the kind of man Charlie wanted for a husband, he knew he could never be. His heart was damaged beyond repair. Frostbitten and stunted, like a ruthlessly pruned and blighted shrub that would never grow again. He couldn't be the duke of any woman's dreams, let alone hers. Charlie curled herself around him, snuggling closer, and all at once, 
An intense, all-consuming longing seared through Max's chest, stealing his breath. His throat burned and felt far too tight, as though he'd contracted some sort of ague, and it was too painful to swallow. And then the shivering started. A bone-deep chill that began in his heart and radiated outward, encasing every fibre of his body in ice, freezing his blood. Numbing his nerves, deadening every feeling, except for an overwhelming, smothering sense of impending doom. Darkness gathered at the corners of his vision. Oh, God! Somehow, he clambered out of the bed without waking Charlie, and staggered to the nearest window. The curtains were open, and he gripped the sill and pressed his forehead against the cold pane. His breath soared in and out in harsh, ragged pants, fogging the glass. His heart pounded unsteadily in a petrified, drunken gallop. It felt as though he was a hobbled horse who'd just run a mile, with the hounds of hell snapping and snarling at his heels. From the shadows in the corner of the room, the shade of his father watched and smirked. It had been years and years since Max had suffered a debilitating attack of nerves like this. From experience, he knew the best he could do was hold on and wait for the violent, racking tremors to ease. For the panic to subside and his breathing and heart rate to slow. To reassure himself that his father wasn't here, waiting to punish him for being a pathetic milksop. A good-for-nothing failure. A weakling. Max looked up and caught his reflection in the window pane. He looked haggard. A mess. God, he hated this house. No matter how much he tried to ignore the bad memories, there were too many of them at Heathcote. He'd readily agreed to his mother's plans to hold the house party here, because it had been expedient for him to just say yes. It didn't seem like such a good idea now. Beyond the darkness of Heathcote's grounds was the place Anthony had fallen from his horse. And to the right, near the wooded grove one passed on the way to the heath itself, was the site where Max's first horse had died. Max had only been twelve years old, but the nightmare of that long-ago day was a permanent scar carved deep inside him. It was a memory he tried very hard to avoid. Clearly, to no avail tonight. Behind him, Charlie murmured, but in the window's reflection, Max could see she still slept peacefully. He turned around and pushed his sweat-drenched hair out of his eyes with an impatient shove of his shaking hand. Charlie had set about getting drunk after that dog Mowbray had propositioned her. But Max didn't think that was the only reason she'd fled to his study and had downed half a bottle of cognac. For some time now, he'd sensed Charlie was unhappy. And even though they were engaged and her social standing appeared to be improving, it hadn't helped improve her mood. Not one bit. And deep down, Max suspected he was largely to blame for that. He knew she cared for him. He'd seen it in the warmth of her gaze and her touch and her smile. She'd also admitted numerous times that she desired him, too. And yet, he kept pushing her away and turning his back. Denying her over and over again. If he were honest with himself, he would admit that he was miserable with the situation too. Being so close to Charlie, wanting her all the time, but not being able to touch her the way he wanted to, it was slowly driving him mad. It was unhealthy. It was self-destructive. And this impossible situation had all come about because of his damned promise to Nate. A promise born out of obligation that he now regretted with every fibre of his being. His loyalty was divided, and he was being pulled in different directions. The tension was excruciating. No wonder he'd snapped and come undone tonight. One thing was clear. He and Charlie couldn't go on this way, or they were both bound to unravel. 
he began to weigh up the arguments for continuing to keep Charlie at arm's length versus giving in to his overwhelming need to have her. Perhaps Charlie had a point. It wasn't any of Nate's business what the two of them did together when they were alone. And as Charlie had also said, what Nate didn't know wouldn't hurt him. She was twenty-two, a woman, not a girl, and she definitely knew her own mind. She was also a passionate creature by nature. His mind strayed to her now not-so-secret list of wishes and desires. While Max couldn't give her everything she wanted, what if he could make her happy by helping her to fulfill at least some of the other things on her list? Of course, it was also self-serving on his part, because why wouldn't he want to kiss Charlie in the rain or in the moonlight or ravish her in a carriage? He certainly wanted to do all of those things. Yes, as long as they were careful and took precautions, and Charlie understood that he was motivated by lust, nothing more, perhaps they could explore the physical side of their relationship. They could be friends who indulged in an amorous tryst or two every now and again. It wouldn't be about love or romance or having a happily ever after together. It would be about having fun and alleviating some of this damned pent-up tension. Satisfied that he'd come up with a temporary solution to both of their problems, Max picked up a blanket at the end of the bed and took up residence in the bedside armchair again. His mouth curved into a smile as his own eyelids began to droop. If Charlie agreed to his plan, the coming weeks would be interesting indeed. Chapter 17 If you are suffering from a loss of appetite, dyspepsia, megrims, anxiety, or any other type of nervous complaint, including melancholia, hysterics, or perhaps you're simply heart sore, Dr. Brompton's restorative nervous tonic might be just the elixir you need to restore your equilibrium this season. The Beaumont Mirror General Health and Medical Miscellany Heathcote Hall, Hampstead Heath April 18th, 1819 When Charlie awoke the next morning, she was aware of several things. Her head ached horribly. Her stomach roiled uneasily. But worse of all was the overwhelming sense of mortification that washed over her when she recalled what had happened after she'd fled the ballroom the night before. Her memory was somewhat hazy, right up until the point she'd been violently ill in front of Max. From what she could recall, he'd been nothing but patience personified, but even so, it was wince-inducing to think he'd seen her at her very worst. And the fact that she couldn't quite recall what she'd said and done before that, it was unnerving in the extreme. Getting so completely drunk was an experience she never wished to repeat. Even though she felt hideous, she forced her protesting body out of bed. The morning sunlight streaming in through her bedroom window made her head throb even more, but she wouldn't be deterred from fulfilling her duty. As much as she wanted to stay in bed, and hide beneath the covers until she felt better, at least in a physical sense, she also owed it to Max, her father, her brother and her friends, to put in an appearance at breakfast. She padded to the bell pull and rang for Molly, who appeared within minutes with hot water, a bright smile, and a bottle of some nasty-smelling concoction, called Dr. Brompton's Restorative Nervous Tonic, she must have noted her mistress had been unwell last night. After Charlie had washed and had her hair tamed into a suitably sedate style, she donned a fresh gown of pale peach muslin. Pinching some colour into her wan cheeks, she hoped she might pass for well enough if one didn't look too closely. On entering the morning room where breakfast was served, she discovered Arabella already ensconced at one end of the massive mahogany dining table, with a pot of tea, toast, 
and a coddled egg before her. There was no sign of Father, Lady Tilbury, Gabriel, Nate, or Sophie. Much to Charlie's relief, Max was also absent. Indeed, the room was surprisingly empty. Also missing was Cressida, Diana, the Duke and Duchess of Stafford, Lord Mowbray, and Lady Penelope. Thank the Lord. Arabella greeted Charlie with a warm smile. Good morning, my friend. It looks like quite a few guests have opted to sleep late or have breakfast in bed. Her brow knitted into a frown as Charlie drew closer. Is it a good morning? You look... peaked? Pasty? After a footman stepped forward to pull out a chair for her, Charlie gingerly lowered herself onto the silk-upholstered seat. I'm ashamed to say that I'm a little worse for wear this morning. Oh, dear. Well, let's furnish you with a cup of tea straight away, and something plain to eat. Arabella caught the footman's eye and requested another teacup and fresh toast. Now tell me what's ailing you, dear Charlie. I sense it's more than a physical affliction. When Charlie had filled her friend in on everything that had transpired the night before, and how embarrassed she felt about Max witnessing her drunken state, Arabella patted Charlie's hand. I wouldn't worry that Max's regard for you has changed. He clearly went out of his way to look after you last night. It's more than evident that he cares for you. Do you think so? Aye, I do. He could have rung for a maid or approached his sister-in-law, Diana. But he didn't. And earlier this morning, before Gabriel went riding, he told me that Max had been looking for you after you quit the ballroom last night. Her mouth curved into a smile. I wish I could have witnessed Lord Morbury receiving his comeuppance, by the way. But I digress. Apparently, Max came to our suite hoping on the off chance you'd paid me a visit to see how I was faring. Because you weren't with me, Max then intended to check if you were lending Sophie your support in the nursery. Really? Yes, really. According to Gabriel, your fiancé was quite frantic with worry and determined to find you. Even he suspects that Max is smitten, but in denial. Frantic with worry? Smitten? Charlie picked up her cup of tea and took a sip. How interesting. It was nice to know that others could see that Max might be harbouring unacknowledged feelings for her and that she wasn't imagining things. Charlie selected a piece of toast. Have you seen Sophie this morning by any chance? I hope Thomas is better. Oh, I heard that your brother whisked Sophie and Thomas back to West Hampton House last night, just in case they needed a physician. I suspect baby Thomas was just teething, the poor wee mite. If I'd been well enough, I would have lent a hand. I must say, I'm very pleased to see you looking well now. Oh, yes. I am, thank you. That horrid nausea has passed. It's strange, though. Arabella replenished her cup of tea. I started to feel so afflicted just before our journey back to London. Every evening, I felt as ill as can be. But then, in the morning, I'm perfectly fine again. I hope whatever it is passes soon. Charlie gave Arabella a quizzical look over the rim of her teacup. How long has this been going on? A week, I suppose. Arabella put down her own teacup with a clatter. Behind her gold-framed spectacles, her eyes widened. I've missed my courses, too, she murmured. They're two weeks. No, nearly three weeks late. Oh, my goodness. Her clear hazel gaze connected with Charlie's. Do you think that I could be... Charlie couldn't help but smile. You're the one who is clever enough to be a doctor, Arabella. What do you think? 
Oh! Her eyes were shining with tears now. Her cheeks glowed. I just... I've been so busy of late. I didn't even think that I might be. I must share this wonderful news with Gabriel as soon as he gets back from his ride. Yes, you must. And congratulations, Arabella. Charlie reached out and squeezed her friend's hand. I'm so happy for you and Gabriel. Thank you. Charlie's gaze wandered over to the French doors that afforded one with a view of the flagged terrace and Heathcote's pristine lawns and the lake beyond. I haven't seen Max this morning. Do you happen to know if he went riding with your husband? Oh, to be perfectly honest, I have no idea, said Arabella. Her gaze shifted to the doorway of the morning room. Speak of the devil. Max. Without even turning her head, Charlie was aware of his approach. It was as though she could feel his magnetic presence, his dynamic energy, the way his gaze focused on her and her alone. If it were the least bit socially acceptable, she would have slithered beneath the table or thrown a linen napkin over her face to hide her acute mortification. She might not be able to recall most of what she'd said to this man in her foxed state, but she did have a hazy memory of him holding her hair while she cast up her accounts. And he'd also helped her to undress. The burning blush already heating Charlie's cheeks seemed to engulf her entire neck and face as Max greeted Arabella and then her. My lady, he said with a bow, I'm pleased to see you here at breakfast, and looking so well. I, yes, thank you, Your Grace, mumbled Charlie. Max looked, well, like he always did, too handsome for words. She was about to invite him to take breakfast with them, but then she caught sight of Lord Langdale striding across the lawn toward the morning room. Arabella, she murmured. Gabriel's returned. Oh! Arabella put down her napkin and rose to her feet. If you'll both excuse me. Of course. Max, ever the gentleman, gave another bow. As soon as Arabella reached the terrace, she picked up her skirts and dashed down the stairs and across the grass to meet her husband. There were tears in Charlie's eyes as she watched Arabella whisper in her husband's ear. He gave a whoop of sheer joy, picked her up, spun her around, and kissed her soundly. All the while, Max looked on, bemused. I take it you know what that's all about, he said, as he claimed the seat beside Charlie. Yes, she dabbed at her eyes with a napkin. But it's not my confidence to share. Max's lips quirked. I think I could hazard a guess. It wouldn't have something to do with the fact Lady Langdale was indisposed last night, would it? Charlie smiled. It might. Max nodded. Well, I'm very happy for both of them. His eyes narrowed, his look growing speculative as it settled on Charlie's face. Judging by your reaction... I take it that you are not averse to the idea of having children one day. Charlie dropped her gaze to the table, lest Max see the yearning in her eyes. I would love to have children one day. With... With you. With whomever I marry. She shrugged a shoulder and tried to sound nonchalant as she added, It is a wife's duty, after all. She picked up her tea. And what about you? How do you feel about becoming a father one day, Your Grace? As a duke, it is my duty to sire an heir, and probably a few spares at the very least. Yes, but how do you feel about it, Max? To be honest, I've never really examined my feelings in relation to starting a family before. Although... His attention shifted to the open French doors and the now-deserted lawn. 
I hoped that I would react in a similar way to Gabriel upon hearing such news. I hope you would too. Max's throat worked in a swallow. And then his gaze touched Charlie's face. About last night. Charlie closed her eyes as she was swamped by yet another wave of embarrassment. I'm so, so sorry for acting like a complete sot. What you must think of me. I don't think any less of you, Charlie, if that's what you're worried about. And there's certainly no need to apologize. Actually, I should be apologizing to you because I wasn't there by your side, protecting you from Mowbray. No wonder you were upset. Charlie winced. I told you about that. My memory is a little fuzzy up until a certain point. Max smiled. You did. And I'm suitably impressed with how you dealt with the situation. Mowbray deserved it. You'll be pleased to know that as of this morning, he's gone. Lady Penelope and her parents are in the process of leaving, too. They are no longer welcome at Heathcote. Or any of my properties, for that matter. Oh, I... Charlie frowned. Not solely on my account, I hope. I didn't mean to cause a fuss that would result in the whole family being evicted. It wasn't just the incident with Mowbray. You see, it seems his sister is just as devoid of a moral compass. While that didn't surprise Charlie as much as it should, she felt compelled to ask, Whatever do you mean? Max helped himself to a piece of toast. Last night, after you'd fallen asleep and I was certain you were resting comfortably, I returned to my room. Smedley, my valet, informed me that in my absence I'd had a visitor to my bedchamber. Charlie almost dropped the knife she'd been using to spread marmalade on her own toast. Max, don't tell me that. She dropped her voice to a whisper. That Lady Penelope was lying in wait for you? Max's mouth flattened into a grim line. She was. But thank God for Smedley. If he wasn't so dedicated to his duty. He shook his head. I hate to think what might have happened. I do too. The audacity of that woman, trying to ruin our betrothal and entrap you in a compromising situation. Charlie shivered. I'm glad you agree, said Max. In any event, I had a word with the Duke of Stafford first thing this morning, when he was on his way to the stables, and I let him know, in no uncertain terms, that I was not impressed with the behaviour of his offspring, and that I would like them all to leave. Of course, he was suitably affronted, and doubted my version of events, but I don't particularly care what he thinks at this point. His mouth twitched with a smile. As I stated last night, this is my home, and I'll do whatever I like within its walls. Sometimes it's gratifying to be the arrogant duke. Charlie laughed. I'm sure it is. But you've done the right thing, considering the circumstances. If Lord Mowbray and Lady Penelope were to stay on, it would be too awkward for words. Max sighed. Yes, but I still have to deal with my mother. No doubt she'll have something to say about it when she hears that I've all but thrown them out. Especially Lady Penelope. Charlie reached out and touched his forearm. In the morning light, the diamond on her betrothal ring sparkled. I have every confidence that you'll be able to handle it with aplomb, Your Grace. Max covered her hand with his and kept it there as though he didn't wish to let her go. Beneath his sleeve, Charlie felt the muscles of his forearm shift, then settle. His dark blue gaze met hers. Charlie, I want to make it very clear that I have eyes for no one but you. No other woman commands my interest or occupies my thoughts like you do. And when we return to London, his thumb caressed her wrist. When things are quieter and we're both under less scrutiny, 
I'd like to pursue you in the way that I really want to. In the way you've hinted that you'd like me to. If you are still agreeable. Charlie's breath caught. Her skin tingled. Her heart capered. Heat bloomed in her cheeks and shimmered through her, all the way to her toes and everywhere in between. Yes, I'm still agreeable, Max. More than agreeable. I, I'm not ashamed to admit that I want you too. Quite desperately. The feeling is mutual. Max raised her hand, turned it, and placed a whisper-soft kiss on the inside of her wrist. His eyes held hers as he murmured in a low, velvet voice. I look forward to our next not-quite-so-proper liaison, my lady. I'll send word to you tomorrow, when you're back at Hastings' house. And then he rose and quit the morning room. Charlie dazedly watched him walk away, and as desire flowed through her veins like sun-warmed honey, she wondered for a moment if she was still abed and dreaming. But no, her father and Lady Tilbury had just entered the room and were headed her way. If they wondered why she was grinning like a besotted ninny-hammer when they joined her, she didn't really care. At long last, Max had admitted that he wanted her, and that he was willing to do something about it. Even though she had no idea why he'd changed his mind, questioning the reason for his complete turnabout was certainly the last thing on hers. She'd roused the rake, and couldn't be happier. Chapter 18 Even though she's engaged to a duke, it appears that the disreputable Lady C cannot seem to avoid scandal. What did she get up to with the very eligible Lord M during her betrothal ball? Read on to find out what transpired that night in the ballroom, right in front of the who's who of the ton. The Beaumont Mirror, the Society Page Exmoor House, Grosvenor Square April 20th, 1819 Charlie was right. There was a spy who worked for the Beaumont Mirror in their midst. A servant from his mother's household. Or, perish the thought, Diana, or even his mother. Of course, there'd been a multitude of other tonish guests present who might have witnessed Charlie's altercation with Mowbray. Max doubted Mowbray himself would have gone to the papers. The Beaumont Mirror's story did not paint him in a favourable light either. Although, as far as Max was concerned, the scoundrel hadn't been castigated nearly enough for his despicable behaviour. He would have to tackle his mother later in the day, because he had more pressing matters to attend to, matters that involved his fiancée and her happiness. With a disgruntled sigh, Max tossed the copy of the scandal rag onto his bed, then turned around to submit to the fussing of Smedley. Ordinarily, Max would dress himself before he went for his early morning ride in Hyde Park, but today he wanted to look his best for Charlie. He'd sent word to her the day before that he'd meet her at Hastings' house at seven o'clock, and he'd suggested that she wear a riding habit for the occasion. With any luck, her mare, Aurora, would be saddled and waiting when he arrived as well. When his cravat was tied to his valet's satisfaction, and he was vested, coated, booted, and armed with his beaver hat, riding gloves and riding crop, Max quit Exmoor House and headed to the nearby mews where his mounts were kept. The sky was a dark leaden grey, and the air chill and mist-laden, as he rode the short distance to Hastings' house upon his thoroughbred stallion, Ghost. Even though it looked like rain, Max wouldn't be deterred from accomplishing his mission. When Charlie appeared on the front steps of Hastings' house, the cheerful smile that bloomed across her lovely face immediately brightened the cold, drear morning. Suitably attired in a beautifully cut riding habit in eye-catching scarlet, 
she'd completed her ensemble with a black riding hat, adorned with an elegant sweep of pheasant feathers. It sat at a jaunty angle atop her barely tamed bronze curls. Good morning, Your Grace, she said, taking Max's proffered arm, so he could escort her down the stairs to where Charlie's groom waited, with Ghost, Aurora, and a third mount, presumably another horse from Lord Westhampton's stables that required exercise. As they descended, she leaned closer to him and added in a soft voice the groom couldn't hear, I must confess that when your note arrived, I was more than a little bit excited to see what you had planned for today. Can I expect that we'll ignore the dictates of decorum and ride hell for leather down Rotten Row? Lady Charlotte, I'm more than a little shocked that you would think I would lead you so wildly astray, replied Max, with mock horror. I mean, I know it's been reported in the Beaumont Mirror that your alter ego might have expressed an interest in doing such a thing, but it would be remiss of me, your fiancé, to encourage such hoydenish behaviour. At the bottom of the stairs, Charlie laughed. Considering all of London will be reading about disreputable Lady C's outrageous antics at her betrothal ball, I hardly think what I get up to this morning in Hyde Park will signify. Max had to suppress a smirk. Charlie would not make such a pronouncement if she had any inkling about what he had in store. You saw the latest article in the Beaumont Mirror's society page, then? I did. But nothing shall dampen my spirits this morning. Not a horrid piece of inaccurate gossip that's been leaked to the press by some unscrupulous, eavesdropping, scandal-mongering spy. She turned her gaze to the ever-darkening sky or even gathering clouds and a spot of rain. I'm pleased to hear it. Indeed, based on his knowledge of Lady C's scandalous list of secret wishes and dreams, he was rather hoping it did rain. When the groom stepped forward to assist his mistress into the side saddle, Max held up a hand. I'll take it from here. Indeed, once Lady Charlotte and I are away, I'd appreciate it if you made yourself scarce. The young man glanced his mistress's way for her direction, and she smiled. It will be all right, John. His grace will take good care of me. The groom bowed and moved back to wait at a discreet distance. Of course, my lady. Your grace. Charlie gave Max a coquettish smile from beneath her lashes as he slid his hands about her waist to help her mount her bay mare. So high-handed this morning, Your Grace. I like it. Max lifted her onto the saddle, enjoying Charlie's gasp of surprise as he did so. I didn't think you liked it when I was too domineering, my lady, he said, flipping up the hem of her skirts to ensure her left foot was set securely in the slipper stirrup. Well, it depends on what you're being high-handed about, murmured Charlie as she watched him make a slight adjustment to the leather strap. But being alone with you suits me, so I don't mind at all in this instance. Good, said Max. He couldn't resist sliding his hand up her shapely, stocking-clad calf and brushing his gloved thumb against the soft, bare flesh just above her garter. Her sharp intake of breath and the way her brandywine eyes widened and darkened made him smile. I can be as high-handed as you like today. Your Grace, if your hand goes any higher, I might burst into flames right in the middle of Barclay Square, Charlie murmured huskily. Max chuckled softly. Well, it's a very good thing that it's just started to rain. And indeed, it had. A light, mizzling shower misted around them. Tiny droplets settled on the velvet brim of Charlie's hat and her curls, like a veil of soft silver gossamer. But of course, we can always do this another time. A fierce light flared in Charlie's eyes. There's no way in Hades I'm postponing this ride with you, Max. It could start to hail, or even snow, and I wouldn't care. This morning, your every wish is my command, my lady said Max, 
withdrawing his hand, then gently squeezing one of hers where it rested upon the pommel. It is, whispered Charlie. Yes, said Max, holding her gaze. It is. Anticipation for what was to come coursing through his veins, Max all but vaulted into his own saddle. Then they were off, wending their way through the early morning traffic toward Hyde Park. Within fifteen minutes, they'd entered the park via Grosvenor Gate, and were trotting down a broad avenue of walnut trees in the direction of Rotten Row. There weren't many riders about. Max surmised the inclement weather had kept them away. He didn't mind at all. By the time they reached the eastern end of London's most famous and popular bridle path, the rain had grown heavier, and the riders had grown even sparser. Are you certain you want to do this, Charlie? asked Max, as they reined in their horses. It will be a wet, muddy ride. Ghost must have sensed the excitement humming through Max, as the horse began to snort and stamp the ground impatiently. I don't mind getting a bit dirty of you, don't, Your Grace, rejoined Charlie, her eyes sparkling with mischief. Even though her pheasant feathers were drooping and dripping, and her cheeks and even the tip of her nose had turned pink with cold, she looked nothing but radiant. Actually, I propose we up the stakes. If we are going to hurtle pell-mell down Rotten Row in the pouring rain, we should make this worth both of our whiles. Let's make it a race to the end. What a capital idea, Lady Charlotte. And what prize can the winner claim? Charlie slid him a sly smile. A kiss, of course. The nature of said kiss, and the timing and place in which it occurs, shall be the winner's choice. Max flashed her a wolfish grin in return. Done. They lined up their horses by a towering oak, then Max raised his crop in the air, like a sword-wielding cavalry officer, and called, Charge! Ghost and Aurora leapt forward. Rain lashed, hooves thudded, and mud flew, as they dashed headlong down the track. Max kept pace with Charlie until the halfway mark, then he let Ghost have his head. Aurora might be fleet of foot, but she was no match for his thoroughbred racehorse. And Max wanted to win. There was no way he was going to let this opportunity to fulfil Charlie's dream of being kissed in the rain slip through his fingers. When Charlie caught up to him at the end of the row, she was laughing and breathless. Somewhere along the way, her hat had fallen off, but she didn't seem bothered as she reined in alongside him. Congratulations, Your Grace. Thank you, my lady. Max slid from his saddle. After he'd tethered Ghost to the low-hanging branch of a nearby beech tree, he approached Charlie. And now I'd like to claim my prize. Here? Now? Charlie pushed a sodden curl away from her cheek. In the middle of Hyde Park? Yes, right here. Right now. The park is practically deserted, after all. And the downpour is beginning to ease, so we're not in any imminent danger of drowning. Max cocked a brow as he gently grasped Charlie's waist. Unless, of course, you've changed your mind about wanting to be kissed passionately in the rain. Ah, your thoroughly wicked master plan is revealed at last. Charlie placed her hands on his shoulders. If my memory serves me correctly, it was you, my dear Lady Charlotte, who suggested the precise nature of the prize the winner could claim. Max lifted her down, but didn't release her from his hold. But if you're having second thoughts, our kiss doesn't have to be remotely passionate at all. It can be quite proper and chaste. In fact, I can always just kiss your gloved hand like a perfect gentleman. Charlie arched a brow. Well, if that's enough to satisfy you. She took a step back, out of his arms, and raised her hand, calling his bluff. Kiss away, your grace. Minx. 
Max backed Charlie up against the trunk of the beech tree, crowding her in with his body. The leafy canopy above their heads protected them from the worst of the drizzling rain. Planting both of his hands beside her head, he leaned in. His breath misted and mingled with hers in the cold, damp air between them. You know that's not what I really want, nor what you want either. Her luscious mouth curved with a siren smile as she looked up at him. Her long lashes were spiky and shimmering with raindrops as she slid her hands up to his neck, pressed her magnificent breasts against his chest, and curled her fingers into the wet hair at his nape, pulling it ever so gently. The heady scent of her floral perfume teased him, making his mouth water. Well, what are you going to do about it, Max? This. Max tugged off one of his gloves with his teeth, then cupped Charlie's smooth as alabaster cheek with his bare hand, dragged his thumb across her lower lip. As much as he wanted to kiss her with fervent abandon, he also wanted to savour this moment. Extend the delicious, breath-stealing anticipation of claiming this gorgeous young woman in his arms. A woman he'd wanted forever, but had steadfastly stayed away from because of an obligation to his best friend. Until now. As Charlie's gaze dipped to his mouth, he didn't want to think about the fact he was about to break his promise to Nate. Or that they were in a public place where anyone might stumble upon them. All that mattered was Charlie and the tendrils of desire wrapping around them, binding them closer together. The heat surging through his veins. The sharp, searing ache of some emotion akin to longing deep within his chest. The heavy throb of lust in his groin. The quickening of her breath when he pushed his hips against hers, and she felt how badly he burned for her. Max! Charlie arched into him. Please! Her whispered plea was like a spark set to tinder. Max's mouth crashed down on Charlie's. Plundering. Ravaging. He lashed her plush, pliant body to his. Gripped her shapely head and tipped it back so he could devour her thoroughly. She tasted heavenly. Like spring rain and warm honey, but most of all, just Charlie. The most intoxicating manner that he could easily feast upon forever. Yet for all its unbridled savagery, the rough, desperate slide of lips and wild tangling of tongues, their kiss was agonizingly sweet. Charlie opened for him, accepted every shameless thing that he did, and returned it in kind. Stroked her tongue inside his mouth, just as deeply. When he blatantly palmed her breast, she pushed a hand beneath his waistcoat, her fingers twisting in the damp linen of his shirt, as though she wanted to rip it away. And when he drew back to suck in a ragged, much-needed breath, she moaned his name, as if she couldn't bear his absence for even a second. Almost immediately, she speared her fingers into his hair, knocking off his hat, as she dragged him down for another mind-spinning, bone-melting, blazing hot kiss. Everything about Charlie's kiss was sublime. It was everything a kiss should be, and more. As Charlie had so accurately declared beneath her spring kissing bow, just one kiss wouldn't be enough. Between them, they'd started a raging fire that would be practically impossible to contain let alone put out. When they at last drew apart, Charlie's lips were swollen and glistening. And she was smiling. Now, that is precisely the sort of kiss I wanted from you on Easter Sunday, Maximilian Devereux. She poked his chest with a finger and pouted. And yet you've kept me waiting so long. Foolish man. Max felt himself grinning like a moonstruck youth. I am. The king of fools. Can you ever forgive me? Perhaps. As much as I adored the fact that you kissed me in the rain 
just like I've always dreamed of. If I'd won the race, I think I might have chosen to kiss you somewhere a little warmer and a little more private. And while your mouth tastes divine, she trailed a gloved finger down his torso toward the waistband of his buckskin breeches, where his cock still strained against the tight confines of leather and laces. I can think of other places I'd like to kiss you as well. If you'd let me. What? Did Charlie really mean that? Did she understand the full import of her words? Max swallowed hard as the wonderfully lewd image of Charlie on her knees before him filled his head and made his blood pound anew. Dear God, he couldn't think about Charlie doing that to him. Could he? He caught her tormenting hand with his. When he spoke, his voice was rough and thick with lust. Now I'm intrigued. How much do you actually know about bed sport, Lady Charlotte Hastings? She lifted her chin, her gaze bright with challenge. I'll put it this way. Somewhere between much more than a proper young lady should know, and nowhere near as much as I'd like to. Are you shocked? No. I mean, yes. Perhaps a little. But not in a bad way. Rather, in a pleasant way. And I shouldn't be shocked at all, considering you admitted you knew more than the average tonish miss when we were at the Rouge et Noir Club. She laughed at that. Pleasantly shocked. I suppose your reaction could be worse. At least you're not condemning me for being a wicked, brazen hussy. I would never do that. I adore how bold and fearless you are. How much you embrace life with both hands. I wish that I could give you more than... She pressed a finger to his lips. It's all right, Max. I don't expect more than you've already given me. Moments like this are enough. Oh, God. The tenderness and understanding in her eyes and her touch, it was almost too much. He brought her hand to his lips and kissed it. He couldn't put into words what he wished for. He couldn't even think it, because if he did, he'd come undone, just like he did a few nights before at Heathcote Hall. Even now, the cold was creeping into his bones, freezing the air in his lungs, making his heart thump uncomfortably against his ribs. They really needed to head back to Barclay Square. Passion. This is just about passion and attraction, he reminded himself. Brazen, wicked lust. Fulfilling the physical needs Charlie and I both have. That's all. Drawing a deep breath, he said, Thank you for understanding. And I do want to give you more moments like this. I have some parliamentary legislation I need to go over today, a draft bill that Prinny wants my opinion on, so I apologise in advance if it seems like I'm neglecting you yet again. But tomorrow evening, if you are not otherwise engaged, I'd like to take you somewhere. Some place that's special. When it's all arranged, I'll send word about the specific details. Charlie's eyes glowed. Of course I'll be available. I can't wait. Excellent. Now let's get you home. I don't want you to catch cold. As for himself, after that incendiary kiss, Max doubted he'd ever feel cold again not unless he dwelled on the emotions threatening to unfurl inside his chest. Emotions that terrified him. Feelings that, once upon a time, he would have immediately ripped out and stomped upon. But not today. Today he would let them linger for a little while. For Charlie, he would bear the bittersweet agony of tenderness taking root in his blight-ridden heart because she was worth it. Chapter 19 Today's article on Essential Style features general reflections on the fashions 
recommended for well-bred young ladies for all daily occasions, from indoor morning dress to walking dress styles suitable for wearing about town. We will ensure you look nothing less than your best. The Beaumont Mirror, the essential style and etiquette guide. Gunter's Tea Shop, Berkeley Square. April 21st, 1819. He, he kissed you? In the m middle of Hyde Park, in the rain? Olivia McQueen, the Marchioness of Slate, formerly Olivia de Vere, and a fellow disreputable debutante, looked at Charlie with wide brown eyes across the linen-draped tea table. That's so wonderfully romantic. When Charlie received word that Olivia and her husband Hamish had returned to London the day before, she'd immediately suggested that all four members of the Society for Enlightened Young Women gather for a reunion at their favourite tea shop. Charlie was thrilled that Olivia, Arabella and Sophie had all readily agreed. Yes, it is wonderfully romantic, said Sophie, placing her silver spoon beside her now empty ice cream bowl. It's about time Max stopped treating you like his best friend's bothersome little sister. Aye, Arabella smiled her approval over her cup of tea. I'm so happy for you, Charlie. The fact that he chose to help you fulfil some of your dreams speaks volumes. Thank you, and I think you're right. Charlie felt herself flushing with pleasure. My only concern is that Nate will find out, so all of you must promise not to breathe a word about our Hyde Park tryst. Thank heavens that hasn't appeared in the papers. My meddlesome brother will be sure to do something completely ridiculous if he suspects Max and I are. The heat in her cheeks spread across her entire face. Well, you know. Olivia frowned. You don't really believe that Nate would c call Max out, do you? I'm not sure, said Charlie. My brother means well. He doesn't want to see me heartbroken. I'd certainly hate to think their friendship might be ruined if Nate learns that Max hasn't kept his word about keeping his distance. Sophie reached out and touched Charlie's arm. You know my thoughts on the subject. My husband has no business insisting your engagement to Max is in name only. Especially when all of us can see that Max cares for you. Deeply. And he always has. Charlie sighed. I wish Max would recognise how he feels about me. He's such a dunderhead. Why do men have to be so daft when it comes to matters of the heart? I agree. They are daft, said Arabella. But he'll come to his senses soon enough. Gabriel certainly did. Yes, and so did Hamish, added Olivia. Despite the fact he's as stubborn as a Highland bullock on occasion. And Nate, too, said Sophie. As we all now know from experience, some men find it easier to express their feelings in other ways, through thoughtful acts and in a physical sense, before they can give voice to them. I wish there was a guidebook for women on how to manage men, said Charlie. Arabella laughed. I'm sure most men wish they had a guidebook that gave them advice on how to manage us. Talk turned to baby-related matters, Thomas, whose bout of teething had passed, and Arabella's due date, which she estimated to be in early December, and then on to Arabella's charity work. Her mother-in-law, Caroline, had offered to take on a greater role in managing Arabella's newly established orphanage in Edinburgh, and Arabella was most grateful. It will leave me more time to focus on the setting up of more dispensaries for the poor here in London. And, of course, this wee project in here. She rested a hand upon her still flat belly and smiled. I'm pleased to report that Gabriel couldn't be more supportive. 
Once upon a time, he would have wanted to coddle me, just like a defenceless bairn who needed protecting from the world. But he's quickly come to realise this Scottish lass is made of sterner stuff. That's wonderful, Arabella, remarked Charlie. You know, lately I've been thinking about my lot in life as an earl's daughter, and how I really should make myself more useful. Thanks to Max's intervention, my reputation is beginning to lose its tarnished edge, so I've been wondering about charitable concerns that I could make a significant contribution to. Olivia, you mentioned before that you've been helping Hamish's sister, Lady Isabel, and the local minister's wife, with establishing a village parish school on the Isle of Skye. And Arabella, I recall how you once told me about the plight of poor, unwed mothers here in London and elsewhere, and how that, in part, drives you to do what you do. There are so many things I could be doing with my time, instead of fretting about Max, or worrying about being spied upon by his mother or someone in her employ. Charlie had already told Sophie, Arabella and Olivia about how the Beaumont Mirror had reported on her set to with Lord Mowbray at the betrothal ball, and how the Mayfair Blue Stocking Society had been disparaged after she'd chatted about the group's activities with Cressida and Diana. I need a greater purpose. I want to make a difference in someone else's life. Well, what do you feel passionate about, dear Charlie? asked Sophie. That should answer your question. Charlie tapped her cup of tea with a fingernail. You know, I often think about society's hypocrisy when it comes to the sexes and how we're treated differently. How men can do as they please, yet we are bound by strict rules, controlling every aspect of our behaviour. When I suggested we formulate the Society for Enlightened Young Women, I wanted all of us to gain knowledge of the opposite sex and sexual congress, because knowledge is power. Young women, debutantes, should know what they can expect when they wed. Being kept in the dark about such matters is entirely unfair and, indeed, dangerous. For instance, if one encounters an unscrupulous rake hell set on seduction and one hasn't the slightest idea about what's going on, let alone how to prevent conception. She shuddered. Of course, there's no way I can possibly launch a public campaign to educate women about sexual congress. I'd probably be locked up in Bedlam for doing something that would undoubtedly be deemed outrageous. But I also keep thinking about women who find themselves in situations they don't wish to be in as a result of sexual intercourse. The women society unfairly labels as fallen. Her mind drifted back to the courtesans she saw at the Rouge et Noir Club. Max asserted they were all well paid and wished to be there, but what if some of them didn't? What happened when they fell pregnant or contracted some awful venereal disease? Or some horrible man like Lord Rochefort treated them badly? I wish I could help those women in some way. Your idea has some merit, Charlie, said Arabella. Perhaps when the Mayfair Blue Stocking Society next meets, we can discuss establishing a charity that would provide support for unwed mothers or any woman in need. Though, I imagine overtly promoting such a cause will create a great deal of controversy among the politer members of society. Charlie grinned. But when has that ever stopped us from doing anything? Exactly, said Olivia. I, for one, think it sounds like a wonderful idea, added Sophie. It's exactly the sort of charity enlightened women like us should be involved with. You can count on my unqualified support, too. Let's drink to that, proposed Charlie, and they all raised their teacups and clinked them together. Here's to friendship and supporting fellow women. After placing an order for a fresh pot of tea, Charlie's gaze wandered out of the bow window beside their table. The day was fine, the sky a glorious azure blue, and a fresh wind tossed the branches of the plane trees 
in the private park in the centre of Barclay Square. A sense of contentment settled over her, like a soft cashmere rug. She was with all her best friends. She and Max were growing closer. For the first time in a long time, she had so many things to look forward to. The fire in her soul had been revived. Then her heart stuttered, and her breath caught in her throat. A shiver raced over her skin, raising goose flesh. She gripped her almost empty teacup so hard it was a miracle she didn't snap off the porcelain handle. Lord Rochefort was right outside Gunter's. Clothed all in black, even the sling that supported his injured shoulder was fashioned from black silk. He was conversing with another bespectacled gentleman, a man who also seemed vaguely familiar. Charlie searched her memory, trying to place him, but her mind drew a complete blank. And then, to her horror, Rochefort caught sight of her staring at him. He bared his teeth in a grin, tipped his top hat in a mocking salute, and then, after farewelling the other gentleman, turned on his heel and strode away. Charlie, are you all right? You've gone as white as the tablecloth. Charlie tore her attention away from the window and met Sophie's concerned gaze. I... Lord Rochefort is outside. In the square, she whispered. It... seeing him here, so close to Hastings' house, it took me by surprise. You don't think he's spying on you, do you? asked Arabella. Her finely drawn brows had arrowed into a frown. Charlie swallowed. Her mouth was so dry, it felt like it was filled with ashes. I shouldn't think so. But he's such a horrible, devious man. Who knows what motivates him? From what you've t told me about him, Charlie, it's only natural that you'd be shaken by the mere sight of him, said Olivia. But if you're worried, you should tell Max. You said he was keeping an eye on the blackguard. Yes. Charlie forced herself to smile. Don't mind me. Another cup of tea and the company of my dearest friends will quickly restore my equilibrium. Ah, and here comes the waiter with our pot now. As Olivia began to dispense fresh tea for everyone, Charlie's attention was drawn to the tea shop's doorway. The gentleman who'd been talking with Lord Rochefort had just entered. He was well dressed, and a large leather folio was tucked beneath one arm. Upon removing his beaver hat, he revealed a balding pate. That's when she remembered where she'd seen him before. The hair at her nape stood on end. He was the male visitor Cressida had received at Devereux House when Charlie had been taking tea with the Dowager Duchess and Diana. Charlie's gaze narrowed on him as he crossed the bustling tea shop to one of the cake displays near the counter. The fact that this man knew both Cressida and Lord Rochefort might be inconsequential. But what if it did mean something? What is it? asked Olivia, as she passed Charlie her replenished cup of tea. You seemed distracted. Lord Rochefort hasn't come in, has he? asked Sophie, her worried gaze darting to the door. No, murmured Charlie. But the gentleman the Baron was speaking to outside has. And I think I recognise him. She quickly explained how she'd glimpsed him through the drawing-room doorway at Devereux House. That does seem a wee bit odd, observed Arabella, peering over her glasses at the man, who'd now taken a seat at another table on the opposite side of the tea shop. He has the look of a man of affairs about him. Someone professional rather than a member of the ton. But maybe that's just because he has that folio with him. It lends him a business-like air. Yes. Charlie beckoned over the waiter who'd brought their tea. She was such a frequent visitor to Gunter's, she knew most of the staff, and they knew her. Jacques, I know this may seem like a peculiar question, 
but that bespectacled gentleman who just came in and is now sitting over there. She gestured discreetly in the stranger's direction. Do you by any chance know his name? Or what he does for a living? The young man frowned for a moment, then nodded. Bien sûr, my lady. It's Monsieur Erasmus Silver. I believe he's a... He rubbed his chin. How do you say? Editor de journal. A newspaper editor. Oui. Newspaper editor? Charlie's pulse quickened. Have you any idea which particular paper he works for? Jacques's brow furrowed in concentration again. Perhaps it is the Beaumont Mirror? I'm sorry, I cannot be more certain. A wave of white-hot anger surged inside Charlie at the knowledge that the man blithely sipping his coffee on the other side of the room worked for the publication that had done nothing but belittle her and besmirch her reputation for the last four years. She suddenly felt like she'd been thrust into a furnace. Indeed, her skin prickled and her cheeks blazed with heat. And then her fury hardened and cooled like newly forged steel. Fierce determination settled in the pit of her stomach, and a plan began to take shape in her mind. Aware that Jacques was awaiting further direction, Charlie managed to bury her ire and summoned a smile. Thank you so much. You've been wonderfully helpful. When she took care of the bill, she would make sure the young man was rewarded with a sizable tip. Well, said Sophie, once the waiter had moved on to another table. It looks as though you've discovered who the tattler in the Dowager Duchess of Exmoor's household is. Perhaps, said Charlie. But I think I'd like to test that theory before I denounce Max's mother as a two-faced, backstabbing witch. How will you do that? asked Olivia. Charlie smiled. I have an idea, but I'll have to ask one of my respectable married friends to assist me. Oh, I will, declared Sophie, her blue eyes dancing with excitement. What do I have to do? Charlie placed her linen napkin on the table and smoothed down the skirts of her walking gown as she stood. Just play the part of respectable chaperone while I join Mr. Silver. This won't take long. Good luck, offered Olivia. And we want to hear all the details when you return, added Arabella. Charlie grinned. Bien sûr. Erasmus Silver's bushy eyebrows plunged into a frown when Charlie stopped by his table and offered a greeting that encompassed a bald-faced lie. Mr. Silver, fancy meeting you here, she said brightly. It's so lovely to see you again. Would you mind if we joined you? His tone was frost-laden as he peered over his wire-rimmed spectacles at her and then Sophie, who waited close by. I'm sorry, but I don't know you, miss. Charlie placed a hand over the fichu at her throat. My goodness, how embarrassing, she replied. It's Lady Charlotte Hastings, Mr. Silver. We have a mutual acquaintance, Cressida, the Dowager Duchess of Exmoor. You recently visited Devereux House while the Dowager Duchess and I were taking tea. Oh, I. Now Erasmus Silver had to decide whether to call Charlie out for lying about their non-existent prior relationship or to go along with her ruse. Behind his spectacles, his pale grey eyes narrowed to slits. Of course, Lady Charlotte. I remember now. At last, he stood as etiquette decreed. Why don't you and... His gaze skipped to Sophie. Lady Mulvan, my sister-in-law, Charlie supplied by way of introduction. Why don't you and Lady Mulvan take a seat? We'd love to, declared Charlie, with false sweetness. Once she and Sophie were settled, and after Mr. Silver had taken a moment to push a notebook and pencil back into his folio, he pinned Charlie with an expectant look. Now, what can I do for you, my lady? 
He was astute enough to realise that Charlie didn't wish to linger about, making small talk over cups of tea or coffee and plates of cake, and that was fine with her too. If he'd said, I'm a busy man, now get on with it, she wouldn't have minded in the least. Only just resisting the urge to upend his hot cup of coffee in his lap, she placed her forearms on the table and leaned forward in a conspiratorial fashion. I understand you're the editor for a certain publication of some renown, the very popular Beaumont Mirror. Mr. Silver sat up ramrod straight and squared his shoulders, almost as though he were preparing for an attack. Given the fact the paper had been waging war against the Earl of Westhampton's daughter and her friends for several years, Charlie couldn't blame him. You are correct, Lady Charlotte, he said stiffly. But I would have thought you would know that, considering we've apparently already met. Charlie didn't flinch at his little dig. Instead, she leaned even closer and lowered her voice. Well, she glanced about their table, as though checking who was in their immediate vicinity and might be eavesdropping. I'm sure you're always on the lookout for the latest on D for your newspaper's society page. And I happen to have an especially juicy tidbit, just for you. If you'd like to hear it. Mr. Silver grew very still. Go on. I'm listening. Charlie really hoped her gambit would pay off. Before I share my intelligence with you, Mr. Silver, I need your assurance that you won't divulge the name of your source. Because the subject of the Ondi would be most upset if she were to find out who broke her confidence. It could prove rather awkward for me. Mr. Silver's eyes gleamed. So, you know this person well. You're certain your intelligence is sound, and not just an unsubstantiated rumour. Oh, yes, Charlie lied. And if my word isn't enough, Lady Mulvan here, she nodded at Sophie, can corroborate my scandalous story. Sophie inclined her head. Apart from a certain telltale twinkle in her eyes, she maintained a serious expression. Yes, indeed. I certainly can. Well then, said Mr. Silver, this man who'd created untold havoc in her life and that of her dearest friends. I'm all ears, Lady Charlotte. Charlie looked the gossip-hungry editor in the eye. It involves none other than the Dowager Duchess of Exmoor herself, she said. It seems my mother-in-law-to-be is not the model of decorum that everyone thinks she is. You see, she's been having an affair with one of London's most notorious rake hells. She paused for effect before adding in a melodramatic whisper, Baron Rochefort! Mr. Silver snorted. Surely you jest. I do not, said Charlie. While visiting Devereux House, I stumbled across several love letters penned by the dowager. She spoke at length about their trysts. And I hope you can forgive me for being so indelicate, Mr. Silver, but she also mentioned Lord Rochefort's particular proclivities when it comes to bed sport. She dropped her volume to a dramatic whisper again. I could elaborate further about the Baron's penchant for riding crops and birch rods. And goodness, just imagine the fun you could have with the title of the article, Birching the Baron, or even Disciplining the Duchess. But I feel Gunther's tea shop is not the place for a young lady such as myself to divulge such vulgar details. Above his starched neckcloth, Mr. Silver's face had turned a deep, ruddy shade that bordered upon puce. Yes, quite, he said in a strangled voice. But I think you've provided me with sufficient information, Lady Charlotte. Charlie blinked. I have. Out of the corner of her eye, she spied Sophie pressing a lawn kerchief to her mouth to suppress a fit of laughter. But you haven't heard about the time. 
the editor of the Beaumont Mirror held up a hand. That's quite enough, my lady. I shall make a note of all you've shared with me, but I cannot promise that this story will end up in the paper. Why ever not? asked Charlie. I mean, you'd make a fortune in sales. And you never use anyone's full name in your gossip column. Pardon me, I mean, society page. So you cannot be sued for libel. And as you said, you don't divulge your sources. So how can there be a problem? I'm afraid there are some things that even the Beaumont Mirror cannot publish. Charlie's tone hardened. Oh, I see. Or is it more the case that you're quite happy to slander and humiliate particular members of the ton that you see as easy prey, but there are other individuals that you won't touch with a ten-foot barge pole? That hardly seems fair. Life in general isn't fair, my lady, replied the editor coldly. Oh, believe me, I learned that lesson four years ago, Mr. Silver. Thanks to you. Charlie stood abruptly. She'd had quite enough of conversing with this gentleman, and she was now quite certain where the loyalties of the Beaumont Mirror's editor lay, given he had all but refused to print anything that cast aspersions on the Dowager Duchess's uprightness of character. He was protecting her, and possibly Lord Rochefort as well. But why? More importantly, now that she'd kicked the hornet's nest, would she get stung? By the time Charlie got back to the table where Arabella and Olivia still sat, her trembling legs felt like blancmange. What on earth had she been thinking? The ramifications of what she'd just done could be catastrophic. With Sophie's support, she recounted her conversation with the editor and her fears for the future. What if Erasmus Silver goes to Cressida, or even Lord Rochefort, and tells them what I attempted to do? To say they won't be happy would be an understatement. And should I tell Max? She caught the gazes of each of her friends. How will he feel when he learns I said terrible, horrible, untrue things about his own mother? I don't wish to upset or anger him, not when things between us have been going so well. Indeed, tonight he's taking me somewhere special. A surprise he's been planning since the beginning of the week. She buried her face in her hands as anxiety twisted her insides into tight knots. Oh, what have I done? I'm such an impulsive fool. Olivia patted her shoulder. You've collected evidence to support your theory that Cressida is the one who's been feeding damaging stories about you to the Beaumont Mirror. But that's just it, sighed Charlie as she dropped her hands. It's only a theory. I haven't proved it at all. Not really. Yes, Cressida knows Mr. Silver, and he appears to want to protect the Dowager Duchess's reputation. But as for anything else, she shrugged. It's still nothing but speculation on my part. In any event, I think you should tell Max what you've learned, said practical as ever Arabella. I truly believe it won't affect how he feels about you. He's defended you against his mother's insults and machinations, at every turn. Yes, said Sophie. You must be honest with him. It might just be the ammunition he needs to call out his mother for her duplicity. I, for one, am certain she's guilty. And Max might also find it interesting to know that Lord Rochefort is on friendly terms with Mr. Silver. Considering Lord Rochefort gave my stolen diary to someone at the Beaumont Mirror, I suppose it's not all that surprising, Charlie said dully. But you're right, my dear friends. I can't keep this from Max. The sooner I tell him about all of this, the better. I just pray that he'll understand why I did what I did. Chapter 20 Many of our dedicated readers no doubt believe 
cleanliness is indeed next to godliness. But for anyone who is a doubting Thomas or Thomasina, you might find the following essay on the efficacy of baths in preserving health and restoring beauty by Dr. Brompton, a physician, to be most informative. The Beaumont Mirror, General Health and Medical Miscellany. Exmoor House, Grosvenor Square. His grace is not in the library, my lady, said Chifley, as soon as the door to Exmoor House opened. He's in his private chambers. With his valet. Oh. Charlie frowned. Oh, I... She twisted the handle of her reticule with gloved hands. The matter I need to speak to him about is quite urgent. Is there any chance? Chifley sighed, and Charlie felt a pinch of guilt. Her indecorous intrusions undoubtedly vexed the man no end. I shall have Harvey here, he nodded toward one of the nearby footmen, escort you upstairs to His Grace's sitting room. His Grace has just returned from Angelo's fencing academy, so I'm not sure what state you'll find him in. He peered past her, out to the square. You haven't a maid with you? Charlie lifted her chin. No. Another long-suffering sigh. Would you like me to send up one of His Grace's maids, with a tray of refreshments? Charlie narrowed her gaze. No. Thank you. While the butler seemed determined to preserve her reputation yet again by arranging some sort of chaperonage, she didn't have time for this. The longer she waited about on the doorstep, the greater the chance there was of someone noticing that Lady Charlotte Hastings was paying an unaccompanied visit to the Duke of Exmoor's townhouse in broad daylight. Even though they were engaged, it still wasn't the done thing, and would no doubt raise an eyebrow or two. I won't be staying long, she added, for good measure. The butler stepped back, his expression resigned. Very well, my lady. Thank you. The moment the suitably expressionless footman showed her into Max's sitting room, Smedley, his valet, emerged from a connecting room, presumably Max's bedchamber. The man's eyes turned as round as saucers as soon as he saw her. Lady Charlotte! My goodness! he exclaimed. His grace is... What the devil is going on, Smedley? Can't a man have a bath in... Max's words died on his lips when he appeared in the open doorway. Dressed in nothing but a thin linen towel that was slung low about his lean hips, his eyebrows shot up while Charlie's mouth dropped open. Good God! Max's muscular physique was... She literally had no words for such chiselled perfection. The dusting of hair in tantalising places, including the thin trail which arrowed down his taut lower belly, straight toward his... Charlie swallowed, and heat scorched her entire face. To think... She'd been pressed up against that breathtakingly beautiful body only yesterday when Max had kissed her in the rain in Hyde Park. She clutched at the doorframe with one hand. No wonder her own body had suddenly turned liquid with longing. While she continued to gape like a feather-brained pea-goose, Max disappeared, but a moment later he was back, cinching a royal blue satin robe about his waist. Leave us, he said to the room, and Smedley, Harvey, and another footman, who'd been lingering all goggle-eyed by the sitting-room door, immediately scurried away. Charlie drew a bracing breath, and somehow found her voice. Max, I... my apologies for interrupting your... She had to drag her eyes away from the captivating sight of his partially exposed pectoral muscles and back to his face. I... I had to see you. Of course, I didn't mean to see this much of you. Oh, bother. She was rambling. 
She dropped her gaze, but then she couldn't seem to stop staring at Max's lower legs, his muscular calves, and his shapely bare feet. Good heavens! Even his feet were gorgeous. And that's when she noticed something odd. The little toe on Max's left foot was missing. It simply wasn't there. But there was a pale scar. Had he been injured at Waterloo? Nate had never mentioned it. Compassion welled in her heart. To think of Max suffering, even if it was just the loss of a pinky toe, made her unaccountably sad. When she dared to look up again, Max's mouth was twitching with a smile. It was clear he didn't seem to mind the fact that she was blatantly staring at his bare legs and feet as he said, No harm done, Charlie. Crossing his arms over his chest, he leaned with studied nonchalance against the door jamb. Although, given the fact you've managed to persuade Chifley to let you in, I suspect it's something important. Well, yes. She grimaced and twisted her hands again, willing herself to confess all. Actually, I think I've just done something beyond foolish. Something that you might hate me for. I seriously doubt that, he said, concern creasing his brow. But come, let's sit by the fire and you can tell me all about it. By the time Charlie finished recounting what had happened at Gunther's tea shop, Max's frown had descended into ferocious territory. I can't believe Erasmus Silver was at my mother's house, he said, his voice hard with anger. If she's had anything at all to do with this concerted campaign to discredit you since our engagement, by God. He thumped his curled fist on the arm of his wing-back chair and shook his head. As for Rochefort, it doesn't surprise me at all that he and Silver are on friendly terms. But my mother... He shook his head, his expression grim. I agree with you. That slippery, soulless eel Silver appears to be protecting her. The pertinent question is why. Why is the Dowager Duchess of Exmoor so special? You'd think a salacious story about a high-ranking member of the Ton would be impossible for him to ignore. You're... you're not angry at me for attempting to spread false gossip about your mother? Charlie asked. If Erasmus Silver does take the bait after all. Max met her eyes. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Your reasoning and method for testing your hypothesis were sound. And to put your mind at ease, I'm certain Silver won't do a thing. If he really did want to publish the story, he would have jumped at the chance to gather every last little detail from you. But he didn't, and that is decidedly odd. Of course, Silver could just be protecting Rochefort, the other subject of your story. Max sighed heavily. Damn it. I wish I knew more about the company that owns the Beaumont Mirror. My man of affairs and an inquiry agent have been trying to dig up information on them, but to date, their inquiries have yielded nothing helpful. I'm also worried about the fact that I've just poked a dangerous bear with a terribly big stick, said Charlie. If Erasmus Silver goes to your mother, or Rochefort, and tells them what I tried to do. A shiver raced down her spine. I can't imagine either of them shrugging it off. Max reached out and clasped her hand. You've nothing to fear, Charlie. I'll protect you. Alarm flared inside Charlie. Please promise me you won't do anything rash. I've caused enough trouble as it is. I won't. And you haven't done anything wrong. Well, Max's mouth quirked with a smile. That's not entirely true. You did walk in on me as I was about to take a bath. Imagine the field day the Beaumont Mirror would have with a story like that 
if it ever got out. Charlie clutched her throat in mock horror. Perish the thought! But in all seriousness, Max, I'm so sorry for barging in. Again. And your bathwater is probably cold by now, so I should go. I have to get ready for this evening, too. She stood. I don't want to be late for whatever it is you have planned. Actually, she gave him a reproving look. You said you were going to send word to me about all of the details, but you haven't. Max rose too. Cocking a brow, he said. Actually, I have. However, you came barging into my private rooms, your words, not mine, rather than returning home to Hastings' house, didn't you? But I agree. You should go, before I decide to drag you into the bath with me. Charlie laughed. Silly man! And you think that sort of threat will scare me away? You know I'm not a shrinking violet. No, you're not. Catching her hand against his chest, Max swooped down and gave her a swift, hard kiss. I'm serious, though. If you don't leave now, I will have my wicked way with you, and then we'll both be very late. His mouth kicked into a grin. For Almax. Almax? Charlie gasped. How on earth did you manage to procure vouchers? I'm a duke. He winked. I can have whatever I want, whenever I want it, don't you know? I wish you truly wanted me. For your wife. Charlie swallowed a sigh. Even if Max never professed his undying love for her, she would take what she could get from this new, oh-so-devilish, willing-to-take-chances Max, rather than the keep-you-at-a-distance Max of old. I'm beginning to suspect that you're working your way through my not-so-secret list, Maximilian Devereux. His wicked grin was back. I might be. You deserve to be happy, Charlie. I might not be able to give you everything you want, but I'm going to try my damnedest to make you smile. Well, how can I take issue with that? she returned. And thank you, not only for the Almax voucher, but for believing in me. Standing on tiptoe, she reached up and kissed him on the cheek. Stubble prickled her lips, and she smiled. I'll see you tonight, Your Grace she whispered against his ear while she trailed her fingers down his bare chest. As she turned to go, she swore that she heard Max mutter, Minx. But she didn't mind at all, because she knew without a doubt that he liked her just the way she was. As soon as the door shut, Max uttered a string of the worst curse words he knew. What the bloody blazing hell was his mother up to? He had to find out. After washing and dressing rapidly, he marched over to Devereux House. He found his mother in her private study, dictating a letter to her secretary. Diana sat by the fire, reading a novel. Everyone looked up the moment he walked in. Maximilian! His mother's smile quickly disappeared when she noted the thunderous expression on his face. Her private secretary and Diana quickly disappeared, too. Now, what can I do for you? she asked when they were alone. Leaning back in the elegant shepherdess chair behind her desk, she didn't look the least bit perturbed. It was almost as though she'd been anticipating both his arrival and his foul mood. I think you know why I'm here, he growled. My secretary tells me you picked up your Almax vouchers this morning, so I haven't the slightest idea why you've come back again so soon, my son, she said smoothly. However, judging by the look on your face, you clearly don't wish to take tea with me and chat about the weather. So, why don't you enlighten me? By God, she was cold-blooded. But then, 
She always had been. Max fought to rein in his anger and modulate his voice. Why are you consorting with the likes of Erasmus Silver? And to what end? His mother's brow descended into a puzzled frown. Erasmus Silver? I'm not sure if I've heard. Max raised an admonitory finger. Don't. Don't you dare tell me that you don't know exactly who Erasmus Silver is, or that he's the head editor of the Beaumont Mirror, the most scurrilous scandal-mongering rag in the country, that has published harmful gossip, not just about me and my closest friends, but all but ruined my fiancé on multiple occasions. His mother's already pale complexion blanched to the shade of the parchment paper on the blotter before her. You're right, she said. I do know who he is. And would you care to explain how you came to know him? His mother seemed to rally. Leaning forward, she placed her hands carefully on the blotter and met his gaze. In keeping with my station as the Dowager Duchess of Exmoor, I support a number of prominent charities and societies by serving as a patroness or trustee. One of these groups is the London Royal Academy of Art, and in less than two weeks, their annual exhibition opens. I recently met with Mr. Erasmus to discuss promoting the exhibition's opening in the newspaper's society pages. That's all. You may not like it, but the Beaumont Mirror does have a significant readership. Max gave a derisive snort. Not good enough, Mother. Why couldn't your personal secretary undertake such a task for you? Have you never heard of writing a letter? I've also been informed that Mr. Silver visited Devereux House several weeks ago. Was that to discuss the Royal Academy of Art exhibition, or another matter entirely? His mother's eyes glittered. Are you spying on my movements again, Max? Like I'm some common sneak thief? How dare you? And how dare you consort with gutter-dwelling creatures like Erasmus Silver and Lord Rochefort? You're the Dowager Duchess of Exmoor, for God's sake. And you accuse my fiancé of having a disreputable reputation. Your busybody of a fiancé should keep her pesky nose. She broke off and clamped her lips together. Out of your business? Is that what you were going to say? Did your friend Mr. Silver come by to tell you about a certain conversation he had with Lady Charlotte this afternoon? Max planted his hands on the blotter and leaned forward. I thought you barely knew Silver, so why would he do such a thing? You are making a gross assumption, with no evidence to support— but it's a logical assumption, no? For some reason I can't fathom, Erasmus Silver is protecting you. Why else would he refuse to publish a juicy piece of gossip about you? The man thrives on it. Erasmus Silver is a gentleman. Good God, now I know you're lying. Next you'll be telling me that Lord Rochefort is a gentleman too. Max straightened. This is my final warning, mother dearest. Stay away from Silver. But most of all, stop feeding him damaging gossip about Lady Charlotte. You'll deny it, of course, but I know it's you who's been slandering her. Slandering? His mother sniffed. As if I'd ever engage in such vulgar behaviour. Besides, I barely think about the girl. That young woman is going to be my wife, whether you like it or not. And all of London will see that tonight, when I waltz around Almac's assembly rooms, with her and no one else. With that, Max turned on his booted heel and headed for the door. Oh, and by the way, if we ever have to have a conversation like this again, you'll be packing your trunks and departing for the dower house in Devonshire within the hour. Max didn't stay to observe his mother's expression, 
but he did hear something smash after he shut the door behind him. Good. At long bloody last, she was taking him seriously. Chapter 21 Do you have your voucher permitting you entry to Almac's assembly rooms? We all know how exacting the vaunted lady patronesses of Almax can be. Read on for essential advice that will not only help you gain access to London's most exclusive marriage hunting ground, you'll learn how to avoid being a wallflower. The Beaumont Mirror, the essential style and etiquette guide. Hastings House, Berkeley Square. Charlie waited in the vestibule of Hastings House, checking her reflection one last time in the gilt-edged mirror. Her eyes glowed, and her cheeks were so pink with excitement, she didn't need to pinch them. But she might need to pinch herself elsewhere to make sure she was awake. She was going to Almax. With Max. How long had she dreamed of such a thing? If she were perfectly honest with herself, it would have been from the moment she'd met Max, when she was only sixteen and he was twenty-two. She could recall the exact moment that long-ago summer, when Nate had showed his handsome-as-sin university chum into the grand entry hall of Elmstone Hall, their country manor in Gloucestershire. She'd been smitten instantly. With his dark golden hair, Sparkling eyes of sapphire blue and his square-jawed beauty, Maximilian Devereux was the epitome of the hero she'd always pictured in her fantasies. Indeed, tonight she at long last felt like a princess in a fairy tale, waiting for the arrival of her very own Prince Charming. She'd certainly dressed for the occasion. With her curls piled high on her head, pearls at her throat, ears, and threaded through her hair, and a ball gown of soft shell pink silk falling in graceful folds about her figure, she was certain the patronesses of London's most exclusive venue would not take issue with her appearance and refuse her entry. And, of course, she'd be on the arm of a powerful duke. Molly waited nearby with her gloves, fan, and matching reticule. You look as fine as can be, my lady, she sighed as she handed Charlie her gloves. I'd be happy to accompany you in the carriage. No, you have the night off. You deserve it, said Charlie as she tugged on her white satin gloves. No doubt Molly wished to gawk at all the other fine ladies as they arrived at the assembly rooms, but she didn't want her maid shadowing her tonight. Max was sending one of his carriages around, and she was certain he'd ask Diana to accompany them for the sake of appearances. He wouldn't ask his mother. Not after the goings-on at Gunter's. As for her father, he was, as usual, elsewhere. In fact, Charlie had barely seen him of late, but she didn't mind, because he seemed so content and happy. The mantle of sadness he'd worn for so long was gone. If he wasn't at one of his clubs, he was usually out and about with Lady Tilbury. Charlie strongly suspected it was only a matter of time before he announced that he'd proposed to the lovely widow. It was a day she looked forward to. Charlie had just finished fastening the pearl buttons at the tops of her gloves when there was a knock at the front door. The footman opened it to reveal her fiancé in all of his evening finery. But nothing was as fine as the smile that broke across his face as his warm gaze wandered over her with frank appreciation. Lady Charlotte, I've never seen you looking so beautiful, he said in such a smooth, dark voice, Charlie's toes curled in her pink satin slippers. Why, thank you, Your Grace. And I could say the same about you, she returned. I mean, you look very handsome. He bowed and offered his arm. Your chariot awaits, my lady, he said. Let us away to Almax 
where we'll dazzle the ton with our waltzing. Charlie tucked her gloved hand into the crook of Max's elbow. I can hardly wait. As Max handed her into his carriage, Charlie was astonished to discover that she was the cab's only occupant. I thought Diana would be joining us, she said, when Max climbed in and took the seat beside her. I'm afraid I want you all to myself, Max said with a rakish grin as the door shut and the carriage moved off. Do you mind terribly? We are engaged, and so I thought that might give us a little bit of leeway when it comes to observing or not observing the rules, as the case may be. Ordinarily, I would agree with you, but we are going to Almax. People are bound to talk if we arrive together in a closed carriage without a chaperone. They will regardless, Charlie. True, she said with a sigh. However, if you would prefer it, would you like to bring someone along? I saw your maid hovering about the vestibule. One word from you, and I'll stop the carriage. We could even travel separately. I can hail a hackney coach easily enough. Now that would be beyond silly, said Charlie. No, you're right. Let the ton talk if they want to. Besides, it's a short drive, so even if Nate hears about our unchaperoned journey, he can hardly complain. It's not as though we can get up to too much mischief in the space of ten minutes. Speak for yourself, said Max, with a devilish smile. He rested his large hand on her knee. Charlie wrapped him lightly on the knuckles with her closed fan. You must promise to behave, Your Grace. I won't have you rumpling my gown or messing up my hair before we arrive. He laughed. I promise, he said. But your decree also begs the question, can I rumple your gown and mess up your hair afterward? Charlie's pulse raced faster than a scotch reel. Did Max really mean that? Judging by the wicked gleam in his eyes, she suspected he might. Perhaps, she said, with an arch smile. If you sweep me off my feet tonight, who knows what might happen after the assembly? In the shadowy cabin, Max's heated gaze captured hers. Well, now I'm the one who can hardly wait, he murmured, and Charlie swore she blushed all over. It didn't take long for them to reach King Street, where Almax was located. However, the thoroughfare was completely congested with traffic. Max's carriage began to crawl toward their destination at a frustratingly slow snail's pace. I'm quite happy to walk the remaining distance, said Charlie. It's not far. No, you shall arrive in style. Max's voice was firm. I want everyone to know that you're arriving with me, the Duke of Exmoor, and as my fiancé, you are not to be trifled with. Hmm. Charlie looked out of the carriage window. She could see the gas lamps illuminating the rather plain façade of the much-vaunted assembly rooms. A small crowd of elegantly dressed attendees was milling out the front, waiting to be admitted. It wouldn't do at all to arrive late. Indeed, the patronesses had been known to turn guests away for breaching their strict rules. And that was when Charlie was struck by the most novel thought. It was as though someone had just lit all the gas lamps in her own mind, bringing blazing clarity into her world. Her heart hammering, she turned to the man beside her, the Duke of her dreams. Max! She bit her lip, suddenly beset with nerves. He reached for her hand and squeezed it. It's all right. We won't be late. No, that's not. She swallowed. I... She inhaled a bracing breath. I don't want to go. I've suddenly realised something about myself. This girlish dream of mine, to waltz at Almax, it's not actually about the dancing at all. 
It's really about my need, and I suspect the need of most young women, to be accepted by the doyens of society, to gain their hard-to-win approval. But now, as I sit here with you, I've decided I don't give a fat flying fig about the patronesses of Almax or what they think of me. I don't want to adhere to their ridiculously strict rules or narrow views of what constitutes acceptable behaviour. They don't matter to me. At least, not any more. Of course, she cast him a smile. Waltzing about the assembly rooms in your arms would be lovely. But that's only because I'd be sharing the experience with you. You, Maximilian Devereux, it's your opinion of me that matters. And that of my own friends and family. All the rest is just mindless noise. It means nothing. Max's eyes searched hers for the space of several heartbeats. He nodded. I understand, he said solemnly. And you're right. I certainly don't give a jot about what any of those conceited, judgmental women think. Ultimately, I just want you to be happy. So, if you don't wish to go, we won't. He reached into the inner pocket of his evening jacket and withdrew the Almax vouchers. He flashed a wicked smile. Would you like to do the honours, or shall I? Charlie looked at the cream tickets with their official red seal and the signature of one of the patronesses scrawled across it. Are you certain you are all right with this, Max? You did go to a lot of trouble to procure them for me. And aren't they ten guineas apiece? Never put a price on your happiness, Charlie. Life is too short. You're right. She took the vouchers from Max and ripped them in two. There. With a grin, she tossed the pieces into the air and watched them flutter to the carriage floor. That was most satisfying. Max reached up and rapped three times on the carriage roof. You're taking me home? Charlie asked, as the coachman deftly manoeuvred Max's carriage out of the line of traffic and proceeded down the wrong side of King Street until they were clear of the snarl. Max turned to her, and his mouth curved into a slow, lazy smile. Eventually. I believe there's another item on your secret list of wishes and dreams we can mark off. Oh. Charlie's breath quickened. I gather you're not taking me all the way to the coast so I can sea bathe. As tempting as that proposition sounds, not tonight. Max removed his top hat and gloves and placed them with deliberate care on the seat across from them. No. Tonight I think a carriage ravishment is in order. He reclaimed the spot beside her, his arm resting behind her head, then cocked a brow. That is, if you are still amenable to the idea, Lady Charlotte. I've never been more so, she whispered. Acute longing seemed to have stolen her breath as she took in the sight of Max, looking back at her with lust in his gaze. Right at this very moment, if you consulted any dictionary, the definition of amenable would be Lady Charlotte Hastings. That devilish grin appeared again. I think that same dictionary would define the term utterly captivated with the words Maximilian Devereux, the Duke of Exmoor. He leaned in close and caught one of her trailing curls with gentle fingers. So, my lady. His warm breath brushed against her lips as he whispered in a dark, velvet voice full of wicked promise. Are you ready to be ravished and rumpled to the point of complete dishevelment? Charlie's heart somersaulted with sheer delight. My answer to that is a resounding yes, your grace. Ravish and rumple away. Max reached for one of her hands. Holding her gaze, he slid the pearl buttons at the top of her glove undone, then slowly peeled the satin away. 
I'm firmly of the opinion that a ravishment done the right way should never be a hurried affair, he murmured, then repeated the process with her other glove. Wherever his teasing fingertips brushed, he left a trail of goose flesh. A ravishment should be slow. He placed a kiss upon the tender skin on the inside of her wrist. Deliberate. He kissed the crook of her elbow. And thorough. He pushed the curls grazing her neck to one side and feathered a kiss across her jawline. No part of you should be left untouched or wanting. But tell me, Charlie. His mouth slid to her neck, and she felt his tongue taste an exquisitely sensitive spot just below her ear. What did you imagine when you put this particular item on your list? Was this what you had in mind? This is far better, she admitted on a breathless whisper. Her fingers curled into Max's lapels. I'm quite content to follow your lead. Good. All at once, Max dragged Charlie across his lap. One strong arm lashed her body to his, while his other hand cradled her face. His thumb stroked across her lower lip. Do you know how lusciously beautiful you are, Lady Charlotte Hastings? Or how much I want you? Judging by the steel-hard shaft jutting against her thigh, Charlie could indeed feel how very much Max desired her. The thought of his arousal made her whole body liquid with longing. The blood flowing within her veins had turned to molten honey, and her very bones were as soft as sun-warmed butter. I... I have an idea, she murmured, sliding one of her hands between them. With gentle fingers, she caressed his long, hard length through the fall of his evening breeches. Max groaned and buried his face in the crook of her neck. Sweet Jesus, he whispered hoarsely, then stilled her hand with his. This is supposed to be about your pleasure, not mine. Pleasing you will please me, she returned. The knowledge that she could bring Max undone with just her touch was heady indeed. All in good time, sweetheart. All in good time. Max speared his fingers into her hair and brought his mouth down on hers in a searing, breath-stealing kiss. Max's tongue boldly slid between her lips, and Charlie opened for him without hesitation. He delved deeply, each hot, slick stroke a languorous caress that she eagerly returned in kind. As each delicious, drugging kiss slid seamlessly into another, then another, Charlie soon found that her head was spinning and her body was aflame. However, all too soon, kisses weren't enough to appease the fire that Max had ignited inside her. And he knew. Whether it was the way she squirmed upon his lap or when he pulled a ragged moan from her throat, it hardly mattered. All that mattered was she needed more. And Max gave it to her. His clever fingers deftly loosened her buttons and laces, and before she knew it, he'd freed her breasts from the confines of bodice and stays. In the cool night air, her nipples hardened to tight, aching points. Dear God! he murmured, his voice filled with reverence. The ambient glow of passing gaslights intermittently illuminated her body and his rapt expression as he studied her nudity through half-mast lids. His hands cupped her gently, lifting and squeezing, as though learning the shape and feel of her. Charlie, I. Unashamed, she smiled, and let her fingers drift through his thick, ruffled locks. You're speechless? Yes. For such a long time, I've envisioned you just like this in my arms. He broke off. Swallowed. 
His gaze met hers briefly before dropping again. I hope you'll forgive me for being so crude, but there's no other way to say it. Lady Charlotte Hastings, your tits are utterly magnificent. If I were the least bit artistic, I'd capture their likeness on canvas. Or in marble. At the very least, I'd write a sonnet about them. We have something in common, then. How so? I've also had thoughts about composing odes to your fine physique and handsome face. He smiled, as though genuinely pleased by her confession. While we're exchanging confidences, my lady, I have another one I'd like to share. Oh, yes? Max's thumbs brushed in teasing circles over and around her tightly furled nipples. Not only have I long imagined what your delectable breasts would look like, their size and shape, and the precise colour of your nipples, and I was right, their apricot pink, I've also wondered how they would taste. And if I don't bury my face between them at least once, I think I might die. A breathy laugh escaped Charlie, and she clutched at Max's head. Well, we can't have that, Your Grace. Do what you must. Thank God, he groaned. He gave her a swift, hard kiss, then his mouth slid downward. He pressed his face into her cleavage, inhaled a deep breath as though memorizing her scent, then turned his head and seized one of her nipples between his lips. The sensation of his hot mouth, gently but insistently suckling her, was divine. At the same time, he continued to torment her other nipple, plucking and circling the taut, sensitized peak with his fingers. Max! she gasped, clutching at his head. His ministrations were exquisite torture. She wasn't sure if she wanted him to stop or go on forever. Max was relentless, giving her no quarter. He transferred his mouth to her other nipple, tugging on it gently with his teeth before laving it with his tongue, driving her wild. Desire pulsed between Charlie's thighs, and she shifted restlessly on his lap. Do you want more, sweet Charlotte? he whispered into the darkness. One of his hands slid beneath the hem of her ball gown and skated up her leg to her knee. His fingers danced circles over the sensitive flesh just above her silk stocking. Oh, God, yes! And she meant it. With Max, she wanted everything. He caught her mouth in another blazing hot kiss, and his fingers continued their wicked march up her thigh until they reached the curls hiding her sex. When he paused, Charlie whimpered in frustration. Are you wet for me, Charlie? he murmured against her lips. In response, she slid a leg to the side in shameless invitation. Why don't you find out, Your Grace? Max didn't hesitate to act. One long finger traced a teasing path between her slick, swollen folds before settling on her core. At the exquisite contact, Charlie shuddered and clutched at his shoulders. While she'd pleasured herself on many occasions, it had never, ever felt as wonderful as this. Max, she breathed, as he began to mercilessly torment her oh-so-sensitive bud rubbing and flicking and gently pinching. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, don't stop. I won't. When Max set his mouth to her breast, working her into a frenzy with tongue and lips, Charlie couldn't contain a moan. The tension inside her was building, coiling tighter. Her release was so close. Perhaps sensing she was on the edge of bliss, Max slid a finger inside her. As he worked in and out of her quivering sex, he continued to tease her core with the pad of his thumb, circling and circling, increasing the pace. 
driving her higher. The moment he buried his face in her neck and lightly nipped the taut tendon at the juncture of her shoulder, she cried out in ecstasy. A wave of pleasure engulfed her, and she shuddered and shivered in Max's arms as she rode the crest to completion. Drifting in a haze of delicious delirium, she clung to Max, her face pressed into his shoulder until he withdrew his hand and roused her with a gentle kiss at her temple. I take it you found satisfaction, my lady. She laughed and lifted her head. I think it's rather obvious that I did. I've never experienced such a powerful release before. It's never been quite so intense when I've... She broke off and felt herself blushing, which was quite ridiculous given the circumstances. She drew a breath and completed the thought. When I've pleasured myself, thinking about you. He brushed a lock of hair from her cheek. You think of me when you touch yourself. I'm sincerely flattered. She studied his face, and even in the uncertain light, she detected a smile in his eyes. You're not shocked? A ghost of a smile hovered on his lips. About which part? The fact that you pleasure yourself on occasion, or that when you do so, I'm the man you're picturing in your mind? Both. Both admissions please me. More than I can say. Because when I come by my own hand, I'm usually thinking about you, too. Oh, you are? His confession filled Charlie with a warm glow. Of course, he said. Keeping my hands off you has been such a struggle for me. You have no idea. Up until now, I've had to make do with libidinous fantasies in the night in my private chambers. A hot thrill coursed through Charlie. She couldn't resist asking. And what do I do in these libidinous fantasies, Your Grace? Were there any carriage trysts? He laughed. There might have been. And is this where your fantasy ends? With me achieving satisfaction, whereas you are left wanting? Max's expression sobered then. As I said earlier, tonight is about fulfilling your dreams, not mine. But what if one of my dreams is to ravish you, Max? In a carriage when we're all alone. You can't deny that you want me. I'm sure that cockstand of yours could drive a nail through wood. Max let out a snort of laughter. Lady Charlotte Hastings, I can't believe that you just said that. If I have my way, you'll soon be saying, Lady Charlotte Hastings, I can't believe that you're actually doing that. But I am going to do it, Max. I'm not going home until you've come, too. Devil take him. Charlie had that determined glint in her eye and stubborn set to her jaw that Max knew so well. He should say no to her salacious proposition. He really didn't expect her to return the favour. But as she continued to sit on his lap, with her chestnut hair in complete disarray, her rumpled skirts pushed up around her thighs, and her bountiful breasts still on full display, his will was quavering. His throbbing cock and aching bollocks certainly had no objections. He blew out a frustrated sigh and prayed for the strength to resist temptation. But all of his good intentions went up in a puff of smoke as soon as her wicked fingers stroked his shaft and she pressed her mouth to his ear and whispered exactly what she was going to do to him. Dear God above, holding back the tide or stopping the world from turning would be a far easier task than saying no to his bold and beautiful fiancée especially when she began to undo the fall of his breeches and her bare fingers encircled his hot, rigid length. If he hadn't gritted his teeth, he might have exploded like an untried youth at that very moment. However, when Charlie hopped off his lap 
and slid to her knees between his legs, the gentleman in him tried one last time to stop her. Charlie, he murmured, cupping her face between his hands. Are you sure you want to do this? Do you really know what to expect? She bit her lip, and for a moment, uncertainty flickered in her gaze. I will confess that I've never done this before, but I have a thorough understanding of what to do and what will happen when you come. You seem to forget that all of my friends are married to former Rakehells, and, well, we talk. I'm more than ready to try this if you are. She gave his cock another gentle squeeze, and when an involuntary hiss escaped him, her mouth curved into a provocative smile. I promise I won't bite. Well, not unless you want me to. Minx. Max shook his head. Very well. You've convinced me. I'll let you have your wicked way with me. Only, I reserve the right to stop you at any time. Of course. She lifted her tumble-down curls and pushed them over one shoulder. Now, hold on tight, Max, because you're about to lose all control. Sweet Charlie, for all her inexperience, wasn't wrong at all. As soon as her hot, wet mouth surrounded him, Max was done for. Lust pounded hot and hard through his veins, straight to his groin, and all rational thought fled. What Charlie lacked in finesse, she more than made up for with enthusiasm, and in no time at all, Max was cursing and shaking and groaning, and dear God, what she was doing with her tongue! She'd said she was a novice, but holy blazing hell! Max's thoughts began to fracture. He clutched at her head, and just as he realized he should warn her that he was going to orgasm, his bollocks contracted, and oh, sweet Jesus, he was there. A deep groan erupted from his throat as pleasure surged, and he shuddered and jerked before sinking into mind-numbing ecstasy. Replete and spent, satisfaction radiated through him, flooding every part of him, penetrating deeply, right down to his very bones. When Charlie joined him on the seat again, he roused himself enough to gather her into his arms. You are magnificent, he murmured into her hair. I really did lose control. For a moment, I think I even forgot who I was. She kissed his throat, then he felt her lips curve in a smile against his skin. Good. I'm glad. Now we're both thoroughly rumpled and satisfied. It's a night I will never forget. Max captured her chin and gently turned her face to his. Thank you, Charlie. I mean that sincerely. This is a night I will never forget either. I wish. I wish that I could be the man you deserve. A man who could love you. He swallowed the words. He didn't want to make her sad, not when he could see the glow of satisfaction and triumph in her brandy-wine eyes. But somehow, ever-perceptive Charlie knew exactly what to say to ease the guilt shredding his soul. You wish that we could do this again sometime? She brushed a kiss across his lips. Well, so do I. It's been far more enjoyable than waltzing around a stuffy ballroom. Max laced his fingers through hers and brought her hand to his lips. That, my dear, is something we can agree on. Chapter 22 My List of Secret Wishes and Dreams 1. Sneak into a gentleman's club to see what all the fuss is about. Done. 2. To be kissed, with passion, in the moonlight by a rake. Done. 3. Or in the rain, either will do. Done. 4. 
ride hell for leather down Rotten Row at least once, preferably not in the rain, unless there's any chance said passionate kiss happens straight afterward. Done. 5. Sea bathe, naked. 6. Sit for a licentious portrait a la Lady Hamilton. Done. 7. To be thoroughly ravished in a carriage. Done. 8. Waltz the night away at Almax. No longer required. 9. To experience a grand passion that I will remember long into my dotage. 10. The man, or should I say duke, of my dreams falls in love with me. Hastings House, Berkeley Square, Mayfair, April 28th, 1819. Charlie's quill hovered over the ninth item on her not-so-secret list of wishes and dreams, and she frowned. Was she ready to say that she'd had her grand passion? Could she put a line through it because she'd achieved her goal? No, not yet. She smiled to herself and let her gaze wander out of her sitting-room window to the light rain falling on the plane trees in Berkeley Square. Her grand passion with Max was still very much ongoing. In the week since he'd first ravished her in his carriage, he'd also ravished her just as thoroughly on the way home from the theatre a few nights later. And following an intimate dinner party, hosted by Olivia and Hamish, at Slate House in Grosvenor Square the night before, she and Max had managed to slip away to share a passionate kiss in the back garden. A knock at the door roused Charlie from her musings, and she closed her notebook just as Molly admitted Sophie. Charlie had been expecting her, and a tea service, along with a plate of cakes, sandwiches and savoury pastries, were already set out on the low table by the fire. Once they were armed with cups of tea and settled upon one of the settees, Peridot had claimed the other chair, Sophie began to unabashedly quiz Charlie. So, what happened? she asked, her blue eyes sparkling with curiosity. Did your moonlight tryst go according to plan, after Nate and I left? Even though Charlie felt herself blushing, she didn't mind her sister-in-law's good-natured interrogation. It did, she said. And I'm grateful you convinced Nate to go home a little early, otherwise I wouldn't have been game enough to suggest taking a turn about the terrace with Max. I'm sure Arabella and Olivia noticed how flushed and dishevelled I was when we returned to the drawing-room. If their husbands had any inkling, I'd trust they didn't go tattling to Nate about what we got up to. As far as I know, they haven't, said Sophie, helping herself to a cucumber sandwich. Indeed, I'm absolutely certain that Hamish and Gabriel wouldn't want to see Max and Nate come to blows. Or worse. No, I'm sure Hamish and Gabriel will bury their heads in the sand to keep the peace. Charlie winced and crumbled the discarded edge of her pastry onto her plate. I feel dreadful going behind Nate's back. But now Max and I are getting closer, at least in a physical sense. I need to be a little mercenary and make use of every opportunity I can to be intimate with him. Before I know it, the end of the season will be upon us, and if Max isn't able to acknowledge that he's in love with me... She shook her head. I won't settle for anything less than a love match, Sophie. I want all of him, or nothing at all. And nor should you settle, said her friend. I'm sure Max is heading in the right direction. Last night, he couldn't stop sneaking glances at you when Nate wasn't looking. And don't think I didn't notice how he held your hand below the card table when you were playing piquet with Gabriel and Arabella. A jolt of panic shot through Charlie. Do you think Nate noticed as well? I'm sure he didn't, said Sophie. 
He was playing billiards with Hamish in the next room at that point. No, she grinned. It was only Olivia and I who observed what was really going on. Charlie's smile returned. Max has been very attentive of late. And I'm thrilled he's willing to take chances. He kissed me in the shadows of his private box at the Theatre Royal the other night. And when he took me out in his high perch phaeton in Hyde Park two days ago, he found a secluded grove that we made good use of for several minutes. I must say, while this skulking about adds an element of excitement to our romantic trysts, I would give anything to be able to spend a whole uninterrupted night with Max. Sophie patted her arm. It will happen. In time. Charlie sighed and offered a corner of her Welsh rarebit to Perido, who'd woken up and was batting at her mistress's knee with her paw. If only Max would throw another house party at Hampstead Heath. The greatest challenge for me right now is watching my tongue during the heat of the moment, so to speak. When Max and I are alone, I'm terrified I'm going to blurt out how I really feel about him and scare him away. She slipped Perido another morsel. I swear, he's as skittish as a horse. He is. But it seems to be the case with our men, doesn't it? When they're in the process of falling in love, they're liable to bolt at the slightest provocation. I hope you take heart, though. Even though your engagement is supposed to be one of convenience only, you and Max have been firm friends for years, and now you're well on the way to becoming fully-fledged lovers. You still have time on your side. I'm sure that Max will come to his senses and realise he's actually head over heels in love with you before the end of the season. Oh, I hope so, Sophie. And I suppose, as they say, slow and steady wins the race. Max and I have come so far. I won't give up on him just yet. Sophie smiled. Good. Speaking of races, when will Max return to London? The day after tomorrow. Max had quit London at first light to attend a race meeting in Suffolk the following day, the one thousand guineas over the ditch mile in Newmarket. He promised his mother that he'd be back in time for the opening of the Royal Academy Art Exhibition at Somerset House, so I trust he'll keep his word. Cressida is a trustee and expects both of us to attend. Charlie grimaced into her tea. Lord knows why she wants me to go. Perhaps it's her way of making amends for leaking stories about you to the Beaumont Mirror, suggested Sophie. You mentioned Max had confronted her about that, and she'd all but admitted that was the case. Perhaps. Charlie wasn't convinced. She had an uneasy feeling that Cressida would still retaliate in some way, shape or form. Donning a smile to hide her misgivings, she added, In any case, I'm happy that Max was able to organise tickets for you, Nate, my father, and indeed all of our friends to attend as well. It could prove to be quite an enjoyable event. Sophie put down her cup of tea. I, for one, am looking forward to it. I might not be able to paint to save myself, but I do appreciate a good work of art. That reminds me. Charlie glanced up at the mantel clock. We must be on our way, otherwise we'll be late for my appointment with Madame de Beauvoir. Oh, yes! Sophie dabbed at the corners of her mouth with her linen napkin, then rose to her feet. I can't wait to see your finished portrait. I'm sure you look divine. When the French artist unveiled Charlie's painting in her Half Moon Street studio a short time later, Charlie was genuinely pleased with the result. You've made me look quite lovely, Madame de Beauvoir. As we agreed, it's tastefully licentious, yet there's still an element of mystery about it. The subject could be me, or it might be someone else entirely. 
It's perfect. A bright smile broke across Madame de Beauvoir's face. Oh, my lady, I am so happy to hear you approve. An unveiling is always so nerve-wracking. Lovely, exclaimed Sophie. It's more than lovely, Charlie. Your portrait is breathtaking. You could be Aphrodite. Exactement. The goddess of beauty, love and passion. That is you, Lady Charlotte, with all of your exquisite curves and chestnut locks. All of the gentlemen of the town should be falling at your feet, mais non? Charlie laughed. Well, if I go out and about in a barely there gown just like that, there's no doubt I'd be noticed. Sophie nudged her and murmured, Perhaps you should model a gown like that for Max. Hmm, now that's an idea, said Charlie. Madame de Beauvoir clapped her paint-speckled hands together. Maintenant, my lady, once the paint has finished drying, it will be ready in a few days, and after you've chosen a frame, I will have your completed portrait delivered to Hastings' house, oui? Will that suit? Yes, that would be wonderful, said Charlie. She had the perfect place to hang it in her bedchamber. No one but her closest confidants would know that the goddess lifting the hem of her gown to dip her toes into the water was Lady Charlotte Hastings. And, as soon as her Aunt Tabitha returned to town, Charlie would give her the biggest hug for making her feel beautiful again. Although, truth to tell, it wasn't only the portrait that had helped to restore her flagging self-confidence. Mostly, it was Max and the way he looked at her with desire in his eyes. Hopefully, before too long, his gaze would also be filled with love. After Charlie had chosen a delicately carved wooden frame covered in gold leaf, Madame de Beauvoir asked her and Sophie if they would be attending the Royal Academy's art exhibition. Why, yes, we are, said Charlie. And are you, Madame de Beauvoir? A delicate pink blush stained the Frenchwoman's cheeks. Mais oui, I am, my lady. In fact, I submitted two paintings, a portrait of a young lady and a still life, and the Academy's Council accepted both. It is the first time my work has ever been featured in such a prestigious exhibition, and I consider it a great honour. Oh, that's simply marvellous, declared Charlie. I shall look out for them as soon as I arrive, then shamelessly boast to everyone within hearing distance that I know the extremely talented artist. And at the end of the event, we shall toast you with fine champagne. Madame de Beauvoir's blush deepened. You are too kind, my lady. When Charlie and Sophie emerged onto Half Moon Street a short time later and began wending their way back to Berkeley Square, it began to rain. Edwards, who was trailing them, furnished them with umbrellas. Perhaps we should have taken my carriage, said Sophie, as she sidestepped a puddle. The shower was growing heavier by the moment. They'd just turned into Curzon Street. If we pick up our pace, we'll be back at Hastings House within a few minutes, said Charlie. They paused on the pavement to wait for a hackney coach to splash by, and that's when Charlie felt a strange prickle at the back of her neck that had nothing to do with the cold rain. A few feet away, also pausing at the curb, was a man dressed all in black. His face was shielded by his beaver hat and his umbrella, but there was something about his manner that struck her as odd. Was he watching them? Or even worse, following them. Another shiver slid down her spine. She was grateful she'd brought Edwards along. He might be young, but his height and the breadth of his shoulders were impressive. If the stranger did have a nefarious agenda, he'd keep his distance if he had any sense. But then again, perhaps she was just being fanciful. Any man dressed all in black tended to remind her of Lord Rochefort. This man was definitely the wrong build, 
he was too short and narrow-shouldered to be the baron. And from what she'd glimpsed of his profile, he had a weak chin, so not like Rochefort at all, who was almost as square-jawed as Max. Yes, this fellow was probably just a stranger going about his business, and there was nothing sinister going on at all. Telling herself to stop being such a nervous ninny, Charlie crossed the street with Sophie, and in next to no time, they were back in Berkeley Square. As she gained the shelter of the portico of Hastings House, Charlie couldn't resist looking back over her shoulder. There were several gentlemen in dark clothes with black umbrellas in the square, but through the veil of falling rain, it was impossible to tell if any of them might be the stranger that had made her feel uneasy. Curse Lord Rochefort, and yes, Cressida too, for making her as jumpy as a hunted hare. How horrible that she was so distrustful these days. With a sigh, she entered Hastings' house. One thing was certain, she wouldn't be going anywhere on her own for the foreseeable future. And the sooner Max returned to town, the better. Whenever she was with him, she felt completely safe and at peace. In his arms, she'd found the home she never wished to leave. Would that Max felt the same way about her. White's, St. James's Street, London May 1st, 1819 The long case clock in the corner of White's chimed the hour, ten o'clock, and Max had to stifle a yawn. Good God, he was tired. He'd only just arrived back in town a few short hours ago, but when Hamish, who also lived in Grosvenor Square, had come knocking on his door, he'd decided to take the Scot up on his invitation to share a late evening supper with him and the rest of their friends at their favourite gentleman's haunt. So, how did your horse go at Newmarket, Max? Nate, lounging in a leather wingback chair in a quiet corner of the club, eyed him with interest over the rim of his coffee cup. I haven't seen any of the results in the newspapers yet. Max grimaced. She came in fourth. The Duke of Grafton's filly, Catgut, came in first. Better luck next time, offered Gabriel, as he plucked an oyster patty off the silver platter on the low oak table between them. Actually, whenever you next head off to the races, whether it's Epsom Downs or Ascot, I can never recall what's next on the racing calendar. We should all make an occasion of it. That sounds like a bra idea. Count me in, agreed Hamish, as he picked up his coffee. Excellent, said Max. It was only after he'd taken a sip of his brandy that he realised he was the only one who was imbibing alcohol. Good Lord, how times had changed. I'll let you know my plans once I've consulted my head trainer, he added. To be honest, I've been a bit distracted of late. Damn, why did he have to say that? Now Nate was pinning him with a gimlet-eyed stare. Guilt pinched inside Max's chest, and he took another sip of brandy. While he hated the fact that he'd broken his promise to Nate and hadn't stayed away from Charlie, he also didn't regret any of the things he and Charlie had done together over the last little while. A man would have to be a bloody monk or pushing up daisies to not act on his desire for a woman like her. Lady Charlotte Hastings was, in a word, stupendous. And if he wasn't so damaged inside, they'd probably be married already. To cover his verbal blunder, Nate's glower was growing darker by the second, he ventured, Before I came here, I had a meeting with Hunt, my inquiry agent. As you know, he's been looking into Juno Press, the publisher that prints the Beaumont Mirror, and its parent company, Fortuna Trading. And he discovered something that really shouldn't have come as any surprise to me. He caught the gazes of each of his friends. It appears that one of Rochefort's close business associates has shares in the company. What? 
Rotten Rochefort's friend owns the Beaumont Mirror, said Gabriel. Well, technically he's only a part owner. But yes, it would seem so. That explains a lot, then, said Nate. Part of me wishes you'd put down the dog on Hampstead Heath when you had the chance. If the case had been tried in the House of Lords, your peers would have let you off. No doubt, said Hamish. The light in his one good eye was as hard as flint. If I'd been in town when you'd challenged the cur to a duel, I would have gladly gone in your stead. Rochefort still hasn't paid enough for all of the pain he put Euphemia Harrington through. The way he extorted her jewels and townhouse from her and forced her into penury. He shook his head, his expression grim. No doubt he was imagining how he would end the Baron by cleaving him in two with a broadsword, or better yet, gutting him with a blunt dirk. That reminds me, said Max. My man of affairs has been working behind the scenes, too. Using a third party, he's managed to purchase Euphemia's townhouse on my behalf. I have the deed, and intend on returning it to her. I'm not sure if she'll want to come back to London while Rochefort is still about, but at least her property is hers again, to do with as she pleases. That's very generous of you, said Hamish. She was my mistress, and her wee daughter Tilda was my ward for a while, so I'd be happy to share the cost. Max waved a hand. Think nothing of it, my friend. I'm happy to right an egregious wrong. We'll consider it a case of noblesse oblige. Mia Harrington is a housekeeper at one of my Devonshire properties, after all. Talk turned to parliamentary and business matters, and while Max enjoyed his friend's company, his gaze kept straying to the long-case clock across the room every now and again. While he was genuinely exhausted from the events of the last few days, the travelling to and from Suffolk and the race meeting itself, he couldn't deny he was chafing at the bit to see Charlie. But he couldn't very well turn up at Hastings' house at half-past ten in the evening, demanding to see his fiancée not without creating a stir. When Nate, Hamish and Gabriel all decided to call an end to the evening a short time later, Max was green with envy. They were all returning home to their beds, which were no doubt being kept warm by their respective wives, whereas he was going home alone. Before he and Charlie had entered into their faux engagement, it was likely that he would have ended up visiting another gentleman's establishment, like the Pandora Club, or the Rouge et Noir Club, or some other back-alley gaming hell. But now, such places held little appeal. After farewelling Gabriel, he lived close by in St. James's Square, Hamish hailed a hackney coach, and Max, still unaccountably disgruntled, climbed inside with Nate and the Scotsman. He wanted... Damn it! He wanted to be with Charlie. Although he'd only been absent from London a few days, he'd be lying to himself if he didn't admit that he'd missed her. Her smile, her conversation, her lovely face. Her kisses. But he had no right to call upon her at this hour. Lord Westhampton would no doubt send him away with a flea in his ear, and if Nate found out that he'd paid a late-night visit to Berkeley Square, he'd be a dead man so he'd best go home and get a good night's sleep. Perhaps tomorrow he'd take Charlie for a jaunt about Hyde Park. But snatched kisses behind hedges wouldn't be satisfying for either of them, and he couldn't very well throw another house party in the middle of the season. At least he'd be spending an inordinate amount of time in Charlie's company the following day, when he was due to escort her to the opening of the Royal Academy's annual art exhibition. But they wouldn't be alone. Half of the ton would be there. Bloody blazing hell. No wonder couples eloped to Gretna Green with such frequency. But unless he could tell Charlie that he loved her, she wouldn't marry him. 
whether it was over the anvil or in St. George's in Hanover Square, it wouldn't make a difference. Her answer to the question, Will you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? would be a resounding, No! And Max couldn't say that he blamed her. Chapter 23 have you secured your tickets to the opening of the Royal Academy of Arts annual exhibition at Somerset House? As Sir Francis Bacon proclaimed, painting raises the mind by accommodating the images of things to our desires. The Beaumont Mirror, the Fine Arts The Royal Academy of Art, Somerset House, The Strand May 3rd, 1819 Good gracious, it's quite a crush, isn't it? remarked Sophie to Charlie as they waited in the grand hall of Somerset House. Marble arches, colonnades, and several well-rendered sculptures dominated the space. From a niche in a nearby wall, a Calipedian Venus stared over her shoulder at them. Charlie couldn't disagree. Climbing the stairs will be an interesting exercise. The magnificent, dizzying spiral staircase led to the Great Room, the Royal Academy's main exhibition gallery, in the palace's north wing. I hope we don't all end up tumbling back down, like in Thomas Rowlandson's naughty print, The Staircase. I came here to see paintings, not tonish derrieres. Beside her, Max chuckled. Well, that would certainly be a sight. But don't worry, my lady. I'll catch you if you fall. And then he whispered, I'd much prefer it if I was the only one permitted to see your delightful derriere. Charlie bit her lip as warmth flooded her face. Thank goodness no one near them, especially Nate, heard that particular remark. As much as she wanted to respond in kind, she thought it best to remain on her best behaviour. For the first time in a long time, it seemed no one was looking askance at her, as though she didn't belong. On arrival at Somerset House with Nate and Sophie, several matrons of the ton had even greeted her with genuine smiles. In an effort to steer the conversation in a different direction, she said, I take it your mother is already here? I believe so said Max. Diana is with her. Knowing my mother, I imagine she arrived early and is upstairs in the great room, making sure everything is just so. If she hadn't contributed such a sizable donation to the Academy, I'm sure the porters and the Academy Council members would have ejected her by now. My father and Lady Tilbury could be somewhere here too, but who would know? remarked Charlie. She stood on tiptoe and craned her neck, but could discern nothing but a sea of anonymous heads. And Madame de Beauvoir. I cannot wait to get my hands on a catalogue, so I can find out where her paintings are being exhibited. Max cocked an eyebrow. Madame de Beauvoir? Oh, yes. Charlie hesitated as the crowd of tonish members moved forward and she lifted her blue silk muslin skirts to negotiate the stairs. Louise de Beauvoir is an accomplished French artist I met at the Mayfair Blue Stocking Society some time ago. My aunt Tabitha. She paused again. Should she tell Max about her own licentious portrait? The whole of London already knew the disreputable Lady C aspired to sit for one a la Lady Hamilton. He was bound to find out sooner rather than later that such a painting actually existed. Drawing a fortifying breath, she completed her thought. My aunt commissioned Madame de Beauvoir to paint a portrait of me. It's only just been completed and will be delivered to Hastings House within the next few days. Max leaned close and murmured, I can't wait to see it. I'm sure you look beautiful. Heat crept into Charlie's cheeks, a heat that had nothing to do with the exertion of climbing the stairs. I... I like to think so. 
But the nature of the painting is such that... She met Max's gaze. It's a little risque, so I'll be hanging it in my bedchamber. Mischief danced in Max's blue eyes. Even better. I take it this is the painting you mentioned in your list. Charlie couldn't help but laugh. How did you ever guess? Max cast her an enigmatic smile. I wonder. By the time they reached the top of the stairs, Charlie was hot and alarmingly breathless, whereas Max didn't seem flustered at all. Look up, he said, pointing to the doorway leading into the high-ceilinged great room. Is that ancient Greek? asked Charlie. She couldn't read the inscription carved into the marble archway, but she thought she recognised the script. Yes, it is, said Max. It reads, Let no stranger to the muses enter. Well, that's quite apt if I do say so myself. She gave Max a little nudge in the ribs. I see that classical education you received at Eton and Oxford is useful for something. Max laughed. Yes, indeed. It also comes in handy when one needs to count to ten in Latin or recite Pi or Newton's laws of motion. And you've had occasion to do any of those things of late? asked Charlie. Max flashed her a wicked grin. You'd be surprised, my lady. They joined the milling throng gathered inside the great room, and somehow Max located the rest of their friends in a far corner. Arabella was resting upon a chair that Gabriel had managed to procure for her, and Hamish and Olivia were examining a highland landscape featuring the distinctive castle of Dunrobin. Sophie already had a catalogue, which she was perusing with Nate. There was no sign of her own father, Cressida, Diana, or Madame de Beauvoir. It looks as though Madame de Beauvoir's paintings are in the adjoining gallery to our right, said Sophie when Charlie drew close. They're labelled A Study of Fruit and Flowers and Portrait of a Young Lady. I'm glad, said Charlie. It's almost impossible to view anything at eye level with so many people about. And the way the paintings are all wedged together, cheek by jowl, floor to ceiling. She tipped her head back and squinted up at a portrait of an officious-looking nobleman hanging high above their heads just below one of the gallery's distinctive arched windows. One would need a spyglass to see anything up there. I agree, said Max. I'd hoped to catch a glimpse of Cooper's The Battle of Marston Moor, but I suspect that won't happen. Nothing less than a cavalry charge could penetrate this crowd. Let's repair to the next room to see if we can find Madame de Beauvoir's work, suggested Charlie. She caught Arabella's eye, and she and Gabriel readily agreed to her proposal. Olivia and Hamish did too. With Hamish leading the way, the Scotsman was not only tall, but as broad-shouldered as a Highland warrior of old, they soon ploughed their way into the next gallery, which was far less busy. The artworks had been hung at regular intervals rather than crammed together, and apart from a sizeable party, Gathered in front of a painting at the far end, one didn't need to fight for elbow room. All in all, it was far more civilised. Charlie! At the sound of her name being called, Charlie turned and came face to face with Diana. The young Duchess's smile seemed forced, and her gaze darted nervously to Max, then back to Charlie. I'm so pleased that I've found you both at last. Perhaps you'd like to accompany me into the next exhibition room. There are some wonderful landscapes. One depicts a moonlit bay in Devon, Max, so I'm sure you'd be interested in that. Charlie frowned, confused by Diana's apparent need to hurry her and Max along. That sounds lovely. However, I'd really like to see the work of an acquaintance of mine. According to the exhibition catalogue, her paintings are on display in here. Olivia, who was only a few feet away with Arabella and Sophie, called over her shoulder. I, I think I've found her still life, Charlie. It's lovely. Oh, wonderful. 
Charlie joined her friends and agreed with Olivia's summation. Madame de Beauvoir had depicted an arrangement of pale apricot roses and just ripe peaches with great skill. There were dewdrops on the velvety, softly tinted petals, and the flesh of one cut peach looked so juicy, Charlie's mouth began to water. Max drew alongside her. I have a sudden craving for peaches and cream, he murmured. Charlie laughed. Me too. A sudden burst of tittering laughter on the other side of the room drew Charlie's attention. Several of the women who were clustered around the farthest painting were looking back at her with something akin to scorn in their gazes. Oh, damn, damn and damn again. Charlie recognised more than a few of them. It was Lady Penelope, surrounded by a bevy of her equally unpleasant friends. No wonder Diana had been trying to steer Charlie away. Max, who'd tucked her hand into the crook of his arm, must have sensed the tension vibrating through her body. What is it? he began, then uttered a crude curse under his breath. My apologies, he murmured to Charlie. I shouldn't have said that. Charlie couldn't suppress a smile. I'm glad you did, because it summed up my thoughts exactly. Sophie tapped a finger on a line in her exhibition catalogue. According to this, Madame de Beauvoir's second piece, The Portrait, is just over. Looking up, her gaze settled on Lady Penelope and her snidely giggling cohorts. Oh. Arabella looked over the top of her spectacles, then lifted her chin. Come, girls. We are the Society for Enlightened Young Women. We will not be intimidated by the likes of Lady Penelope. We have just as much right to view that painting as anyone else. Squaring her shoulders, she tucked her hand into her husband's arm and sauntered down the room. Shall we? Olivia took Hamish's hand. The Highlander grinned. Aye, we shall, my bonny wife. Come, Nate, said Sophie, linking arms with her husband. Let's not miss out on all the fun. Max and Charlie followed their friends, with a subdued Diana trailing behind. The Society for Enlightened Young Women, murmured Max, as they progressed down the gallery, weaving their way through knots of other art-loving attendees. Why have I not heard of this group before? Charlie gave him an arch smile. A girl must have some secrets, Your Grace. It adds to our allure. Max bent toward her ear. Allure is a quality you are not lacking in whatsoever, Lady Shaw. He stopped mid-word as he caught sight of the gilt-framed portrait hanging before them. And then Charlie's heart all but stopped, and her stomach tumbled to the floor as her gaze fell on it too. Someone nearby gasped. A man, perhaps it was Nate, swore. Oh, my God! No! A hundred thousand times no! Why on earth was her painting, her privately commissioned portrait, meant for her eyes only, on show at the Royal Academy of Arts annual exhibition? Her scantily clad, curvaceous body, on display for complete strangers to gawk at and judge and laugh at? Because there was laughter all around her. Snickers and outright chortles among the sea of scandalised whispers. While the face of the nubile Grecian goddess was partially concealed by a curtain of chestnut curls, there was no mistaking the true identity of the woman in the portrait. Because the plaque beneath the painting wasn't inscribed with the words, Portrait of a Young Lady. No, it read, Portrait of a Disreputable Debutante and everyone knew who that was. It could only be Lady Charlotte Hastings. Fast. Loose. Hoyden. Slut. Whore. The horrible words echoed in Charlie's ears 
and she wasn't sure if it was her imagination that had conjured them up or not. How could this have happened? How could Madame de Beauvoir have betrayed her like this? And it seemed Diana had known, too. The surge of pain, the shame, it was too much. Hot tears pricked at Charlie's eyes, and her throat constricted with the effort to contain a sob. Suffocating humiliation squeezed her chest, and time seemed to freeze. Stuck in a nightmarish moment, all sound bar her own ragged breathing, and the erratic, stumbling beat of her heart faded away. All she could see was her complete and utter ruin. Her reputation smashed beyond repair. If she could have curled up into a small ball on the floor, she would have. Charlie. Max was in front of her, blocking her view of her own portrait. It's all right. Hamish has taken it down. And Gabriel has thrown his coat over it. That was Arabella. No one can see it any more. Good, Charlie said, through stiff, numb lips. She didn't feel like herself at all. A strange buzzing began in her ears, and the room started spinning. Spots danced in the corners of her vision. And then Max, just as he'd promised earlier, caught her as she began to fall. Chapter 24 My List of Secret Wishes and Dreams 1. Sneak into a gentleman's club to see what all the fuss is about. Done. 2. To be kissed, with passion, in the moonlight by a rake. Done. 3. Or in the rain, either will do. Done. 4. Ride hell for leather down Rotten Row at least once, preferably not in the rain, unless there's any chance said passionate kiss happens straight afterward. Done. 5. Sea bathe, naked. 6. Sit for a licentious portrait a la Lady Hamilton. Done. 7. To be thoroughly ravished in a carriage. Done. 8. Waltz the night away at Almax. No longer required. 9. To experience a grand passion that I will remember long into my dotage. Achieved. 10. The man, or should I say duke, of my dreams falls in love with me. Somewhere in London. It wasn't until they were safely in Max's carriage that Charlie began to stir. Cradled in Max's arms, she made a small sound like a whimper and buried her face deeper into his shoulder. Beneath his coat, one of her hands curled around his waist. Charlie. Max gently brushed a loose curl away from her cheek and tucked it behind her ear. Can you hear me, sweetheart? Mm. Her eyelids fluttered, and when she opened her eyes, he saw the moment she recalled what had happened inside the Royal Academy. As horror dawned in her gaze, a shiver passed through her, and she snapped her eyes shut again. Oh, God, she moaned against his chest. I'm so embarrassed I could die. I'd rather you didn't. Reaching inside his coat, he located an inner pocket and withdrew a pewter flask. A sip or two of this might make you feel a little better, though. It's my very best cognac. Oh, yes, please. Charlie accepted the offered flask, uncapped it, and took a delicate sip. And then another. Handing it back to him, she caught his eye. Thank you. For everything. I feel so foolish. I'm not normally one to faint. I know you're not, and think nothing of it. You had a large shock, and that room was insufferably hot and stuffy on top of everything else. 
A ghost of a smile tugged at the corner of her lovely mouth. You always know what to say to make me feel better, she said softly. Her fingertips absently traced a world pattern in his paisley satin waistcoat. Her forehead had pleated into a frown. Though, I would understand if you need to reconsider our mutually beneficial fixed-term arrangement in light of what's happened. I'm afraid my reputation is ruined beyond repair at this point. I'm well and truly a social pariah. Good God, Charlie. Of course I don't want to end our arrangement. He tilted her chin up to meet his gaze. I'm not going anywhere. She nodded, and her eyes brimmed with tears. Thank you. That means a lot. Max gently wiped away an escaped tear with his thumb. Hey there. No crying is allowed in my carriage. Not unless you're crying my name. She laughed at that and accepted a kerchief from him. I like the sound of that. So do I. He nodded toward Charlie's portrait, which was currently leaning against the opposite seat with Gabriel's coat still draped over it. I also like your portrait. Very much. He cupped her jaw and stroked his thumb over her cheek again. You're beautiful, Charlie. Don't let what happened back there ever make you doubt yourself or how I... He'd been about to say how I feel about you, but he couldn't say that because he didn't know how he felt. Or did he? His chest cramped with an odd combination of regret and acute longing and a surge of protectiveness so fierce it chased away the bone-deep fear that he might feel anything remotely tender for the remarkable woman in his arms. When he didn't continue, Charlie ventured, I just don't understand how my portrait ended up at the exhibition. I trusted Madame de Beauvoir implicitly. I can't fathom why she'd betray me like that. It doesn't make sense. Max scowled out the window. The light was fading in London streets, and the gas lamps were in the process of being lit. I suspect my mother is behind it. For some time now, it's been clear that she's determined to drive a wedge between us. Aside from that, she's one of the Academy's trustees, so she had the means and opportunity to engineer the situation. Her absence at the exhibition is rather telling, too. Charlie shook her head. I don't know why she hates me so much. I know I'm not perfect. Max growled. Don't you dare say anything disparaging about yourself, Charlotte Hastings. I won't have it. Do you understand me? She nodded, and he softened his tone. I'm sorry. I just don't like seeing you so upset. And all because of my witch of a mother. Charlie sighed. I really have no idea how she knew about the painting's existence to begin with. While I'd mentioned my desire to sit for one on my not-so-secret list, that didn't mean I had actually gone through with it. Even though he didn't want to think his mother would stoop so low, it was clear that she had. Perhaps she's been having you followed, Charlie. You would have visited the artist's studio on more than one occasion, no? And I suspect she either bribed or coerced Madame de Beauvoir into handing over your portrait. The fact that there was a gilt plaque inscribed with something other than portrait of a young lady indicates this abominable scheme to denigrate you was definitely, and quite cold-bloodedly, premeditated. Charlie's frown was back. Last time I visited Madame de Beauvoir, five days ago, I did notice a man in Half Moon Street who made me feel odd. He didn't do anything that was overtly sinister. There was just something about him. I thought I was being fanciful, but perhaps I wasn't. You should always trust your instincts. In any case, I intend to find out exactly what my mother has done. 
and there will be a full accounting for her actions. If she is indeed responsible, she will not get away with this. This time, she's gone too far. They lapsed into silence for a short time, with Charlie still snuggled against Max's chest. Indeed, Max had begun to suspect she'd fallen asleep, until she suddenly stiffened and sat bolt upright. Oh, God! My portrait will be talked about in the Beaumont mirror, won't it? No, it won't. How can you be so sure? Because right before I spirited you away in my carriage, your brother, Gabriel and Hamish, decided that they would visit the offices of Juno Press to have a word with Mr. Erasmus Silver. I'm certain the sight of three fuming noblemen and the threat of being sued within an inch of his life will be enough to ensure the editor doesn't print one word about your painting. I can't say I feel sorry for Mr. Silver, said Charlie. And words cannot express how relieved I am, even though I'm still hideously embarrassed. Thank heavens my father wasn't there. Charlie's gaze shifted to the carriage window and the snarls of traffic beyond. Where are we going, by the way? Exmoor House. Max held his breath as he waited for her reaction. Oh! Charlie's cheeks pinkened, and she bit her lip. If you'd rather not, I'm quite happy to take you back to Hastings House, or wherever you want to go, in fact. I presumed. Actually, if I'm being perfectly honest, my first instinct was to take you somewhere safe. My home seemed like the logical choice. Charlie lifted her gaze. A shy smile lit her eyes. Of course I want to spend time alone with you at Exmoor House, and I would feel safe there, only... A small line appeared between her brows. What will Nate say? And everybody else if they find out? At this point, I don't give a jot about anyone else's views, and that includes your brother's, said Max, perhaps a little too gruffly. With an effort, he gentled his tone. However, I will send word to your family that you will be staying with me this evening, and that my sister-in-law will be chaperoning. They can hardly take issue with that. No. Charlie arched a brow. But Diana won't be chaperoning, will she? No, she won't, but they won't know that. And I'm certain Diana will lie for us if anyone asks. I'm not sure what her role in this whole mess is, but I would be very surprised if she was my mother's co-conspirator. She doesn't strike me as the duplicitous type. Yes, I agree. In fact, I've always thought that she quite liked me. And this afternoon, she did try to steer us away from the end of the gallery where my portrait was on display. Perhaps in her mind, she was trying to spare me the pain of being publicly humiliated. No doubt we will find out in due course, said Max. But not tonight. He didn't want to talk about Nate Hastings or his mother or sister-in-law any more. Not when he had Charlie in his arms and all to himself. Leaning in, he whispered against the delicate shell of her ear, Tonight I have other plans. Plans that involve discovering just how well all of your delectable curves have been captured on canvas. He brushed his lips over hers in a teasing kiss. I think a thorough study of both the painting and the subject are in order, don't you? Charlie's answering kiss, full of heat and fervour, was all the confirmation he needed that she was in complete agreement. Exmoor House, Grosvenor Square She must be dreaming. Any moment she'd wake up. Charlie surreptitiously pinched the inside of her wrist as she sank onto the settee before the fire in Max's sumptuous bedchamber. She couldn't believe they were actually alone. And it had been Max's idea 
to invite her here. For once, she hadn't had to barge her way in. The candles and firelight illuminated the room with a soft, golden glow, and the gilt frame of her portrait gleamed as Max placed it carefully on the marble mantelpiece between two Ming vases. Gorgeous, he murmured, before turning back to face her. His smile was warm as he added, Can I get you anything? A tray from the kitchen if you're hungry, or a brandy perhaps. Charlie donned a smile and smoothed her silk muslin skirts over her lap with damp palms. A brandy would be lovely. She was too excited to eat. Or was it nervousness that was making her feel so odd? She watched Max as he removed his coat, then proceeded to pour two sizable nips into crystal tumblers. Could he tell that she was suddenly a little jumpy? Indeed, she felt as flighty as a bride on her wedding night. Her cheeks were hot, and her stomach was a whirl with butterflies. Even her pulse was racing. Thanks to Max and his boundless understanding, she'd managed to temporarily shrug off the cloak of shame this afternoon's horrid events had forced upon her. No, the fact that she'd been publicly torn to shreds again wasn't responsible for her current state of uneasiness. She had a confession to make, one that she probably should have made weeks ago. One that she could have made in the carriage on the way here, when she'd told Max she would understand if he wanted to end things. But at that particular moment, she hadn't the nerve to go through with it. Yes, she definitely needed a strong drink to gird her loins and loosen her tongue. When she had her brandy in hand, and Max had stretched out on the seat beside her, she took a large sip, welcoming the sting of the fiery liquor as it burned a trail down her throat. Max reached out and wrapped one of her curls that had come loose around his finger. Are you all right, Charlie? Whatever happens this evening is completely up to you. We can simply talk. I can even take you home. I have no agenda other than to make you happy. Oh, goodness! Why did he have to be so sweet? In some ways, his supportive words made it even harder for her to say what needed to be said. She swallowed a little more brandy, then put down her glass on a nearby side table. Max! She took one of his strong hands in hers and absently traced a fingertip over the outline of his long, elegant bones. I have to tell you something. Something else that's quite shameful. I probably should have mentioned this to you a while ago, but in all honesty, I was never sure that we'd reach the point we are at tonight. Concern flickered in his deep blue eyes. I don't think there's anything you could say that would make me think less of you, if that's what you're concerned about. She blew out a sigh. You haven't heard it yet. Even though I've admitted to you that I know more than a young lady of my station should know about sexual congress, I've never fully explained why that might be the case. You're not a fool by any means, and you may have had suspicions all along. Go on, he said gently. There was no judgment in his gaze. No censure. He was simply waiting for her to continue. She inhaled a steadying breath. Ignoring the rapid pounding of her heart, she met his gaze. I'm... I'm not a virgin. Max smiled, and she knew everything would be all right. Neither am I, he said. Has that ever made you think less of me? No, of course not. But you know it's different for young women. We're supposed to remain chaste until we are wed. We agreed that it would be my decision whether to end our engagement or to wed at the end of the season. But in light of my confession, now that you know the truth, 
I would understand completely if you did want to end things sooner rather than later because of my lack of honesty. Not only is my reputation in tatters, my virtue isn't intact. I am thoroughly disreputable to my very bones. So perhaps your mother is right after all. For many reasons, I'm not the sort of wife a person like you, a duke, needs in his life. Charlie, I think it would be entirely hypocritical of me to judge you. What you've just told me doesn't alter my regard for you. My esteem for you isn't diminished. Are you certain? Absolutely. And even though I might not be your first lover, his mouth kicked into a rakish smile, I hope I'll be your most memorable. Lover. The word was like a double-edged sword. It thrilled Charlie and made her heart ache at the same time. Of course, she wanted to be more than Max's lover. She wanted his love, too. But she wouldn't spoil tonight with useless longing. She'd already experienced too much anguish today. Tonight, this opportunity to be with Max, to share his bed, it would be enough. What are you thinking? he asked, his voice low and soft. A beguiling, irresistible nudge. She gave a little laugh. To be perfectly honest, I'm thinking how truly awkward my first time was. And it was memorable for all of the wrong reasons. Max's brows plunged into a frown. The cad didn't force you, did he? Oh no, nothing like that. It was a mutual attraction, and he had a particularly nice smile. I was seventeen, and he... He was the nineteen-year-old son of a local squire, whose property adjoins Elmstone Hall. Anyway, my father holds a harvest feast every year, to thank Elmstone's farmhands and villagers for all their hard work, and this fellow and I, we both had too much cider. One thing led to another, as things do, and we ended up in one of Elmstone's stables in the loft. There was a lot of straw, and dust got up my nose. And then, while he was undoing my bodice, I sneezed and bumped his head. Even though he got a nosebleed, we were undeterred. But no sooner had he... She reached for her brandy and took a sip. It was probably best to skip over the mechanics. Max would know what she meant. I was worried he might lose control, she said. So I made him withdraw before he was done. The last thing I wanted to do was get with child. But I think it was his first time, too, and he spent all over my legs and skirts. All in all, she grimaced. It was sticky and messy and uncomfortable, and altogether unsatisfying. In hindsight, I was foolish and reckless, and shouldn't have done it. But... She bit her lip. But I did it because I was trying not to think about you any more, Max, the unattainable, golden-haired Adonis of my dreams. She released a sigh and raised her gaze to Max's face. You're actually the first person I've ever told about this. Sophie, Arabella and Olivia don't even know. Nor my Aunt Tabitha. I shall keep your secret, said Max, his expression solemn. I'm honoured you felt comfortable enough to share it with me. And I can assure you, he reached for her glass and placed it on the table again, that you won't be left unsatisfied tonight. Or have to worry about me losing control. This will all be about your pleasure, Charlie. I'll make this night unforgettable for all of the right reasons. He framed her face in his hands and captured her mouth with his, kissing her with slow, deliberate purpose, as though his only agenda was to give her pleasure, just as he'd promised. Tipping her head back with one hand, he plundered her mouth with his tongue, licking and tasting. 
stroking deep. The fingers of his other hand caressed a teasing path down her neck before roaming across her shoulder, then lower to torment one of her breasts. Her nipple was already a taut peak, straining toward his touch through all the layers of her clothes, and he made her harder, circling her with his thumb. Charlie tangled her fingers in his hair, kissing him back with equal ardour. When he slid his mouth to her neck and pushed her gown away from her shoulder so he could devour her with feverish, open-mouthed kisses, she couldn't contain a moan. Dear God, he was wonderful. She had no doubts that he would make this experience good for her. But when his mouth skated back to her ear and he whispered, I think it's time to see what treasures you're hiding beneath that gown, don't you? Charlie stiffened. Her hands slid to Max's chest, as though part of her meant to push him away. Oh, she was such a contrary ninny. Max was utterly perfect, and she couldn't wait to share all of herself with him. But what would he think of her nude body when she unveiled herself? She knew he would say complimentary things about her curvaceous figure, but would he really mean them? Perhaps that was why she suddenly felt so skittish again. Her lack of self-confidence about her appearance was, and always had been, at the back of her mind. It was the sole reason for her apprehension right now. When she found her voice, it was obvious that she was more than a little nervous. I... about that... Max pulled back and frowned down at her. I'm going too fast for you, aren't I? She winced. A little. Which is completely foolish of me, considering everything we've already done together. And of course, this isn't my first time, so I have some idea of what to expect. Although it was five years ago and hardly ideal. Oh, Lord. I'm so sorry. I'm babbling and ruining the moment. You have nothing to be sorry about, Charlie. Actually, I should apologize to you if you in any way feel like I'm putting pressure on you. I don't want to scare you with the strength of my desire. We can go as slowly as you want. Or we can stop altogether. It's up to you, sweetheart. We won't do anything that you don't feel comfortable with. Oh, I want to be with you. That's not the problem. Charlie worried at her lower lip and glanced up at the painting on the mantel shelf. It was time for her to be candid about this issue, too. To be perfectly frank, now that the moment has finally arrived, and we can make love without being interrupted, I seem to be suffering from an unaccountable attack of stage fright. I'm... She met Max's concerned gaze again. I'm nervous about disrobing in front of you. You see, the reason I sat for that portrait to begin with is that I gained a few pounds over Christmas tide and was feeling less than attractive. My Aunt Tabitha, God bless her, suggested that I have my portrait painted. She wanted me to see myself in a new light. Charlie nodded at the painting again. And I can see that my likeness is appealing to the eye. Only, she sighed, I'm not at all slender like all of my gorgeous friends. Or dare I say it, like Lady Penelope. I'm decidedly Rubenesque. And although you've seen bits of me, so to speak, it's always been at night in a darkened carriage. Not in a room like this, that's alight with firelight and candles. I'm... I'm worried you'll find the real flesh-and-blood Charlotte Hastings wanting. Max caressed her cheek, his fingers gentle. Charlie, I've always found you desirable. And there's no doubt in my mind that I'll find you just as beautiful without clothes. But I want you to set the pace. Make all the rules. 
we can snuff out all the candles. We can remove every single stitch of our clothing or stay dressed. All I ask is that you tell me what you want or don't want. Will you promise to do that for me? She nodded, and a wave of heat and delicious anticipation shimmered over her, washing away the last remnants of her hesitation. Yes, I will, Max, she murmured huskily. This time, her voice was breathless with desire and excitement, nothing more. Even though lust hurtled through his veins, making him as randy as a buck at the height of rutting season, Max silently vowed not to rush this experience. For Charlie, he would go slowly and take care. And as much as he wanted to worship her naked body, with his eyes as well as his hands and mouth, Max meant every word he'd just said. It was up to Charlie to decide what they would do next. Although he did have one suggestion. He smoothed an errant curl away from her flushed cheek. There is one thing I've always wanted to do, though, if you'll let me. Her kiss-swollen lips, as ripe and red as summer plums, curved into a smile. And what's that? I've always dreamed of letting down your glorious hair, watching it fall about your shoulders. Would that be all right with you? Of course. She turned on the settee, presenting her back to him. Go ahead. Although, my maid uses far too many pins, so it might take you half the night. I don't mind at all. Max's fingers were already in her thick chestnut tresses carefully feeling for hairpins in the intricately coiled mass at the back of her head. Slowly but surely, he loosened her curls until they tumbled down her back, reminding him of a fiery autumnal waterfall. Leaning forward, he pressed his face against her shoulder, inhaling the sweet floral scent of her. Beautiful, he murmured. Pushing the silken mass of her hair aside, he lavished the delicate column of her throat with kisses. Charlie shivered and leaned back against him. His hand skated up her rib cage, but paused just below her breasts. Tell me what you want next, he said, in a low, soft voice against her ear. I'm yours to command, my lady. I want... I need to be closer to you, Max, she whispered. To his astonishment, she shifted and turned. Lifting up her skirts, she straddled him, just like she'd done at the Rouge et Noir Club all those weeks ago. Dear God! Charlie's delightfully deep cleavage was right in front of his face, and her skirts and petticoats were rucked up around her knees, revealing her silk stockings and their delicate blue-ribbon garters. Max already had a fearsome cockstand, but the sight of Charlie positioned upon his lap, with her legs spread wide, almost had him spending right then and there in his trousers. He gripped her waist to stop himself from doing anything that she didn't want, like burying his face between her breasts, or sliding his fingers up her inner thigh, to find the soft curls hiding her sex. With an effort, he strove to keep his voice light as he said, What next? She sank her teeth into her lip and looked up at him through the dark fan of her lashes. Even though I have qualms about removing my own clothes, would you consider taking off your waistcoat and shirt, Max? You haven't minded going shirtless in front of me before. As far as I can tell, he grinned. Gladly. While he loosened his cravat and his collar, Charlie applied herself to the task of undoing his waistcoat buttons. When she pulled his shirt from the waistband of his trousers, her fingertips grazed his hips and his flesh jumped at the contact. Are you ticklish down there, Max? she asked with a coquettish smile. 
perhaps. He tossed his cravat on the floor and undid his cuffs. You'll have to excuse me while I sit forward to remove the rest. I don't mind at all, she said, so he arched his back, shrugged out of his waistcoat, then tugged his shirt over his head. Both garments landed on the floor unheeded. Leaning back, Max took pleasure in watching Charlie's gaze roam over his nakedness. The way her eyes had darkened, and the fact she was biting her lip again, was making him harder than an iron rod. Well, my lady, what do you think? he asked, with a deliberately wicked smile. He was a keen Corinthian, and he knew that he was lean and particularly well muscled. In the past, other women had always been complimentary about his appearance. But their opinions no longer mattered. Only Charlie's did, and he burned to know if she really did find him attractive, too. I. A blush flooded her cheeks. I think you are the perfect male specimen, she murmured huskily. He caught her chin lightly and captured her gaze. Thank you. His voice was gentle yet solemn. My male pride is definitely appeased, but I assure you that I'm not perfect. You've seen my damaged foot. And I have scars on various parts of my person. My left arm and my lower back. And then there are the scars on my frostbitten heart. Charlie splayed her fingers over his bare chest. They don't matter to me, Max. You're beautiful. And that's how I feel about you, he said softly. I adore your wild hair and your abundant curves. His hands, curled about her waist, slid to her hips. How lush and ripe you feel beneath my palms. You're beautiful to me because you're Charlie. You're not like anyone else. And it's you that I want, only you. Plunging his fingers into the silky hair at her nape, he straightened a little, until they were chest to chest, mouth to mouth. This yearning, this burning and overwhelming need to have you, I've tried to deny it, but I can't. Not any longer. No one else will do. He wasn't sure who moved first, but in the next instant, he and Charlie were kissing hungrily, like both of them were starving and couldn't get enough of each other, frantically tasting and licking and devouring. And Charlie's hands, they were everywhere, in his hair, kneading his shoulders, sliding over his biceps and the hard wall of his chest, across his torso, tracing his ribs, making his heated flesh twitch and leap. And her mouth, good God, her hot, sweet mouth. She nipped at his ear and grazed her lips across the line of his jaw where his night beard was beginning to form. Dropped a trail of feverish kisses down the tight cords of his neck to his pectoral muscles. She made him hot and breathless and desperate, and as he gripped her luscious ass and bucked his hips, his cock uselessly strained toward the very centre of her. He inwardly cursed himself for already breaking his vow to exercise restraint and take things slowly. But then he'd also given Charlie free rein to make the rules and set the pace. And really, what could he do when she was using the tip of her tongue to torment one of his nipples? just like he would do to her if her breasts were unbound and free. When she began to lick and suckle his other nipple, pulling a throttled moan from deep within his throat, he wasn't sure how much more he could bear. He buried one of his hands in her tumbling tresses, and at last she took pity on him. She raised her head and murmured urgently, Undo my gown, Max! With pleasure, he groaned. He reached behind her, 
then cursed beneath his breath when he discovered his fingers were trembling. Good God, his fierce desire for this woman was making him as clumsy as an inexperienced youth. Somehow, he managed to release the row of damnably small pearl buttons. Then he loosened the laces of her corset and the ribbon tie securing the neckline of her chemise. At long last, her delightfully plump breasts, with their taut apricot tips, spilled free. Free for him to gaze at and fondle, and taste with tongue and lips, until Charlie was moaning and clutching mindlessly at his head, and grinding her hips in blatant invitation against his. Max! She tugged at his hair, and he reluctantly lifted his head. He stared into her golden-brown eyes, their dilated pupils deep enough to drown in. Do you want me to stop? he asked, his voice hoarse and thick with lust. No, I want you to touch me. She reached for one of his hands and guided it between her thighs. Here, God in heaven. His fingers brushed her curls, and beneath them she was hot and, oh, so wet. I can do better than that, he whispered. I can taste you there, if you want me to. He held his breath. Please say yes. She smiled. Well, if you're offering. I am. Wrap your legs around me. Lashing one arm beneath Charlie's buttocks and one about her waist, he surged to his feet and headed across the room. There was no time like the present to move things to his bed. Chapter 25 I never knew before what such a love as you have made me feel was. I did not believe in it. My fancy was afraid of it lest it should burn me up. But if you will fully love me, though there may be some fire, t'will not be more than we can bear when moistened and bedewed with pleasures. An exclusive extract from a love sonnet by Mr. John Keats. The Beaumont Mirror, The Literary Arts As soon as Max settled her upon his wide four-poster bed, Charlie closed her eyes. Not because she was nervous or ashamed, but because she wanted to give herself over to the delicious sensations that Max was about to evoke with his hands and mouth. She'd heard all about this decadent act before. Indeed, she'd often imagined it while she'd touched herself in her own bed, and she couldn't wait to experience it with Max. His mouth ravished hers briefly, the kiss dark and hot and intense. Then he shifted his weight, moving down her body, lifting her skirts and petticoats, exposing her legs and her sex to his gaze. Even though she'd resolved not to watch, she couldn't resist cracking open an eyelid to sneak a look at Max's face. Would he like what was on display? She needn't have worried, because his expression was rapt as he studied her. He wedged his broad shoulders between her thighs, pushing her legs even wider. A blush burning her from head to toe, she tried to imagine what she looked like down there, so open and exposed to him, but couldn't. And then her thoughts all but disintegrated as he parted her throbbing, no doubt slippery folds with his wicked fingers, and blew across her swollen bud where her pleasure was centred. Oh, my! Peaches, he murmured, against her fevered, wet flesh. I can almost hear your mind working, my darling Charlotte, so I thought you might like to know your pretty pussy reminds me of summer peaches. So slick and sweet, and too delicious for words. And then he set his mouth on her, and Charlie's eyelids slammed shut again. Oh, dear, God. Max's mouth teased her clitoris, circling and flicking and laving and, 
Oh, it felt so good. So wonderful. So wicked. Charlie moaned when he slid two long fingers inside her, plunging in and out, in and out, while his lips circled her bud, drawing on it with exquisite, delicate suction. The tension that always heralded her release was building, spiralling. She began to gasp and pant, and she speared her fingers into Max's hair, gripping his scalp. With one large hand splayed over her belly, he held her captive, his tongue working her mercilessly, flicking and lapping the pulsing, straining peak of her sex, and oh, she was so close to finding heaven. And with one last suckle, she was there, tossed skyward into the stars. Her whole body arched, and she let loose an abandoned, pleasure-soaked cry. She clutched at Max's head, a sublime satisfaction coursed through her veins, rendering her boneless with contentment. Max moved alongside her and gathered her into his arms. He rubbed his nose against hers. Thank you for allowing me to pleasure you that way, Charlie. You're thanking me? Charlie caressed his stubbled jaw. I think it's supposed to be the other way round. In fact... She slid a hand between their bodies and stroked Max's hard, heavy length through the fall of his trousers. I can think of the perfect way to say thank you. Do you want me to use my mouth, or... Max kissed her, and Charlie tasted her own essence on his tongue. I want to be inside you, he murmured against her lips. Most desperately. If you'll let me. He wanted her desperately. Charlie couldn't help but smile. To hear Max make such an admission was both thrilling and heart-melting in equal measure. I want that too, she whispered. And of course I'll let you. Only I don't want any barriers between us. I'm ready to take everything off, Max. I want you to see all of me. And it wasn't a lie. He'd pleasured her so intimately, and she'd reveled in it. There was nothing left to fear or to hide. She trusted Max completely. He drew back a little and searched her gaze. Are you sure? I haven't a single doubt in my mind. Max kissed her again, then set to work, sliding off her loosened gown, corset and chemise tugging petticoat tapes undone, and very soon nothing remained except for her silk stockings. Max sat back on his haunches, and as his heated gaze wandered over her naked body, she didn't try to cover any part of herself. Not her breasts, nor her softly rounded belly or full hips, nor the chestnut thatch between her thighs. At long last, she felt entirely beautiful. Not just desired, but adored. Max might not have made any declarations of love, but the way he was worshipping her with his eyes, she could sense there was more than lust behind his heavy-lidded gaze. And when he whispered, Charlie, you're a goddess, in a voice that was brimming with awe, she believed him. Charlie was gloriously naked. Her thick chestnut curls spread around her like a fiery halo upon his cobalt-blue silk counterpane. Her almost translucent skin was as pale and voluptuous as cream. And her nipples, so tight and mouth-wateringly pink. There were so many things Max wanted to do with her, and none of them involved him wearing trousers. With rough, impatient movements, he dispensed with his remaining clothes and slid over her, covering her body with his, reveling in the contact of his bare flesh against hers. She wound her arms around his neck. Make love to me, Max, she whispered, her eyes bright with desire and some other, deeper emotion that went beyond affection. Max stilled, 
his breath hitching as a profound realization slammed into him. Not that Charlie loved him. He'd suspected that for some time. No, it was the dawning awareness that his feelings for Charlie were far stronger than he'd been willing to acknowledge. No, not willing. That was the wrong word. Able to acknowledge. As tenderness like a soft glowing fire unfurled inside his chest, he closed his eyes and twisted his fingers into the counterpane, waiting for the bone-deep chill that he dreaded to take over and blast through him, turning him into a quaking, useless mess. But nothing happened. Yes, his erection still throbbed, and his pulse continued to race, but the ache in the vicinity of his heart was sweet and warm. So not really an ache, and not terrifying at all. It was a feeling he could no longer deny. Nor did he want to. Max? Charlie stroked his hair away from his fevered brow. Are you all right? He opened his eyes and smiled. I'm fine. Never better. He kissed her with lingering fervour laced with gentleness. This, what he and Charlie were doing right now, it wasn't just about satisfying his own lust and hers. This was making love, and that was something he'd never, ever done before. And it was all because of Charlie. She was the woman of his dreams. Nudging her thighs apart with his knees, Max settled his length along the hot, damp cleft of her sex. Oh, God, she felt good. So good. His cock was pulsing, ready to explode, but he would take care. She might not be a virgin, but it had been a long time since she'd done this. He dipped his head and lavished attention on her bountiful breasts, alternately suckling, then swirling his tongue around each sweet, tight peak. He wanted to make sure Charlie was absolutely ready for his entry. He wanted her wet and desperate with desire, just like he was. When Charlie mewled in frustration and tilted her hips, his erection slid between her dew-slick folds, and he almost lost control. He couldn't delay their joining any longer. Gritting his teeth, he gripped his pulsating shaft in one hand and skimmed the head of his cock through the welling moisture at her entrance before pressing forward, nudging slowly into her. Charlie's body tensed, and when she sucked in a sharp breath, Max's heart contracted with guilt. He froze. I'm sorry if I'm hurting you, he said, staring down into her face. A slight furrow had appeared between her brows, and her eyes were screwed shut. It's all right. I'm fine, she whispered. She opened her eyes and offered him a smile. It burned a little at first, but that's all. I won't break. Don't hold back on my account. He feathered a light kiss across her lips. If you're sure. She firmed her gaze and gripped his shoulders. I am. Take me, Max. I'm more than ready. I want this. I want you. Very well. Max drew a bracing breath, then surged forward in one long, slow glide, burying himself to the hilt. Oh, God. Charlie was so hot and tight and slick. He nuzzled the delicious curve of her neck, licking the hollow of her throat as her body clasped his. He couldn't get enough of her. Her taste. Her scent. Her everything. You're so sweet, my darling, he groaned against her satiny skin. So warm and wet. So lovely. He felt her body quiver with mirth. And you're so big. But not in a bad, I think I'm going to burst way. More of a, I'm so wonderfully full way. Her hands slid from his shoulders 
down the tense muscles of his back until they reached his clenched buttocks, and she squeezed. I can't wait to feel you move inside me. Her words were all the encouragement Max needed. He began to pulse in and out of Charlie with a smooth, gentle rocking motion. But all too soon, it wasn't enough for either of them. I want more. I need... Oh, yes, that's it, Charlie moaned as Max's thrusts became more urgent. With each sure stroke, he plunged harder and deeper, his rhythm growing faster, more frantic. And Charlie kept up with his pace. She met him thrust for thrust, tilting her hips, welcoming his body as he pounded in and out of her with increasing desperation, taking everything he had to give. Her gasps and soft moans were music to his ears, the scrape of her teeth against his shoulder, pure delight. He prayed she was almost there, because he couldn't hold off for much longer. He was panting and sweating, and his orgasm was gathering force. Passion raced like fire through his veins, tightening his balls. Oh, sweet Jesus! He took his weight on one arm and lifted one of Charlie's legs, altering the angle of his penetration. All at once, she bucked her hips and cried out his name. Her nails dug into his back, and she spasmed around him, gripping his plunging cock so tightly he saw stars. The feel of her losing all control was Max's own undoing. On a harsh cry, he withdrew and came in hot, hard spurts between Charlie's trembling thighs before collapsing on the bed beside her. Chest heaving, muscles twitching, he was utterly spent and so goddamned replete he'd probably be smiling for a year and a day. If Charlie would have him, maybe for the rest of his life. Some time later, when they'd both washed and donned robes, Charlie's crushed dress had been sent below stairs with a maid to be pressed. Max ordered a tray, and they sat together before his sitting-room fire, dining on an array of cheeses and fruit, all washed down with a fine claret. Once sated, Charlie snuggled up to Max on the settee and watched the play of the dancing firelight in the depths of the ruby-red wine in her glass. Surrounded by Max's arms and the velvet robe that smelled exactly like him, Charlie thought she must be in heaven. Indeed, she was so drowsy and content she could have purred like Peridot. When Max shifted and stretched his bare lower legs and toes toward the fire, Charlie couldn't help but notice his damaged foot. She wanted to ask him about his past, but was too timid to bring up the subject. Of course, she already knew the story behind the freshly healed scar on his left bicep. But how he'd come to lose a toe, and why his lower back bore a significant scar, she'd felt the ridge when they'd made love, and had seen the angry welt just below the dimples at the bottom of his spine when they'd bathed in his dressing room, was a complete mystery to her. Every time she thought about Max's suffering, her own heart contracted with pain. Whether he'd noticed the direction of her gaze, or his thoughts were simply in concert with hers, Charlie wasn't sure. In any event, it seemed Max was in the mood to share his past history with her. She was nothing but touched, as he said quietly, I suppose you're wondering about my injuries. What happened to my foot and my back? Yes. She turned in his arms to look at him. The expression in his dark blue eyes was unfathomable, but his body remained relaxed as he continued to absently sift his fingers through her loosened hair. I'd be lying if I didn't admit that I am curious. But you don't have to explain if you don't feel comfortable doing so. I do want to talk about it. The man I am today, the man I've been for years and years, was shaped during an incident that occurred when I was only twelve years old. 
My injuries, while they seem relatively minor on the surface, they're not. They go far, far deeper. The damage, it seems, went beyond the physical and never truly healed. My heart, and indeed my very soul, were scarred. His voice was tinged with profound sadness as he added, It's the reason why I've never been able to love. Max took a sip of his claret, as though fortifying himself to continue, and Charlie simply waited. Even though her heart was already breaking for him, she didn't want to interrupt his train of thought with her own questions. She certainly didn't want to say the wrong thing. At length he sighed, and his fingers continued to stroke Charlie's hair as if the simple action brought him some measure of solace. I've never really spoken to anyone about this before, so I hope you'll bear with me if I'm not particularly eloquent. Charlie touched his cheek. Of course. I'm here to listen, Max, and to provide a modicum of comfort if I can. His mouth twitched with the ghost of a smile. You do. You are. He sighed again, and a deep furrow that was almost a scowl etched itself between his brows. You know what my mother is like. How cold and manipulative she is. My father, he was even worse. He had what he called exacting standards, but in hindsight it was simply an excuse for him to behave like a cruel tyrant. He maintained that he was training my brother Anthony, and me as well, to be hard-headed aristocrats who'd be capable of making decisions without being hampered by any sort of emotion or sentimentality. Any display of affection was seen as a weakness. We were never hugged by either of our parents, and our nurses were forbidden to do so too. Indeed, our nurses and our pets father kept dogs at Exmoor Castle, were removed from our sphere on a regular basis to prevent us forming unseemly attachments. Of course, in my case, it didn't work. I still formed emotional connections with others, but I also learned quite quickly that if I hid my feelings, if my father couldn't tell if I liked a particular tutor or hound or horse, they weren't taken away. And even though our father frequently pitted us against each other, he felt competition was important to develop character, Anthony and I still formed a strong filial bond. Our father might have tried to turn us into unfeeling lumps of ice, but he couldn't, at least not for a while. Oh, heavens, Max! That's simply awful! My heart weeps for you. It truly does. I'm sorry if I'm upsetting you. You don't need to apologize. At all. I'm flattered that you feel you can confide in me. Max nodded. As I mentioned, I learned to mask my emotions. But everything came unstuck for me when I was twelve. It was late autumn, and we were spending a few days at Heathcote Hall. One of the horses stabled there. His name was Phantom and he was a handsome grey like ghost, was one of my favourites. I would ride him whenever I could, although not too much, in case father noticed I had a preference for the gelding above any of the other horses. In any event, even though the weather was quite foul, father made Anthony and me accompany him on an extended ride about Hampstead Heath one afternoon. It was blowing a gale, and there were intermittent rain squalls. Max's mouth hitched with a sardonic smile. No doubt he thought braving the elements would toughen us up. I recall we'd returned to Heathcote's grounds, and father decided that Anthony and I must race each other through the woods on the edge of the estate. There was a fallen log on the path that we both needed to clear. I'm not sure how it happened exactly. I was a skilled rider by that age because father wouldn't let me be anything less than perfect, but I do know that I was tired, and I suspect Phantom was fatigued too. I mistimed the jump, and Phantom went down. Max swallowed, 
and his expression grew haunted. I'll never forget the sound of his legs snapping and his terrible screams. Father was livid, of course. I'd ruined a perfectly good horse. And so, he thought to teach me a lesson. One I'd never, ever forget. Charlie was almost too afraid to ask. What happened? I'd been thrown clear, but apart from sustaining a few superficial scrapes and being winded, I was relatively all right in a physical sense. Father hauled me to my feet and thrust a loaded pistol into my hand. He'd brought one with him to shoot any foxes or hares he saw on the heath, just for the sport of it, and then he ordered me to shoot Phantom. It was the right thing to do, to put the horse out of his misery. And it was my fault. But I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. I loved that goddamned horse, and I hated myself for not having the guts to end Phantom's suffering. You were only twelve. I know, but in a way, Father was right. In any case, Anthony took pity on me, snatched the gun from my hands, and ended poor Phantom's life. The fact that my brother had been able to do what needed to be done, and not me, only incensed Father further. He dragged me over to the fallen log and threw me over his lap, yanked my riding breeches down, then proceeded to flay me with his riding crop. Oh, my God! That's how you got that terrible scar! Max nodded, and Charlie couldn't contain her tears. He was monstrous, Max! An evil, cruel bully! I won't disagree, and I wished the story ended there but it doesn't. You might recall that there is an ice house in Heathcote's grounds. It's on the edge of the woods near the lake, and not far from the bridle path where Phantom fell. As an extra punishment for failing to obey his order and do my duty, my father locked me inside that freezing, dark space. Just before he shut the door, he told me that I needed to stop behaving like a snivelling, puling infant, and to grow up. In order to be a man, I needed to be as unfeeling as the blocks of ice contained within the ice house. I can't believe he did that, Max. You could have died. Max reached for one of her hands and gave it a gentle squeeze. Perhaps. I was certainly cold enough. I'm not sure how long I stayed in that hellish hole. It was pitch black, and I lost all track of time but Anthony eventually crept back and let me out. One thing I do recall clearly, though, I vowed that I must encase my heart in icy armour. Loving hurt far too much, and my emotions had clouded my ability to make rational decisions. I also vowed to myself that I would never, ever find myself in a situation that I couldn't escape from. So that's why you learned to pick locks? Max nodded. Yes. Well, thank God for Anthony. He risked a lot to come back and save me. As it was, my fingers and toes were frostbitten, and that's how I lost my little toe. A physician needed to amputate it, and it took me some time to be able to run with ease again. Charlie kissed his hand. And to feel. Yes, that's very true. But little by little, my heart did begin to thaw. As you pointed out to me not so long ago, I was able to form friendships at Eton and then at Oxford. But in my mind, male camaraderie was different from forming any sort of romantic attachment. And being in love didn't seem necessary for marriage. My parents certainly didn't love each other. And then I met you, Charlie. For so long, I kept telling myself that I felt nothing for you other than a faint regard because you were my best friend's younger sister. And after we became engaged, I convinced myself that I felt nothing for you but desire. But none of that's entirely true. In actual fact, I'm a huge coward, and I've been too terrified to acknowledge how I do truly feel about you. 
Charlie's heart leapt, but even so, she couldn't quite believe her ears. She'd suspected for some time that Max desired her. He'd demonstrated that most aptly tonight. But as for anything else... You really do feel more for me than just a deep and abiding fondness, she whispered. Yes. Tonight everything changed. When we were making love, I realized that I didn't have to be afraid anymore. I didn't have to shy away from the tenderness growing in my heart. He reached out and gently cradled her face with his hands. That's because I... A rap on the door made Charlie jump and Max curse. Charlie, I'm sorry, he began, but the knock came again. Your Grace, even though the voice was muffled, it sounded like Chifley. Your Grace, my apologies for interrupting. Max sighed heavily and shook his head. I'd best deal with this. He strode to the door and jerked it open. Chifley, is Exmoor House burning down or being raided by marauding hordes? Because that's about the only reason I'll accept for your intrusion. Charlie could barely see the butler. Max, ever the gentleman, stood in the doorway, obstructing the servant's view. Nevertheless, she heard Chifley say, Again, I offer my sincerest apologies, Your Grace, but Lord Malvern is downstairs, asking to see you. He says the matter is quite urgent. I've shown him into the library. Nate was here. Charlie's heart plummeted. Had her brother discovered Diana wasn't playing chaperone after all? She sincerely prayed he wasn't here to make trouble. Max must have had the same thought, because he glanced back at Charlie, his expression grim, before turning his attention back to the butler. Tell Lord Malvern I'll be down directly. Of course, Your Grace. I also have Smedley here, with her ladyship's freshly pressed gown. Would you like him to install it in your dressing room, or elsewhere? My dressing room will suffice. The door shut, and Max scrubbed a hand through his hair. Even though your gown is ready, it's probably best if I deal with your brother. His gaze raked over her. It will avoid any awkward questions about chaperonage, or lack thereof. I understand, she said. I'll make myself scarce. There's no point in setting the cat amongst the pigeons. Good girl. Max crossed the room and dropped a kiss on her forehead. Hopefully, I won't be long, my love. You and I have unfinished business. As he retreated to his dressing room, Charlie sank onto the settee again, a smile playing about her lips. Max had called her my love for the very first time, and she was absolutely certain it wasn't a slip of the tongue. If Nate took up too much of Max's time, she'd march downstairs and dispense with her brother herself, gown or no. It was definitely time to put Nathaniel Hastings in his place. Chapter 26 In vain I have struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. An extract from Miss Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice the Beaumont Mirror, The Literary Arts. Max found Nate pouring out glasses of his best cognac when he entered the library a short time later. What's happened? he asked without preamble. I hadn't expected to see you this evening. Apparently it's something urgent. Nate handed him a crystal tumbler. Aside from wanting to make sure my sister is all right, I have some news about Erasmus Silver and the Beaumont Mirror that I thought you'd like to hear. Ignoring the twinge of guilt in his gut for continuing to lie about the true nature of his relationship with Charlie, Max claimed the chair behind his desk. Charlie's well. Well, 
as well as to be expected, given the events of this afternoon. But she was comforted to learn that there probably won't be any scurrilous newspaper articles about her and her portrait. No, there won't be, said Nate, grim satisfaction flashing in his smile. It took Hamish Gabriel and me a little while to track down Mr. Silver. He wasn't at the offices of Juno Press when we arrived, but one of the other staff members there, a junior editor, who quite conveniently has a personal grudge against Silver, was quite amenable to handing over information for the price of a few guineas. Not only did we learn, Silver already had a story about Charlie ready to go to press, but we obtained Silver's home address in Marleybone. He wasn't there either, but the manservant who answered the door was happy to inform us, again, for the price of a few guineas, that his master was paying a visit to a particularly notorious brothel in Soho Square. Max cocked a brow. Birchmore House. Nate inclined his head. The very same. It seems Mr. Silver is rather fond of being birched. When we came upon him in flagrante, he readily agreed to pull the story about Charlie in exchange for our silence about his sexual inclinations. Max grinned. I'm impressed. And that's not all, continued Nate. The best part is, while we were at Juno Press, Gabriel, Hamish and I spent a bit of time searching Silver's office. The junior editor was happy to turn a blind eye to that as well. And what did you find out? Nate winced. I'm afraid you're not going to like what I have to say, my friend. Gabriel unearthed a file on Fortuna Trading, the company that owns Juno Press, and inside there was a record of all their meetings' minutes. There was also this document, which listed all of the partners who have shares in the business. Nate withdrew a folded piece of parchment from his coat pocket and handed it to Max. Aside from Rotten Rochefort, who appears to be the major shareholder of the company, your mother's name is on that list. What? Max scanned the document, and there it was in black and white. Devil take him. It was true. His own mother was a part owner of the Beaumont Mirror. His hand shook as he wiped it down his face. This, this defies belief, he said, in a voice faint with shock. My mother has always portrayed herself as an upstanding pillar of polite society. But in actual fact, she's the complete opposite. She's worse than just a gossip monger. She uses gossip to wage war and destroy her social enemies. And her weapon of choice is a scandal rag. Rochefort's too. Disgust roiling inside him, he tossed the document onto his desk. I wonder how many unwitting members of the ton he's blackmailed over the years to keep their names out of his vile newspaper. One thing was certain, his mother and Rochefort would pay dearly for their unrelenting campaign to ruin Charlie's reputation. Such perfidy could not go unpunished. He met Nate's gaze. Thank you for going above and beyond and finding all this out. As you know, I've been using an inquiry agent and my man of affairs to investigate the matter for weeks now, and until tonight, had learned precious little. I'm now kicking myself for playing by the rules when it seems there are none. Nate shrugged. It was Gabriel's idea to bribe the junior editor and search Silver's office. But he's always been a rule-breaker. Max tilted his head. Yes. I'm truly indebted to you again, Nate. Indeed, all of my friends. Nate's gaze was as steady and solemn as a judge's, as he said. There's to be no more talk of debts or obligations of any kind. And as for the debt of honour that you think you still owe me, that was settled when you became engaged to Charlie. You know that. What debt of honour? Hell and damnation. 
Max's gaze flew to the library doorway where Charlie stood. She'd donned her gown, but her unbound curls fell in wild disarray about her shoulders. God knew what Nate thought. But Charlie clearly didn't care. Her eyes, narrowed in suspicion, darted between him and her brother. As Max rose to his feet, she advanced across the Turkish rug toward the desk. Well, I'd like an explanation. I have a right to know if the only reason you entered into this faux engagement with me was to settle a debt. Her accusing gaze settled on her brother. And if you were quite happy to go along with it, Nate. Nate put down his cognac and stood too. His tone was harsh with accusation as he demanded, Where is your chaperone? Charlie snorted. Oh, don't give me that. If you must know, she's at Devereux House, minding her own business, like you should be doing. He puffed out his chest. Now see here, Charlie. No, you see here, Nate. I'm a twenty-two-year-old woman, and I'm tired of you meddling in my affairs. And it seems you have been for some time. Despite the fact this engagement appears to be based on some sort of ridiculous gentleman's agreement that I know nothing about, I happen to love Max Devereux, and there's nothing you can do about it. I know you mean well, but I'd like you to take your misplaced indignation and concern and go home to Sophie and your son. Max and I have some much-needed talking to do. Yes, we do, agreed Max. He hadn't missed the fact that Charlie had just openly declared her love for him. He had to set the record straight. He had to make things right. Nate, for once, had the good grace to look chastened. He inclined his head. Fair enough, Charlie. I've only ever wanted the very best for you. You know that, don't you? She lifted her chin. I'm a big girl, and I have my eyes wide open. I know what I'm doing. You need to trust me to be able to look after myself and make sound decisions. And your friend, too. She turned her attention to Max. You have a lot of explaining to do, Your Grace. Max nodded. I will, and gladly. In some ways, it was a relief that Charlie would know why he'd entered into this agreement with Nate. He didn't want there to be any secrets between them. Not any more. Nate took his leave, and as the door shut behind him, Max suggested that they repair to the fireside. Before we discuss the debt of honour I owed your brother, he said, as he took a seat beside Charlie, I want to share the news that he imparted when he first arrived. He proceeded to tell her how Nate had discovered that both Lord Rochefort and his own mother were both part owners of the Beaumont Mirror. Charlie's eyes were like dinner plates. I'm absolutely flabbergasted, she said. To think that all this time your mother has been feigning innocence about her role in defaming me, yet she's intimately involved. I wonder how long this has been going on. I'd like to know that too, Max said grimly. And I intend to find out tomorrow. But rest assured, she will no longer plague you. Now that I know the truth of the matter, both my mother and Lord Rochefort will be called to account for their heinous actions. Charlie paled. Promise me you won't call Rochefort out again, Max. I couldn't bear it if something happened to you. I promise you that I won't. I have a far better plan that will end his tyranny once and for all. Charlie seemed satisfied with that because the next thing she said was, After you fought the duel with Rochefort and then proposed, you told me that Nate had agreed to the arrangement because it would help to dissipate the scandals surrounding my name. But given the conversation I'd just overheard, that wasn't the entire truth, was it? Her eyes glittered with determination, and God help him, 
were there tears in their golden-brown depths? I want you to be honest with me about this, Max. I will. And you deserve the truth. Max's pulse began to pound as he took one of Charlie's hands in his. The diamond of her engagement ring caught the firelight and winked at him. While he was both grateful and relieved that she didn't pull away from his touch, he was also worried how she would react to his disclosure. But there was no point in putting it off. Four years ago, your brother helped me to avert a huge scandal that would have brought my own family's name into disrepute. Charlie's brow dipped into a frown. Oh, I had no idea. It was just after Waterloo. I'd arrived back in London, and my brother, Anthony, threw a house party at Heathcote Hall to celebrate my safe return and old Boney's defeat. Nate was one of the guests, along with quite a few other members of the Ton. Of course, Diana and my mother were there too. Diana told me that your brother had died during a house party at Heathcote. I hope you can forgive me for asking such a blunt question, but was this the one, Max? Yes, it was. It was supposed to run over a week, but only lasted a few days because of Anthony's accident. I've heard he had a nasty fall while riding. Yes. In hindsight, what we did was beyond foolish. After a long luncheon that involved far too many bottles of claret, the gentlemen of the party decided to go out on the heath. During a mad gallop, Anthony lost his seat. He was knocked out cold for a short time, but when he came round, he seemed all right. Or so he claimed. I suggested summoning a physician, but he waved the idea away. It's a decision I regret to this day. Charlie's eyes were soft with compassion. I'm so sorry, Max. You weren't to know. He squeezed her hand. Thank you, but I should have trusted my gut. As it was, Anthony continued to pretend there was nothing wrong, even though he had indeed sustained a significant head injury. Apparently, there was a slow bleed inside his brain. He drank wine all through dinner, conversed and laughed. Later on, we found Laudanum in his room, and his valet confirmed he'd imbibed some before dinner, probably to dull the fearsome headache he would have had. At least, that's what the physician who ended up attending him at his bedside believed. That's so tragic, Max. And he was so young, too. Yes. He was only seven and twenty. He met Charlie's gaze. You're no doubt wondering what the almost scandal was, and how your brother became involved in all of this. Yes. A little. Max sighed. I'll endeavour to explain. Even though Anthony and Diana seemed to be happily married, it also turned out that my brother was a philanderer. He was having an affair with one of the guests at Heathcote, behind Diana's back. I certainly didn't know until his lover sought me out. Oh, Diana did actually know that, Max. The day I arrived at Heathcote, I discovered her in your sitting room. She was crying, and she confessed that while she loved your brother, she was also angry at him for having an affair. I had no idea that she knew. I wonder if she also knew the rest. The rest? After dinner, even though Anthony would have been feeling unwell, he arranged to meet his lover for a tryst in her bedchamber, which wasn't such a good idea, because he passed out while they were making love and she was unable to rouse him. The situation was complicated by the fact that this woman was married, and obviously quite terrified that her own husband would find the unconscious Duke of Exmoor in their bed. Good heavens! What a completely awful situation! It was. Although I am thankful that Max's lover still had the presence of mind to seek me out despite the fact she was beside herself with distress. She entreated me to help her move Anthony out of her room and back to his own chambers. 
And of course, I couldn't do it on my own. Not discreetly. So you asked Nate for assistance? Yes. And he did so willingly. We moved Anthony. He was completely insensible. And a mere half hour later, he passed away in his own bed. But I've always felt Nate went above and beyond that night. He didn't have to help me cover up Anthony's infidelity to protect Diana and our family name. I've felt indebted to him ever since. So that's why you proposed to me? Charlie's voice was flat with resentment, and her eyes were filled with shadows. Out of a sense of obligation to my brother, nothing more. The thought that he'd hurt Charlie shredded Max's own heart with guilt. It was his fault that she doubted him. It was no one's fault but his that she was in so much pain. But he also had the power to fix things. To make things right. It was long overdue. Confusion and hurt swirled through Charlie. Her throat was tight and her eyes stung with the effort not to cry. How could she have been so wrong about everything? Before Chifley had come knocking on Max's bedroom door, she'd sworn Max had been just about to declare that he loved her. She'd seen it in his eyes, felt it in his touch. He'd called her my love, but Max had all but confirmed that he'd only proposed to her to settle the debt of honour that he owed her brother. What a lowering, heart-rending thought indeed. Max took her hand in his. Charlie, he said, I won't lie to you. In the beginning, the urge to repay the debt of honour I owed your brother was the reason I gave to justify my actions, for helping you to recover your notebook, for calling out Rochefort, and for proposing that we enter into a fake engagement. But I was lying to Nate, and to myself. The moment I first beheld you that long-ago summer at Elmstone Hall, I noticed you. But you were only sixteen, and I was twenty-two. So I pretended disinterest, and was always, always careful around you, out of respect for you and my friend. And, of course, I honestly didn't think I was capable of forming romantic attachments, at least not a long-lasting one. And neither did your brother, who knew all about my upbringing and history with women. He really did have your best interests at heart by warning me to stay away from you. But in the end, I just couldn't, Charlie. I've always been drawn to you. To your laughter, your smile, your intelligence, your wit, your boldness, and your kind heart. And yes, your abundant beauty. And as I told you earlier tonight, up until now, I've been too terrified to acknowledge my feelings for you. And to acknowledge that this engagement has never been fake, but very real. But the lies I've told, to myself and to you, they stop tonight. The honest-to-God truth is, Charlotte. Max lifted his hands and cradled her face like she was the most precious thing in the world. I love you. With every beat of my heart, with every breath that I take, indeed, with everything that I am, I love you. I think about you all the time, and I want you to know that you are the only woman I want to be with, now and forever. And I pray that you can forgive me for being such a coward and a fool for so, so long. Oh, Max! Tears misted Charlie's vision. His heartfelt declaration of love was everything she'd ever dreamed of, and more. Of course I'll forgive you. And I think you already know that I love you, too. With my whole heart and soul, I love you. Tears were shimmering in Max's deep blue gaze, as he murmured in a voice thick with emotion. Say it again, Charlie. Maximilian Devereux.
Charlie reached out to caress his jaw. I love you. You are, and always will be, the man of my dreams. He closed his eyes, swallowed. And just when Charlie thought he might kiss her, he shifted to the floor and took up a position on bended knee. I did not do this the right way the first time, he said, taking one of her hands in his. So I will endeavour to do so now. Charlotte Hastings. His voice was low and soft and full of promise. Will you do me the untold honour of consenting to be my wife? Yes, Max. I will. And before she could even blink, Max was dragging her into his arms and kissing her with heart-stopping, breath-stealing ardour. They toppled to the rug and Max's hands were everywhere, in her hair, roaming over her body, setting her aflame. And it seemed she was rousing his desire too, given the hard, insistent press of him against her sex. When Max's mouth slid to her neck, and he began to rain soft, fiery kisses upon her flesh, she managed to whisper, I have an idea. I'm all ears, he said between gentle licks and nuzzles. I seem to recall an occasion in which you intimated that you've been naked in your library before. And wicked woman that I am, I must say the idea has always intrigued me. Max raised his head and gifted her with a smile that was pure sin. I like the way you think, my love. However, I'll only say yes to your proposal if you agree to strip naked too. Well, Your Grace, Charlie said with a grin, it seems you'd best lock the door. We wouldn't want anyone bursting in unannounced. Max laughed as he got to his feet. Charlie, it's you alone who's made a habit of doing that. But nevertheless, I'll comply. When he returned to the fireside, it wasn't long before Charlie was wearing nothing at all but her engagement ring and a smile and as Max made slow, sweet love to her before the library fire, she knew without a shadow of a doubt that the duke she'd dreamed of for so long was really, truly hers, body, heart and soul. Chapter 27 Did you attend the opening of the Royal Academy's 51st Annual Exhibition yesterday? Outstanding works abound this year, including Cooper's magnificent rendition of the Battle of Marston Moor, Gandhi's both epic and sublime Jupiter Pluvius, and the delightfully bucolic England, Richmond Hill, on the Prince Regent's birthday, by Turner. The Beaumont Mirror, The Fine Arts Exmoor House, Grosvenor Square May 4th 1819. Max took a sip of his first coffee for the day and stretched his booted feet toward the rose bushes bordering Exmoor House's rear terrace. His mouth tipped into a smile. He didn't think he'd ever felt so blissfully content. And drowsy. With Charlie sharing his bed the previous night, for the entire night, neither of them had slept very much. Everything had been perfect. She was perfect. Stifling a yawn, Max took another, larger swig of coffee. On the wrought iron table beside him sat the morning's broadsheets. A light breeze ruffled the pages of the Beaumont mirror, which, to his immense satisfaction, contained not one word about Charlie or her portrait. He would happily tell Charlie that as soon as she joined him for breakfast. His fiancée was presently upstairs in one of the guest bedrooms, for the sake of appearances, with her lady's maid, Molly. Lord Westhampton, to his credit, had sent the maid along to Exmoor House earlier that morning to attend to her mistress's needs. Max was nothing but grateful that his future father-in-law was so accommodating. It seemed he'd taken Max at his word when he'd said that Charlie would be chaperoned. 
Max felt only slightly guilty that he'd lied to the Earl. Actually, he grinned as he topped up his coffee from the silver coffee pot. He didn't feel guilty at all. But the morning wouldn't be all sunshine and roses. After they'd breakfasted, Max would be paying a visit to Devereux House to read his mother the riot act. As for how he'd end Rotten Rochefort's reign of terror, Max had already decided the best course of action to take. There was a pile of freshly sealed letters on his library desk that he'd already instructed his secretary to hand-deliver during the morning. Because Charlie had made him promise not to challenge the Baron to another duel, it seemed the only weapon left to him was his quill, and he'd wielded it with alacrity. Before he met with his friends at White's to celebrate, he'd be visiting Doctors' Common to organise a special licence. Now that he and Charlie had professed their love and were truly promised to each other, there was no sense in delaying the inevitable. Indeed, after what they'd done last night, several times, Charlie might already be with child. His child. The thought filled him with a warm glow and made him want to puff his chest out with pride. He couldn't wait to make Charlie his wife and his duchess, and he hoped she felt the same way too. He'd ask for her opinion on the matter as soon as she joined him on the terrace. The French doors opened, and Max looked up with an expectant smile. But it wasn't Charlie who emerged. It was Chifley, bearing a silver salver with a calling card. Your Grace, I know it's quite early, but it seems your sister-in-law is asking to see you. Even though Max waved the card away, his curiosity was piqued. He was only casually dressed, in breeches, boots, an open-necked shirt and a banyan, but he supposed it didn't really matter. Diana had seen him in similar attire before. How does she seem? he asked the butler. He still wasn't sure how deeply Diana had been embroiled in his mother's schemes, but he intended to find out. Chifley's beetle brows pulled together in a frown. A little on edge, perhaps, Your Grace? I've never been a very good judge of ladies and their moods. You and me both, thought Max. Although he considered himself fortunate indeed that Charlie tended to wear her heart on her sleeve, leaving him in no doubt about her feelings on any given matter. To Chifley, he said, Show her grace out to the terrace, and I expect she'd like a spot of tea. Oh, and send along some hot chocolate for Lady Charlotte. Max seemed to recall she'd been drinking that at breakfast at Heathcote one morning. The butler bowed. Very good. All shall be arranged at once. When a footman showed his sister-in-law out to the terrace, Max rose to his feet and sketched a bow. Diana, what brings you to Exmoor House so early? Is everything all right? Despite his own reservations about being able to judge a woman's mood, Chifley's summation of the young Duchess's state of mind had been quite accurate. Diana did indeed have a brittle edge. She offered Max a tight smile. I, if I'm being perfectly honest, no, I'm not all right. I... Max, I'm sorry I took so long. Oh. Charlie breezed onto the terrace, then stopped short when she saw the Duchess. Oh, Diana! I had no idea you were here. Charlie's cheeks turned the same blossom-pink hue as her morning gown as her gaze darted to Max. He gave a little shrug. If Diana guessed what they'd been up to last night, he wasn't particularly bothered. And perhaps Diana did have an inkling, because she blushed too. Lady Charlotte, your grace, my apologies for intruding. I didn't realise. I had no idea that you were otherwise engaged. I mean, of course you are engaged. Oh, drat. She pressed her lips together and shook her head. I'm so nervous that I'm rambling and making such a hash of everything. That was not my intention at all. Max gestured to a pair of nearby footmen, and they both stepped forward, 
to pull out chairs for Diana and Charlie. Why don't we all sit down, and then we can start again, he said. As the ladies took their seats, the tea and hot chocolate arrived. Charlie, who seemed to have recovered her equilibrium, played the role of hostess with a plomb. Now, said Max, when everyone was armed with cups of their preferred brew, what can I do for you, Diana? Diana put down her cup of tea, and her grey gaze shifted between him and Charlie. As a matter of fact, I'm quite pleased to find Charlie here as well, because... She lifted her chin. Because I wanted to offer both of you a sincere apology for everything that transpired at the Royal Academy yesterday. Particularly you, dear Charlie. Of course, I had no idea that Cressida had arranged for that purported portrait of you to be part of the exhibition. As it happens, it is actually my portrait, said Charlie quietly. But the painting was only ever supposed to be displayed in the privacy of my own home. I have no idea how Cressida got her hands on it, nor why she's so intent on ruining me. Oh, Diana blushed. I see. I'm not sure why she's so set against you either, Charlie. In any event, what I wanted to say was, I was so shocked when I saw your painting, my first reaction was to try and steer you away from it, to save you from being embarrassed. In point of fact, I should have worked out a way to have it removed, but there were guards all about, and I was worried that I would be accused of stealing. And then I wasn't sure I'd be able to lift it down from the wall. That gilt frame was quite elaborate, and there were guests everywhere. It's quite all right, Diana, said Max. The blame for this underhanded, despicable act lies entirely with my mother. Diana winced. Not entirely. Max's gaze narrowed on his sister-in-law. Do you know how my mother came by the painting? Or if the artist, Madame de Beauvoir, agreed to participate in her scheme? I'm not sure about Madame de Beauvoir's role, Diana said. All I know is that last night, when I heard your mother and Lord Rochefort discussing what had happened, how your mother's plans to ruin Charlie completely had been thwarted, I didn't know what to think or to do at first. I know one shouldn't eavesdrop, but honestly, it's so hard to avoid hearing things one shouldn't when there are raised voices. And I was so horrified. Wait a moment. Max held up a hand. Did I just hear you correctly, Diana? You overheard my mother talking with Rollo Kingsley, Baron Rochefort, last night. At the Royal Academy. Why, no. At Devereux House. Diana's brow knitted with a puzzled frown. I thought you knew that. She blushed bright red and began to fiddle with the linen napkin in her lap. Knew what? She swallowed, and her hands fluttered about. That your mother and Lord Rochefort, she dropped her voice to a whisper and leaned forward, are having an affair. If Diana had suddenly sprouted wings and flown about Exmoor House's back garden, Max would have been less surprised. Charlie's mouth had dropped open, and she looked as flabbergasted as he felt. He shook his head. It couldn't be true. But are you certain, Diana? My inquiry agent organised surveillance of Rochefort House and Devereux House weeks ago. I know you and my mother visited the Baron not long after he was injured. But since then, there have been no other reports of her meeting with him. Oh. Diana fidgeted with her napkin again. Well. I'd say that's because Lord Rochefort enters the house via the back garden gate. He rents a nearby property, another townhouse, that abuts the mews behind Devereux House. Bloody blazing hell! Why the devil hadn't he, or Hunt, his inquiry agent, thought to monitor the rear of Devereux House? His mother must have alerted Rochefort to the fact they were both being watched, 
so they'd come up with an alternative plan to continue their clandestine affair. Max felt like the biggest fool in Christendom. And so damned angry, he could crush gravel into dust with his back teeth. With effort, he unclenched his jaw and asked, How long has this affair been going on? Diana shifted uncomfortably on her chair. I'm not exactly sure. A muscle twitched in his cheek. But if you were to hazard a guess. Since the beginning of the year, when we returned to London after Twelfth Night. But it might have been longer. Charlie gasped, and Max met her horrified gaze. If what Diana had just said was indeed accurate, Rochefort had seduced Charlie on St. Valentine's Day, even though he was Cressida's paramour. Not only that, he'd probably consorted with prostitutes like Madame Irato at the same time. Max wondered if his mother knew about that. At this point in time, it wouldn't surprise him at all if she did, but didn't care. There was only one way to find out the truth about any of the disgraceful, reprehensible goings-on involving his mother and Rochefort. Max put down his coffee and pushed to his feet. Charlie, I think it's well past time that you and I visited Devereux House and demanded some answers. Devereux House, Curzon Street, Mayfair his mother was taking tea in the morning room of Devereux House when Max and Charlie arrived. Diana, perhaps to avoid the storm that was coming, had wisely made herself scarce. The Dowager Duchess greeted them both with a tight smile and gestured to the vacant chairs surrounding the satinwood dining table. When I heard Diana had set out to visit Exmoor House this morning... I suspected I might see you sooner rather than later, Maximilian. Her unsettling, ice-blue gaze settled on Charlie. But not you, Lady Charlotte. I must say, you're either incredibly brave or incredibly dull-witted, showing your face in public, considering what happened. Max slammed his hand down on the table. This stops now, he barked. Today, this very minute, you will not insult my fiancé ever again. I know everything, mother, about your affair with bloody Rochefort. The fact you and he own the vast majority of shares in the Beaumont Mirror and about your concerted efforts to destroy the woman I love. It's all over. His mother's sang-froid was breath-stealing. There was no shock in her expression, and rather than denying any of the accusations he'd just flung at her, she simply arched an eyebrow. Love, is it? I very much doubt you know the meaning of the word. Between your concerted effort and father's to deny me any sort of warmth or affection during my childhood, it's no wonder you would think that, Max growled savagely. But don't presume to know anything about me, mother. He caught Charlie's gaze across the room. She hovered by the door uncertainly, her gloved hands clasped at her waist. He didn't think he'd ever lost his temper in front of her before, and he was suddenly ashamed. I'm sorry, he said gently. You don't have to stay to witness this exchange. It's bound to get ugly. No. I want to be here. Although she was pale, there was a militant gleam in his fiancée's eyes. There are things I wish to know. Max gave a curt nod and turned back to face his mother. I only have three questions for you before I banish you from this townhouse forevermore. How long have you been a part owner of the Beaumont Mirror? How long have you been trying to ruin Charlie? How long have you been screwing Lord Rochefort? His mother sniffed. I won't answer any of your questions if you continue to use that sort of foul language in front of me. Max let out a short bark of laughter. The only thing foul in this room is you and your campaign to destroy Lady Charlotte. 
Why, in God's name, have you been waging war against her for so long? Good God, I'm beginning to think the sole reason you bought shares in the Beaumont Mirror was just to defame her. She rolled her eyes. I'm sure we've been over this a thousand times before, Maximilian. I know it. The whole of the ton knows it. Lady Charlotte Hastings is simply not good enough for you. It's not my fault if she continuously provides ample fodder for the gossip columns. There's not one thing that's been published about her that isn't true, is there? No one is perfect, Mother. No one's conduct is exemplary all the time. Take you as an example, a supposed doyen of polite society who's currently fucking the vilest member of the ton. Now, wouldn't that give your friends something to talk about if that salacious fact was reported in the scandal rags? At last, a reaction. His mother's eyes flashed blue fire as she hissed. How dare you speak to me like that? Spare me the righteous indignation. Just tell me why. Why have you devoted so much of your time and money to ruining my fiancé? I swear, your campaign has been bloodier and more sustained than old Boney's campaign against Britain. What has Charlotte ever done to deserve this? It makes no sense. At all. His mother threw down her napkin and shot to her feet. How can you be so stupid? It makes perfect sense. Your fiancé, she glared at Charlie, comes from bad breeding stock. Her own mother, Elizabeth, the daughter of an absolute nobody, was nothing but a social climbing trollop, stealing Lord Westhampton away from. Charlie gasped. You knew my mother. Of course I knew your mother. She made her debut during the same season I did. But unlike me, she bought her way into the ton. The daughter of a mere shipbuilder in Portsmouth. The Dowager Duchess's mouth thinned. Everyone knew she didn't belong in our ranks. Your father, Lord Westhampton, clearly just wanted her for her money. Her disdainful gaze raked over Charlie. And her other tawdry assets, which were a lot like yours. Even though Max's ire was sparking again, he chose to ignore this last dig at Charlie. So, just to clarify, Mother, you're telling me that the reason you loathe Charlotte so much is that you were jealous of her mother over thirty years ago, because she caught the eye of the Earl of Westhampton, and you didn't. His mother made a scoffing noise. Jealous? Don't make me laugh. Of course I wasn't jealous. I'm the one who married a duke, after all. But of course, that's not the only reason I despise your Charlie. You just need to look at her to see she's not, and will never be, Duchess material. With her unrefined air, knowing smiles, garish hair, and doughy figure. I remember the first time I ever laid eyes on her, in Hyde Park five years ago. You were on horseback, and she was with her brother, Lord Mulvan. You'd stopped by their landau to chat. And she was making the most ridiculous calf size at you. Even though I was at a distance, I could see you were attracted to her, Max. That you wanted her too. And it was highly likely that you'd come into contact with her over and over again, given your friendship with her brother. So that's when I decided that I had to convince you that she was entirely unsuitable. His mother turned her gaze back to Charlie and smirked. And you made it so easy for me, my dear. When one of my good friends, who was a patroness of Mrs. Rathbone's Academy for Young Ladies of Quality, told me about your deplorable behaviour, I was the one who went to the Beaumont Mirror with the story. And when Erasmus Silver mentioned that one of the principal owners was looking for another partner in the business, someone with significant social influence, I thought, why not? 
Not only would it be a sound business investment, but it meant I could have a direct influence on the newspaper's content. But you, Maximilian, his mother glared at him. It didn't matter what I printed about her or her ill-bred friends. It didn't make one jot of difference to you. So that's when I enlisted the help of Lord Rochefort. This season, I was determined to make you see Lady Charlotte Hastings is no lady at all, but as common as her horrid, social-climbing mamma used to be. And that's when you took up with Rochefort, said Max. He clenched and unclenched his fists. Just thinking about the snake, let alone saying his name, made him want to smash his fist through a wall. His mother tossed her head. Not that it's any of your business, but yes. Lord Rochefort and I are of a similar disposition. Charlie snorted. So you're both soulless with no scruples whatsoever. Well, Cressida, your title and precious aristocratic bloodline mean absolutely nothing if you have no character to speak of. And after hearing everything you've just said, your opinion of me also means nothing. The only thing I want to know is how you found out about my portrait. What horrendous thing did you do to poor Madame de Beauvoir to coerce her into giving it to you? Because I don't believe for a minute that she would have surrendered it willingly. The Dowager Duchess gave a theatrical sigh. Well, it certainly wasn't a secret that you wanted to sit for a licentious portrait, now was it? But to answer your question, Lord Rochefort had you followed, of course. It didn't take long for him to work out that your Madame de Beauvoir had a penchant for painting naked gentlemen, which is not the done thing at all. If word got out, her reputation would have been mud. The Royal Academy would have banned her from ever exhibiting again, and her polite society commissions would have dried up. So Rochefort blackmailed her, said Max. His mother shrugged. One must do what one must. Yes, said Max, which is exactly why you're going to sell your existing shares in Fortuna Trading to me, and then I'm going to banish you to Devonshire with a much reduced allowance. You can divide your time between the Dower House at Exmoor Castle and Linton Grange. Aside from the change of scenery, you'll enjoy the fresh sea air. I'll even let you maintain a subscription to the Times and Ackerman's repository. His mother paled. You must be joking. Indeed, I am not. You have one hour to pack your things, then I'll be back with my man of affairs and the necessary papers for you to sign, along with my coach that will ferry you to Devon. Even though his mother raised her chin, her bottom lip quivered. And if I refuse to go? Max shrugged. Well, I would have no choice but to tell the entire ton that the Dowager Duchess of Exmoor is one of the owners of the Beaumont Mirror. I can only imagine what everyone will think when they learn that one of their own has been spreading filthy gossip about them all, as well as profiting from the practice. His mother's lips were bloodless, and her eyes glittered. You wouldn't dare, she breathed. What you've done to Charlie is unforgivable, so yes, I would dare. Not only that, but Lord Rochefort is about to experience my wrath too. His mother's gaze flickered to Charlie, who still waited by the morning room door, then back to Max. What do you mean? He cocked an eyebrow. As we speak, my personal secretary is delivering letters to the head editors of the Times, the Morning Post, the Morning Herald, the Sun, the Courier, the Globe, the Star, the Statesman, the London Chronicle, the London Packet, the Evening Mail, actually, to just about every newspaper that I could think of. So very soon, all of London, indeed the entire country, will know that Lord Rochefort is the chief owner of Fortuna Trading, the company that owns Juno Press the publisher of London's most notorious scandal rag. He'll be an outcast. 
the ton will never forgive him. Really, your grace, intoned a dark voice, dripping with sardonic amusement. I don't think so. Chapter 28 Till this moment, I never knew myself. An extract from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. The Beaumont Mirror, the Literary Arts. In the moments before Lord Rochefort had taken her hostage, Charlie should have known something was amiss. First of all, Cressida's gaze had darted to the door. Secondly, she'd heard the creak of a floorboard just behind her. And finally, the Baron's breath had gusted against her cheek in the split second before he'd pressed the muzzle of a pistol against her temple and said, Really, Your Grace? I don't think so. Max spun around, then swore. Holding up his hands in a placatory gesture, he said in a voice rough with emotion, Your argument is with me, Rochefort, not Lady Charlotte. Let her go, and we'll settle this like gentlemen. Rochefort laughed, and one of his arms, still in a sling, snaked awkwardly about Charlie's waist. The cold steel of the pistol's muzzle bit deeper, and her stomach twisted with terror. Here's what is actually going to happen, Exmoor. Lady Charlotte and I are going to take a small journey together, and while we're away, you're going to visit each and every one of those newspapers you just mentioned, and make sure they don't breathe a word about my ownership of the Beaumont Mirror. Or Cressida's, for that matter. And when I'm satisfied that my name and reputation are no longer in danger of being vilified, you can have your fiancé back. Now let's be reasonable, Rochefort. It's going to take me some time to do all of that, began Max. Release Lady Charlotte first. The Baron cocked the pistol's hammer, and at the sharp metallic click, Charlie clamped her eyes shut. Her breath froze in her chest. I'm not bloody stupid, Exmoor, he bit out. Now get on your knees and put your hands behind your back. Cressida, use that braid holding back the curtains to tie his hands. And his ankles. He emitted a low chuckle. For your mother's sake, Exmoor, I won't make you strip. Max complied, dropping to his haunches. Even though his life was in danger too, he caught Charlie's gaze. I'm so sorry this is happening, my love. His voice was grave yet infinitely soft. But I promise you that we'll get through this. Everything will be all right. Oh, dear God. Charlie's heart cracked a little, and indeed, she felt like it might actually break in two. Max might be adept at masking his emotions, but she just knew that he was blaming himself for not thinking ahead. For neglecting to search Devereux House, and for failing to anticipate Rochefort's actions. For not having at least half a dozen strategies for an exit up his sleeve. But while there was breath in her body, she wouldn't go down without a fight. For Max and for herself, she would find a way out of this. Swallowing hard against a wave of rising panic, she dredged up her voice. Lord Rochefort, his grace is right. I'm sure we can work something. The Baron jabbed the pistol into the side of her head with such force, tears sprang to her eyes. Shut it, my lady. His breath was hot and harsh against her ear. Do not say another word. To Cressida, he said, Are those knots nice and tight? The Dowager Duchess nodded. Yes, they are. Just the way you like them. And then she added in a breathless voice, Be careful, Rollo. Be careful, Rollo. Charlie's stomach roiled, and she thought she might be ill. Max's grim expression, the flicker of fire in his deep blue eyes, and the way a muscle pulsed in his cheek, clearly conveyed his own disgust and anger, but he didn't say anything else. 
Even so, she was certain his mind was working furiously, just like hers was. Rochefort began hauling her backward toward the morning room door. He gave a grunt as his injured shoulder collided with the door jam, and Charlie's heart lurched with hope. The Baron might be holding a pistol to her head, but his shoulder wound clearly still bothered him. If she twisted just the right way, maybe aimed a swift, hard jab at his ribs with her elbow. All of a sudden, there was a loud smash, and crystalline shards, cut lilies, and a cascade of dirty water rained down around Charlie's head and shoulders. Lord Rochefort's grip on her waist loosened, the pistol fell away, and as the Baron toppled to the floor with a heavy thud, Cressida screamed, drowning out the string of profanities that fell from Max's lips. And then Diana whispered into the crashing silence that followed, Is he dead? Charlie whipped around. The young Duchess stood in the corridor just outside the morning room. Her grey eyes were huge in her pale face, and all her attention was riveted to Rochefort's prone form. I'm not sure, said Charlie, at the same moment that the Baron moaned. His fingers flexed in a puddle of water and broken crystal. Quick as a wink, Charlie bent down and picked up the pistol that lay at her feet. She wasn't going to take any chances. As she straightened and stepped away from Rochefort's body, she pointed the pistol at Cressida, who stood motionless, rooted to the spot. Untie Max! Now! she ordered. She didn't trust the Dowager Duchess as far as she could throw her. Cressida blinked as though emerging from a daze, then scowled at Charlie. I'll do no such! Oh, spare me! Charlie made sure the pistol was cocked as she took up a duelist's stance. When I told you that I'd once shot a gun on Putney Heath, I lied, Cressida. I've been shooting many times. In fact, I'd even venture to say that I'm a crack shot. And unless you do what I say... She narrowed her gaze and took aim at Cressida's chest. I'm going to give you a complete demonstration of my exceptional marksmanship skills. So, I'll say it once more, and once more only, untie my fiancé, or I'll put a bullet in your person. Your choice. Diana stepped forward. That's all right. I'll do it, she said. I don't trust Cressida. You can keep guard. Cressida shot her daughter-in-law a murderous look as she crossed the room, but Diana didn't seem to notice or care. When Charlie's gaze connected with Max's, his handsome face split with a devilish grin. You're simply amazing, he murmured, as his sister-in-law freed his hands. So are you, she returned with an equally wide smile. And so is Diana. Agreed. Oh, please. I think I'm going to be sick, said the Dowager Duchess. Max climbed to his feet with the curtain ties in hand. You don't have time for that, he said, as he approached Lord Rochefort, who was moaning again. Because you have some packing to do. After squatting down, he ruthlessly pulled the Baron's arms behind his back and began to bind his wrists. And if you don't hop to it, I'm going to reconsider where you'll be residing. I think a stint in an asylum might be in order, because I'm seriously questioning the sanity of your choices. One of Cressida's hands fluttered to her throat. You wouldn't do such a horrible thing. Not to your own mother. Considering you just tied up your own son and were a co-conspirator in the attempted kidnapping of my fiancé, I wouldn't count on that. Now go. By my calculations, you only have fifty minutes left before my carriage arrives to take you to Devon. Once his uncharacteristically subdued mother had retired to her rooms, and a groggy Rochefort had been carted off by a pair of strapping footmen to the coal cellar, where he'd be locked up until the Bow Street runners arrived to deal with him, Diana had offered to send for them. 
Max turned to Charlie and enveloped her in his arms. He embraced her like he never wanted to let her go. Oh, God, my love, I'm so, so sorry. His voice was weighted with guilt, and when he drew back to study her face, Charlie could see his dark blue eyes were shadowed with self-recrimination. I was such an idiot not to have even considered the possibility that Rochefort might have been lurking somewhere within these walls. My arrogance and stupidity put you in danger. I can never forgive myself for that. But there is one good thing I learned about myself today. I once feared love more than anything on this earth. As you know, I'd been taught to think it would make me weak. But I was so very wrong. My father was so very wrong. As that dog Rochefort threatened to take you hostage and away from me, he broke off, shaking his head. The determination I felt, and yes, my blazing anger, were far more potent because I do love you. The sincerity of his conviction, the depth of his feelings shone in his eyes and resonated in his voice. Your love has made me stronger, Charlie. It fills my heart. It warms my soul. The joy and absolute satisfaction I feel whenever I'm with you, it's indescribable. With you by my side, I am whole and happy. Oh, Max! Charlie's eyes brimmed with tears, and her heart swelled with so much love and tenderness, she thought it might burst. Don't torture yourself with all the if-onlys and might-have-beens. The important thing is, we are both safe and whole and together. Nothing can part us now. Yes. He brushed her jaw with gentle fingers, then pushed a damp curl behind one of her ears. His voice was soft as a caress as he said, I am so very proud of you. Do you know that? For your quick thinking and for your bravery, and for your generous, forgiving heart. You, Charlotte Hastings, are the most wonderful woman I've ever met, and I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with you. I know we originally agreed that we'd wed at the end of the season, but would you reconsider and marry me sooner? Max's gaze was so adoring, and his words were so sweet, Charlie's own heart and soul were immediately flooded with happiness. Goodness gracious, she murmured, her voice husky with emotion. I never thought I'd see the day when you, Maximilian Devereux, would openly declare that you were not just ready and willing, but eager to be caught in the parson's mousetrap. So I will say yes to your proposal, and gladly, because I love you so much, and I can't wait to begin our new life together, too. My only caveat is that we allow enough time for my Aunt Tabitha to return to London for the ceremony. I couldn't bear it if she wasn't at our wedding. Of course, said Max. But before I visit Doctors Common to procure a special license, and before you return to Hastings House, there's one more urgent matter that needs attending to. Oh? Yes. Max wiped her cheek, and when he withdrew his hand, something green and slimy was smeared across the pad of his thumb. You, my dear Charlie, are in serious need of a bath. I don't know what was in that vase, but... Charlie clasped Max's face between her hands and silenced him with a resounding kiss. When she drew back, she couldn't help but smile at her handiwork. Oh, look! Now you're covered in green muck, too. I guess you'll have to join me, Your Grace. Oh, I intend to, my little minx, he said with a grin. And then he kissed her with such heartfelt passion and love, nothing else mattered but this perfect moment and the bright, shining future awaiting them both. Epilogue The Enlightened Women's Society of London, Harrington House, Bloomsbury Square, May 20th, 1820 
I declare that the Enlightened Women's Society of London is now officially open, Tabitha, Lady Chelmsford, announced in a strident voice to the small crowd gathered in Bloomsbury Square. And then Euphemia Harrington, with the help of her young daughter Tilda, sliced through the crimson satin ribbon adorning the front door of Harrington House. Claps and cheers erupted, and after Charlie climbed the short flight of stairs, she embraced her aunt, then Mia and Tilda. When she turned around, her gaze immediately sought and connected with Max's. Her handsome husband stood at the back of the throng, half a head taller than most in the crowd, he was easy to spot, and as he grinned back at her, elation and a feeling of accomplishment suffused Charlie's heart. This, this was a perfect moment. With the help of her darling friends, her dear aunt, Mia Harrington, and the Mayfair Blue Stocking Society, Charlie had created something special and worthwhile, a charitable society that would endeavour to support women who were in desperate need, women who might be unwed and with child, or women who'd been abandoned by their husbands and had nowhere else to go. At Harrington House, they would find other sympathetic women who would help them to find a safe place to stay and decent paid work, and, if required, medical care at one of the innumerable dispensaries that Arabella had established in various locations about London. No one would be turned away. Mia did the honours of opening the door, then everyone trooped into Harrington House to share a celebratory afternoon tea in the drawing room and the flower-filled back garden. Olivia, who was round with child, was grateful when Charlie ushered her over to a vacant shepherdess chair by the open French doors. Quite a few of the guests had already filtered outside to the terrace and garden to enjoy the afternoon sunshine. It's so lovely to see Mia and Tilda back in London, she said as she leaned back and put her slippered feet upon a padded footstool. Yes, agreed Charlie. I'm still so grateful to Mia. She didn't have to rent her townhouse to us. And the fact that she wishes to help manage the day-to-day -day running of the society when we begin to receive clients, Max said she's an excellent housekeeper, is just wonderful. Her expertise will be invaluable. No doubt she feels strongly about supporting other women, g given her own history, remarked Olivia. And after Max's generosity, he didn't have to buy back her townhouse for her. She might feel it is a way to say thank you to you both. Yes, I think you might be right. Most of all, I'm pleased she doesn't feel like she has to hide from Lord Rochefort any more. Lord Rochefort, the man who'd made Mia's life hell too, was dead. Charlie couldn't say she was sorry after all the terrible things he'd done. After the Baron had been incarcerated in the Tower to await a trial by his peers, he'd been charged with extortion, assault, and attempted kidnapping. Rochefort had evidently taken his own life. The coroner had decreed that Rochefort had ingested a lethal dose of laudanum during his first night behind bars. The Tower guards had failed to search his person thoroughly, so they'd missed the fact that the Baron had a flask of the strong opiate secreted in his coat. Apparently, he'd taken to drinking laudanum regularly to dull the pain of his injured shoulder. Once Rochefort's ownership of the Beaumont mirror had been revealed in all the newspapers, and after the Baron's demise, the infamous scandal rag that had caused so much grief had been shut down. And Charlie couldn't say she was sorry about that either. As for Lady Penelope Purcell, Charlie had not seen hide nor hair of the horrid young woman since that terrible day at the Royal Academy of Arts' 51st exhibition. Although, by all accounts, the Duke's daughter had accepted a proposal from a middle-aged but exceedingly wealthy Marcus by the end of last season, and she was now heavy with child and rusticating at his rambling estate somewhere in the wilds of Northumberland. Rumour also had it that the Marquis and his new wife led very separate lives, 
He was very much a Marcus about town, who believed a wife's place was in the home, or his country home, to be more precise. In any event, Charlie doubted she'd be seeing much of Penelope in the future. The same went for her odious brother. Lord Mowbray was reported to be on a grand tour, exploring the continent and perhaps even farther afield. A most satisfying prospect, all things considered. Or in Max's words, a good riddance of bad rubbish, at least for the time being. Hamish wandered over and furnished his wife with a cup of tea and a slice of cake. You are too sweet to me, Olivia murmured, as she smiled up at her burly Scots husband. The adoration in her eyes was clear to see. Hamish dropped a kiss on her forehead. Nothing's too good for my bonny wife and our bairn on the way, he said softly. Looking up, he caught Charlie's gaze and winked with his one good eye. We'll join you outside shortly. Charlie nodded and smiled. I look forward to it. She found her father and new stepmother, Eleanor, with Aunt Tabitha and her dear friend, Lady Kilbride, on the terrace by a fragrant rose bower. They were discussing plans to open additional branches of the Enlightened Women's Society in other areas of London and other large towns about the country. In between the knots of guests milling in the garden itself, Charlie also spied Sophie and Arabella, chatting with their husbands and Diana, who, now that she'd remarried, styled herself Lady Claremont. Diana had first met Matthew Ellis, Viscount Claremont, an eligible gentleman who'd once courted Sophie, at Charlie and Max's wedding, which had taken place at Heathcote Hall a year before to the day. On their wedding day, another perfect late spring day just like this one, her father had naturally given her away, and Sophie had been her attendant. But best of all, Nate had been honoured to act as Max's groomsman. He'd at last accepted that Max did indeed love her sincerely and deeply, and knowing that warmed Charlie's heart immeasurably. As Charlie descended the flagged steps to the lawn, she smiled to herself. Sophie and Nate had welcomed another baby boy, Edward, or Ned for short, into the world a month ago, and Arabella and Gabriel were now the proud parents of a five-month-old baby girl named Mary Caroline, after their respective mothers. The delightful sound of a child's squeal and a giggle drew Charlie's attention. Max, who was talking to Mia, was also pushing little Tilda on a swing. When her husband looked up and saw Charlie, he smiled and beckoned her over. It amused Charlie no end that her devilish duke of a husband had recently become as broody as a mother hen around babies and young children. Whenever they visited Nate and Sophie, or Arabella and Gabriel, he'd invariably demand a trip to the nursery to see how his godchildren were doing. And it seemed procreating was catching. Molly, who'd recently begun to work here at Harrington House assisting Mia, was expecting too. She'd married her dashing footman, Edwards, on St. Valentine's Day, and even though Charlie was losing her loyal lady's maid, she couldn't be happier for the young woman. Even Peridot had given birth to a litter of sweet little kittens in early March. Charlie had been gradually finding new homes for them all, but she still had one kitten left. Charlie joined Max, Mia and Tilda beneath the shade of the beech tree. Max quite unashamedly slipped an arm about her waist and pulled her in for a kiss. You're positively glowing, my love he murmured against her ear. Well, why wouldn't I be? she said, smiling up at him. I'm blissfully wed to the most wonderful man. All of my friends are equally as happy, and now we have joined forces to create a worthwhile charitable endeavour that will provide help to fellow sisters in need. Our lives couldn't be more perfect. I feel nothing but blessed. Agreed. Max gave her waist a little squeeze. I take it Hamish and Olivia will join us soon with Tilda's surprise. Yes, they will. As if her words had summoned them, 
Hamish and Olivia appeared on the terrace. Hamish was brandishing a small covered basket. As they approached the beech tree, Tilda slid from the swing and raced over to them. She clasped Olivia's hand. What's in there, Lord Slate and Lady Livy? the child asked in her sweet, piping voice. Above the sounds of conversation and laughter, a series of tiny, high-pitched mules could just be heard. Hamish squatted down and placed the basket upon the grass. He glanced over to Charlie and grinned. I believe it's a present from Charlotte, the Duchess of Exmoor. Tilda looked up at Charlie. It is? For me, Your Grace? Charlie knelt on the grass, too. It is. Well, actually, it's a gift from Perido, my cat. You remember her, don't you? Tilda nodded vigorously, her brown curls bouncing. Yes, I do. Lady Livy was looking after her while you were away. Her wide blue-grey eyes shifted to her mother. Can I open the basket, Mamma? Mia smiled. Yes, of course, darling. Tilda very carefully lifted the basket's wicker lid, and a kitten's tiny head immediately popped up. It stopped mewling and blinked at its surroundings. Tilda squealed. Are you sure the kitten is really for me? Her gaze skipped between Charlie, Olivia, Hamish and her mother. Yes, she's just for you, said Charlie. But you must promise to take good care of her. Her mamma, Perido, is counting on you. Oh, I will, cried Tilda. She scooped up the tiny bundle of tortoiseshell fur and gave the kitten a gentle hug. What is her name? You must choose one, said Charlie. Tilda's forehead dipped into a pensive frown as she stroked the kitten's fluffy head. I think I would like to call her Marmalade because of all her orange patches. That sounds just perfect, said Charlie. I'll tell Perido when I go home. She rose to her feet, and Max drew her in for another hug. I also have a surprise for you when we leave here, he murmured. Today is special for many reasons, and I have so much to be thankful for and to celebrate including the fact it's our very first wedding anniversary. I haven't forgotten. Charlie looked up into Max's face. The dappled sunlight filtering through the leaves of the beech tree had turned his sapphire eyes to the warmest shade of summer sky blue. She could quite happily lose herself in those eyes forever. Reaching up, she touched his cheek and inhaled a soft breath. I have something special to share with you, too. Heathcote Hall, Hampstead Heath The moment before Max ushered Charlie into their newly refurbished set of private apartments at Heathcote Hall, he felt unaccountably excited. Like a child about to delve into his first ever Christmas stocking, not that his parents had ever followed such a yuletide tradition, or a four-year-old, about to pull her first pet kitten from a basket. Of course, he already knew what lay beyond the white-panelled doors, but he couldn't wait to see the expression on Charlie's face when she discovered what he'd been up to. Once his mother had been banished to Devonshire, Max had asked Charlie to redecorate both Exmoor House and Devereux House to suit her own taste. But he hadn't yet invited her to do the same at Heathcote not because he didn't want her to make her mark on this particular home. Far from it. It was simply because he'd wanted to surprise his wonderful wife with some changes of his own. He'd wanted to spoil her because she deserved it. Drawing a deep breath, he pulled open the doors. Happy anniversary, my love. As soon as Charlie stepped across the threshold into the sumptuously appointed sitting room, her eyes widened in wonder. Oh, Max, she breathed, as she crossed the rose-patterned Orbison rug, then spun around, taking everything in. 
the crystal chandelier and intricate plasterwork above her head, the amber damask curtains at the windows, and the delicate cherrywood armchairs and chaise long upholstered in cream brocade. This, this is beautiful. I'm practically speechless. I had no idea you'd been planning anything like this. I'm so pleased you like it, he said, watching her lovely face. Her cheeks were flushed with pleasure, and her eyes shone with delight. And it goes on forever. Charlie wandered through to the adjoining bedchamber. You've moved everything about. Combined the rooms. I might have, he said, as he followed her toward the enormous tester bed. We always share the same bed, so I didn't see much point in maintaining separate bedchambers. Do you mind, though? He grimaced. I know I snore sometimes. Charlie picked up one of the cushions from the elaborate arrangement at the head of the bed and hugged it to her bosom. Of course I don't mind. I think it's an eminently sensible idea. And your snoring doesn't bother me at all. It's music to my ears. <laughs> my love, I'm certain you're lying, he said with a soft chuckle. But I do appreciate the fact that you are happy to sleep beside me every night. Charlie met his gaze over the gold brocade counterpane. There's no place I would rather be. Her voice was low and soft and as rich as silk, and Max's loins tightened with longing. I feel exactly the same way, he murmured. Ignoring the urge to crawl across the bed and pull her down into his arms, he held out his hand instead. Come, I have something else to show you. He led Charlie past their new dressing rooms and into a brand new addition to Heathcote, a high-ceilinged bathroom that resembled an airy conservatory. The dome above them was constructed from glass and wrought iron, and there were a series of tall arched windows that looked out upon the lawns and the lake. Gauzy curtains provided a modicum of privacy during the day, and heavier curtains of silk damask could be drawn at night. Everywhere one looked, there were fragrant white blooms, leafy green palms, and ferns. But the main attraction, aside from the elegant white marble fireplace and a chaise long at one end piled with snowy white towels, was the large sunken bath in the centre of the room. As per Max's directions, it had already been filled with steaming hot water. Max! Charlie pressed her hands to her cheeks. This room, the bath, it's all simply stunning. But how on earth have the servants managed to fill such an enormous tub with hot water? It would have taken them all day. That's a very good question, said Max with a grin. I consulted the architect, Sir John Soane, who installed a similar tub for Lord Hardwick at Wimpole Hall. Water is pumped in from the lake, and after it's passed through a filter, it's heated via a boiler beneath the floor. That's... I'm amazed. Charlie turned and threw her arms about his neck. Max, this is the most wonderful surprise. Thank you. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude. This is the best, indeed the most magnificent gift I've ever received. He laughed at that. I'm glad you approve. Her eyes were soft with love as she said, I do. Well, shall we make use of it, my sweet wife? A wicked smile played about her fulsome lips. We shall. It didn't take them long to divest all of their clothes. Then Max assisted Charlie down the short set of wide porcelain-tiled stairs into the water. As soon as Max sat on one of the steps, he gathered Charlie into his arms. Her warm, wet skin slid against his, and the desire that was already flowing through his veins headed straight to his groin. The temperature of the water is perfect, murmured Charlie, sliding her hands over his shoulders. It reminds me of that time we visited those Turkish baths in Brighton last year. Yes. In any event, 
This is much better than naked sea bathing in Brighton. Charlie laughed, and her breasts with their succulent nipples bobbed in the water in the most tantalizing way. I agree. Sea bathing wasn't how I imagined it would be. Even though it was July, the water was freezing. She gave an exaggerated shiver, and when her breasts jiggled again, Max couldn't help but groan. Cupping her face, he whispered in a voice frayed with lust, As much as I'd love to spend time lathering soap and fragrant oil all over your delicious curves, sweet Charlotte, I don't think I can wait a moment longer to be inside you. Her gaze locked with his. I want you inside me too, she murmured. Only, I want to share my anniversary gift with you first. Anticipation curling through him, Max began to rub his thumb in idle circles over one of her nipples. The tip immediately stiffened into a tightly furled peak, tempting him to take it between his lips. I have you, my love. That's the only gift I need. That's very sweet of you, but no matter how much you taunt me with your wicked fingers, I will not be deterred. Charlie clasped her hands about his neck, and an emotion he couldn't quite place lit her honey-brown eyes. Maximilian Devereux, she murmured, with grave sincerity, you and I are going to have a baby. Max blinked. His breath hitched. When he spoke, his voice was little more than a rasp. Charlie, do you mean it? Are you sure? She touched his jaw, and her mouth curved with a tender smile. Of course I'm sure, my darling husband. Haven't you noticed that my bosom is a little larger, and my waist is a little thicker? I, I suppose, he frowned. Actually, no, not really. And then his vision blurred, as the most incredible feeling of unadulterated joy flooded his heart. Closing his eyes, he leaned his forehead against Charlie's. My darling, my love, this news, I can barely speak. I'm practically incoherent with happiness. So am I. When Max lifted his head, Charlie's beautiful, tear-bright eyes gazed back at him. Make love to me, Max. Despite the fact his cock was still hard and ready, a frisson of worry slid through him. Are you sure it's safe? She smiled. Of course it is, you darling silly man. None of my friends have remained celibate during their pregnancies. I mean, can you imagine any of your friends going without for so long? Aside from that, I recently spoke with a midwife Arabella recommended, and she also confirmed that all will be well. He gave a soft chuckle. You make a compelling argument. His hand slid to her belly, and he caressed her silken skin beneath the warm water. When is the babe due, do you know? I'm only eight weeks along, so it will be a while yet, but both Arabella and the midwife think he or she will arrive around Christmas tide. I can hardly wait, Max whispered. And then, because he could no longer contain all the wondrous feelings brimming inside him, he kissed Charlie, the duchess of his dreams. Desire surged again, hot and insistent, yet Max resisted the impulse to take Charlie hard and fast. He wanted to make these glorious moments last. He wanted to celebrate their love. His tongue slid softly between Charlie's lips, tasting her sweet warmth. Her soft sighs and the way she stroked him back with her own tongue made him ache to possess her even more. He settled his mouth upon one breast, and while he suckled, he slipped his fingers between her thighs. The delicious moan that spilled from her throat as he teased her slick sex made his cock jerk with appreciation. Max, I need you, she whispered huskily. She rose, straddling him, the water lapping at her hips. 
with her face flushed with desire and her damp chestnut curls clinging to her neck, she looked exactly like a goddess, like Venus rising from the sea. Sweet Jesus, Charlie, he groaned, as she gripped his throbbing shaft and took him, all of him, inside her. He cupped her delicious derriere. How well she filled his hands. How well she clasped his thick, throbbing length. So hot. So wet and silken. Tighter than a fisted glove. He would never grow tired of her. Of this. He tightened his arms about her, and she undulated her hips, gently loving him with her body and her eyes. Her whispered words and breathy moans. Max couldn't hold back as urgent lust pulsated through his veins. Gripping her waist, he pumped his hips until pleasure claimed them both in a great rush. As he cried out Charlie's name, her fingers twisted in his hair, and when she was spent too, she collapsed against him, her sweet breath fanning against his neck. Max wrapped his arms about his wife. His chest was so full of love, he didn't know how his body could possibly contain it. Drawing back, he caught her drowsy, sated gaze. How I love you, my darling, he said, his voice filled with tender awe. You bring me so much joy. I'd give you the whole world and everything in it if I could. Charlie's eyes glowed, and when she smiled, he basked in the warmth of it. Oh, Max, I love you too, she whispered, with my entire heart. And you don't need to give me the world, or even the moon and the stars, because when I'm with you, I'm in heaven. And then she kissed him, and Max knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that they'd both find everything that they'd ever want or need, right here in each other's arms. The End Thank you for listening to How to Catch a Devilish Duke, book four in the Disreputable Debutante series by Amy Rose Bennett, narrated by Catherine Bilson. Copyright 2020 Audiobook Production Copyright 2021 How to Catch a Wicked Viscount is book one in the Disreputable Debutante series. The next book is How to Catch an Errant Earl. How to Catch a Sinful Marquess is the third book. For more information on this series and all of Amy Rose Bennett's other books, please visit amyrosebennett.com. Thank mm -hmm. you.